The Asses of Balaam by Gordon Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Asses of Balaam by Gordon Randall Garrett The remarkable characteristic of Balaam's ass was that it was more perceptive than its master. Sometimes a child is more perceptive because more straightforward and logical than an adult. <sighs> it is written in the Book of Numbers that Balaam, a wise man of the Moabites, having been ordered by the king of Moab to put a curse upon the invading Israelites, mounted himself upon an ass and rode forth toward the camp of the children of Israel. On the road he met an angel with drawn sword barring the way. Balaam, not seeing or recognizing the angel, kept urging his ass forward, but the ass recognized the angel and turned aside. Balaam smote the beast and forced it to return to the path, and again the angel blocked the way with drawn sword, and again the ass turned aside, despite the beating from Balaam, who, in his blindness, was unable to see the angel. When the ass stopped for the third time and lay down, refusing to go further, Balaam waxed exceeding wrath and smote again the animal with a stick. Then the ass spoke and said, why dost thou beat me? I have always obeyed thee, and never have I failed thee. Have I ever been known to fail thee? And Balaam answered, No. And at that moment his eyes were opened, and he saw the angel before him. Studies in Scripture by Kekagwin of Eboricum With the careful precision of controlled anger, Dodoth Pell, I ripple the stump along his right side. Clop, 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 clop. Each of his twelve right feet came down in turn, while he glared across the business bench at Wigor Bedis. He started the ripple again, while he waited for Wigor's answer. The ripple was a good deal more effective than just tapping one's fingers, and equally as satisfying. Wigor Bedis twitched his mouth and allowed his eyelids to slide up over his eyeballs in a slow blink before answering. Dodoth had simply asked, oh, Why wasn't this reported to me before? But Wigor couldn't find the answer as simply as that. Not that he didn't have a good answer. It was just that he wanted to catch it in exactly the right terms. Dodoth had a way with raking sarcasm that made a person tend to cringe. Dodeth was perfectly well aware of that. He hadn't been in the executive office of Predator Council all these years for nothing. He knew how to handle people, when to praise them, when to flatter them, when to rebuke them, and when to drag them unmercifully over the shell bed. He waited, his right legs marching out to their steady rhythm. Well, said Wygor at last, it was just that I couldn't see any point in bothering you with it at that point. I mean, one specimen of an entirely new species, snapped the Dodeth in a sudden interruption. His legs stopped their rhythmic tramp. His voice rose from its usual eight thousand cycle rumble to a shrill squeak. Fry it! We go. If you weren't such a good field man, I would have sacked you long ago. Your trouble is that you have a penchant for bringing me problems that you ought to be able to solve by yourself, and then flipping right over on your back, and holding off on some information that ought to be brought to my attention immediately. There wasn't much Wego could say to that, so he didn't try. He simply waited for the raking to come, and sure enough it came. Dodeth's voice lowered itself to a soft purr. The next time you have to do anything as complicated as setting a sniff trap, you just hump right down here and ask me, and I'll tell you all about it. On the other hand, if the lower levels all suddenly became infested with sharks at the same time, why, you just take care of that little detail yourself. Eh? The only other alternative is to learn to think. 
Weagor winced a trifle and kept his mouth shut. Having delivered himself of his jet of acid, Dodo Pal looked down at the data book that the Beagor had handed him. Fortunately, he said, there doesn't seem to be much to worry about. Only the universal motivator knows how this thing could have spawned, but it doesn't appear to be very efficient. No, sir, it doesn't, said Weagor, taking heart from his superior's mild tone. The eating orifice is oddly placed, and the teeth are obviously for grinding purposes. I was thinking more of the method of locomotion, Dora said. I believe this is a record, although I'll have to look in the files to make sure. I think that six locomotive limbs is the least I've ever heard of on an animal that size. I've checked the files, said Wego. There was a four-limbed leaf-eater recorded seven hundred years ago, four locomotive limbs, that is, and two grasping, but it was only as big as your hand. Dora looked through the three pages of the booklet. There wasn't much there, really, but he knew we go well enough to know that all the data he had thus far was there. The only thing that rankled was that we all had delayed for three work periods before reporting the intrusion of the new beast, and now five of them had been spotted. He looked at the page which showed the three bathygraphs that had been taken of the new animals from a distance. There was something odd about them, and Dudath couldn't, for the hide of him figure out what it was. It aroused an odd fear in him, and made him want to burrow deeper into the ground. "'I can't see what keeps him from falling over,' he said at last. "'Are they slow moving as they look?' "'They don't move very fast,' we all admitted, but we haven't seen any of them startled yet. I don't see how they could run very fast, though. It must take every bit of awareness they have to stay balanced on two legs.' Dodeth sighed whistlingly and pushed the data booklet back across the business bench to Weegor. All right, I will file the preliminary spotting report, and I get out there and get me some pertinent data on this queer beast. Scramble off! Right away, sir. And Weegor? Yes, sir? It is apparent that we have a totally new species here. It will be called a Weegorek. Of course, but it would be better if we waited until we could make a full report to the keepers. So, don't let any of this out, especially to the other sets. Certainly not, sir. Not a whistle. Anything else? Just keep me posted. That is all. Scramble off. After Weegor had obediently scrambled off, Dodeth relaxed all his knees and sank to his belly and thought. His job was not an easy one. He would like to have his office get full credit for discovering a new species, just as Wego had, understandably enough, wanted to get his share of the credit. On the other hand, one had to be careful that holding back information did not constitute any danger to the balance. Above all, the balance must be preserved. Even the sniff had its place in the ecological balance of the world although one didn't like to think about sniffs as being particularly useful. After all, every animal, every planet had its place in the scheme. Each contributed its little bit to maintaining the balance. Each had its niche in the ecological architecture, as Dodat liked to think of it. The trouble was that the balance was a shifting, swinging, ever-changing thing. Living tissues carried the genes of heredity in them, and living tissues are notoriously plastic under the influence of the proper radiation or particle bombardment. And animals would cross the poles. The world had been excellently designed by the universal motivator for the development and evolution of life. Again, the concept of the balance showed in his mighty work. Suppose, for instance, that the world rotated more rapidly about its axis, thereby exposing the whole surface periodically to the deadly radiation of the blue sun. Instead of having a rotation period that, combined with the eccentricity of the world's orbit, gave it just enough vibration to expose only 63% to the rays, leaving the remaining 37% in twilight or darkness. Or suppose the orbit was so nearly circular that there were no perceptible vibration at all. One side would burn eternally, and the other side would freeze, since there would be no seasonal winds blowing first east, then west, bringing the warmth of the blue sun from the other side. Or again, suppose there were no moon and no yellow sun to give light to the dark side. 
Who could live in an everlasting night? Or suppose that the magnetic field of the world were too weak to focus the majority of the blue sun's output of electrons and ions on the poles? How could life have evolved at all? Balance. And the ultimate universal motivator had put part of the responsibility into the hands of his only intelligent species, and a part of that part had been put into the hands of Dodeth Pell as the head of predator control. Friar! Something was niggling at the back of Dodeth's mind, and no amount of philosophizing would shake it. He reached into the drawer of the business bench and pulled out the duplicate of Vigar's data booklet. He flipped it open and looked at the bathographs again. There was no single thing about them that he could pinpoint, but the beasts just didn't look right. Dodeth Pell had seen many monstrous animals in his life, but none like this. Most people disliked and were disgusted by a sniff because of the uncanny resemblance the stupid beast had to the appearance of Dodath's own race. There could be no question of the genetic linkage between the two species, but in spite of the physical similarities, their actions were controlled almost entirely by instinct instead of reason. They were like some sort of idiot parody of intelligent beings, but it was their similarity which made them loathsome. Why should Dodath Pell feel a light? emotion when he saw the bathygraphs of the two-legged thing. Certainly there was no similarity. Wait a minute. He looked carefully at the three-dimensional pictures again. For riot, he couldn't be sure. After all, he wasn't a geneticist. Checking the files wouldn't be enough. He wouldn't know how to ask the proper cross-filing questions. He lolled his tongue out and absently rasped at a slight itch on the back of his hand while he thought. If his hunch were correct, then it was time to call in outside help now, instead of waiting for more information. Still, he needn't necessarily call in official expert help just yet. If he could just get a lead, enough to verify or disprove the possibility of his hunch being correct, that would be enough for a day or two, until Wigor got more data. There was always Yerdeth, an older para-brother on his prime father's side, Yerdeth, had studied genetics, theoretical, not applied, with the thought of going into control, and kept on dabbling in it, even after he discovered that his talents lay in the robot design field. Adan, he said sharply. At the other end of the office, the robot assistant ceased his work for a moment. Yes, sir. Come here a minute. I want you to look at something. Yes, sir. The robot's segmented body was built very much like Dodath's own, except that instead of the twelve pairs of legs that supported Dodath's body, the robot was equipped with wheels, each suspended separately and equipped with its individual power source. Ardan rolled sedately across the floor, his metallic body gleaming in the light from the low ceiling. He came to a halt in front of Dodath's business bench. Dodath handed Ardan the thin data booklet. Scan through that. Ardan went through it rapidly, his eyes carefully scanning each page, his brain recording everything permanently. After a few seconds, he looked back up at Dodath. A new species? Exactly. Did you notice anything odd about their appearance? Naturally, said Ardan. Since their like has never been seen before, it is axiomatic that they would appear odd. For I, Dodath thought, you should have known better than to ask a question like that of Ardan. To ask it... To determine what might be called second-order strangeness in a pattern that was strange in the first place was asking too much of a robot. Very well, then. Make an appointment for this evening with Yerdeth Pell. I would like to see him at his home, if it is convenient. Yes, sir, said the robot. Evening was four week periods away, and even after Yerdeth had granted the appointment, Dodeth found himself fidgeting in anticipation. Twice during the following work periods, Vigor came in with more information. He had gone above ground with a group of protection robots finally to take a look at the new animals himself, but he hadn't yet managed to obtain enough data 
to make a definitive report on the strange beast, for the lack of data was in itself significant. Dodeth usually liked to walk through the broad tunnels of the main thoroughfare, since he didn't particularly care to ride robot back for so short a distance, but this time he was in such a hurry to see Yodeth that he decided to let Ardan take him. He climbed aboard, clamped his legs to the robot's side, and said, To Yodeth, pals! The robot said, Yes, sir and rolled out to the side tunnel that led toward one of the main robot tunnels. When they finally came to a tunnel labelled Robots and Passengers Only, Ardan rolled into it and revved his wheels up to high speed, shooting down the tunnelway at a much higher velocity than Dilleth could possibly have run. The tunnelway was crowded with passenger-carrying robots and with robots alone, carrying out orders from their masters. But there was no danger. No robot could learn any of Dodeth's race, nor could any robot stand idly by while someone was harmed. Even in the most crowded of conditions, every robot in the area had one thing foremost in his mind, the safety of every human within sight or hearing. Dodeth ignored the traffic altogether. He had other things to think about, and he knew without even bothering to consider it, that Ardan could be relied upon to take care of everything. Even if it cost him his own pseudo-life, Ardan would do everything in his power to preserve the safety and health of his passenger. Once in a while, in unusual circumstances, a robot would even disobey orders to save a life, for obedience was strictly secondary to the sanctity of human life just as the robot's desire to preserve his own pseudo-living existence was outranked by the desire to obey. Dodo thought about his job, but he carefully kept his mind off the new beasts. He knew that fussing in his mind over them wouldn't do him any good until he had more to work with, things which only his para-brother Yerdeth could supply him. Besides, there was the problem of what to do about the Herkel breeding sites, which were being encroached upon by the Quigglies. Some of the swamps on the surface, especially those that approached the hot belts, were being dried out and filled with dust, which decreased the area where the Herkel could lay its eggs, but increased the nesting sites for Quiggies. That, of course, was a yearly cycle in general. As the blue sun moved from one side to the other, and the wind shifted accordingly, the swamps near the twilight border would dry out or fill up accordingly. But this year the eastern swamps weren't filling up as they should, and some precautionary measures would have to be taken to prevent too great a shift in the Herkel Quiggy balance. Then there was the compensating migratory shift of the hotland beasts, those which lived in the areas where the slanting rays of the blue sun could actually touch them, and which could not stand the to them terrible cold of the dark lands. Instead, they moved back and forth with the blue sun and remained in their own area, a hot, dry, fiery, bright hinterland, occupied only by nerves, poles, and other horrendous beasts. Beyond those areas, according to the robot patrols which had reconnoitred there, nothing lived, nothing could. No protoplasmic being could exist under the direct rays of the blue sun. Even the metal and translite bodies of a robot wouldn't long protect the sensitive mechanisms within from the furnace heat of the huge star. Each species had its niche in the world. Some, like the Herkel, lived in swamp water. Others lived in lakes and streams. Still others flew in the skies, or roamed the surface, or climbed the great trees. Some, like Dodeth's own people, lived beneath the surface. The one thing an intelligent species had to be most careful about was not to disturb the balance with their abilities, but to work to preserve it. In the past, there had been those who had built cities on the surface, but the cities had removed the natural growth from large areas, which in turn had forced the city people to import their food from outside the cities, and that had meant an enforced increase in the cultivation of the remaining soil, which destroyed the habitats of other animals, besides depleting the soil itself. 
The only sensible way was to live under the farmland, so that no man was ever more than a few hundred feet from the food supply. The universal motivator had chosen that their species should evolve in burrows beneath the surface, and if that was the niche chosen for Dodeth's people, then that was obviously where they should remain, to keep the balance. Of course, the Snith, too, was an underground animal, although the tunnels were unlined. The Sniths' tunnels ran between and around the armoured tunnels of Dodeth's people, so that each city surrounded the other without contact, if the burrows of the Snith could properly be called a city. Iadath Pal's residence, said Aram. Ah, oh, yes, Dodeth, his thoughts interrupted, slid off the back of the robot and flexed his legs. Wait here, Ardan, I'll be back in an hour or so. Then he scrambled over to the door which led to Yadeth's apartment. Twenty minutes later, Yadeth Pell looked up from the data book facsimiles and scanned Dodeth's face with appraising eyes. Very cute, he said at last, with a slight chuckle. Now what I want to know is, is someone playing a joke on you, or are you playing a joke on me? Dodeth's eyelids slid upward in a fast blink of surprise. What do you mean? Why, these bathygraphs, Yodeth. Wrap the bathygraphs with a wrinkled horny hand. He was a good deal older than Dodeth, and his voice had a tendency to rasp a little when the frequency went above 20,000 cycles. They're very good, of course. I mean, very good. The models have very fine detail to them. The eyes especially are good, and they look as if they really ought to be built that way. <laughs> he smiled and looked up at Dodeth. Dodeth resisted an urge to ripple a stump. Well, he said impatiently, Well, they can't be real, you know. Yodeth replied mildly, Why not? Oh, come now, Dodeth. What did it evolve from? An animal doesn't just spring out of nowhere, you know. New species are discovered occasionally, Dodeth said, and there are plenty of mutants and just plain freaks. Certainly, certainly, but you don't hatch a sniff out of a hurt leg. Where are your intermediate stages? Is it possible that we might have missed the intermediate stage? I said stages, plural. Pick any known animal, any one, and tell me how many genetic changes would have to take place before you'd come up with an animal anything like this one. Again, he tapped the bathygraph. Now, take that eye, for instance. The lid goes down instead of up. But you notice that there is a smaller lid at the bottom that does go up a little ways. The closest thing to an eye like that is on the hoogl, which has eyelids on top that lower a little. But the hoogl has 18 segments, 16 pairs of legs, and two pairs of feeling claws. Besides, it's only the size of your thumb joint. What kind of gene mutation would it take to change that into an animal like the one in this picture? And look at the size of the thing. If it weren't in that awkward vertical position, if it were stretched out on the ground, it'd be all as long as a human. Look at the size of those legs. Or take another thing. In order to walk on those two legs, the changes in skeleton and visceral structure would have to be tremendous. Couldn't we have missed the intermediate stages, then, Dorothy asked stubbornly. We've missed the intermediates before, I dare say. Perhaps we have, he had admitted. But if you boys in the ecological core have been on your toes for the past thousand years, we haven't missed many. And it would take at least that long for something like this to evolve from anything we know. Even under direct polar bombardment? Even under direct polar bombardment, the radiation up here is strong enough to sterilize a race within a very few generations. And what would they eat? <laughs> Not many plants survive there, you know. Well, I didn't say it's likely impossible, you understand, if a female of some animal or other carrying a freshly fertilized zygote and her species happened to have all the necessary potential characteristics and a flood of ionizing radiation went through the zygote at exactly the right time and it managed to hit just the right genes in just the right way, well, I'm sure you can see the odds against it are tremendous. I wouldn't even want to guess at the order of magnitude of the exponent. I'd have to put on a ten in order to give you the odds against it. Dodeth didn't quite get that 
last statement, but he let it pass. I'm going to pull somebody's legs off, one by one, come next work period, he said coldly, one by one. He didn't, though. Rather than accuse Wygor, it would be better if Wygor were allowed to accuse himself. Dodeth merely wanted to wait for the opportunity to present itself, and then, ah, then there would be a roasting. The opportunity came in the latter part of the next week. Vigor, who had purportedly been up on the surface for another field trip, scuttled excitedly into Dodeth's office, wildly waving some bathygraph sheets. Dodeth, sir, look! I came down as soon as I saw it. I've got the grass right here! Horrible! Before Dodeth could say anything, Wagor had spread the sheets out fanwise on his business bench. Dodeth looked at them and experienced a moment of horror himself before he realized that these were, these must be, doctored bathygraphs. Even so, he gave an involuntary grasp. The first grafts had been taken from an aerial reconnaissance robot, winging in low over the treetops. The others were taken from a higher altitude. They all showed the same carnage, an area of several thousand square feet. Tens of thousands had been cleared of trees. They had been ruthlessly cut down and stacked. Bushes and vines had gone with them, and the grass had been crushed and ploughed up by the dragging of the great fallen trees. And there were obvious signs that the work was still going on. In the close-ups he could see the bipedal beasts wielding cutting instruments. Dodeth forced himself to calmness and glared at the bathygraphs. Riot. They had to be fixed. A new species might appear only once in a hundred years, but according to Yadeth, this couldn't possibly be a new species. What was Wigor's purpose in lying, though? Why would he falsify data? And it must be he. He had said that he had seen the beast himself. Well, Dodeth would have to find out. Two users, eh? He said, amazed at the calmness of his voice. Such animals weren't unusual. The sniths used tools for digging and even for fighting each other, and the hercules dammed up small streams with logs to increase their marshland. It wasn't immediately apparent what these beasts were up to, but it was far too destructive to allow it to go on. But try it all. It couldn't be going on. There were only two alternatives. Either we go or was a liar, or Yadeth didn't know what he was talking about, and there was only one way of finding out which was which. Adan, get my equipment ready. We're going on a field trip. We go. You get the rest of the expedition ready. You and I are going up to see what all this is about. He jabbed the communicator button. Fret. Why should this have to happen in my sector? Hello? Give me an intercity connection. I want to talk to Bacon Benz, Coordinator of Ecological Control in Fisala. He looked up at Wigor. Scatter up, Riot. I want to... Oh, hello, Bacon, sir. To death. Have you had any reports on a new species, a bipedal one? What? Well, no, sir, I'm not kidding. One of my men has brought in grafts of the thing. Frankly, I'm inclined to think it's a hoax of some kind, but I would like to ask you to check if it's been reported in any of the other areas. We're located a little out of the way here, and I thought perhaps some of the stations farther north or south had seen it. Yes, that's right. Two locomotive limbs, two handling limbs, big as a human, and they hold their bodies perpendicular to the ground. Yes, sir, I know it sounds silly, and I am going out to check the story now, but you ought to see these bathygraphs. If it is a hoax, there is an expert behind it. Very well, sir, I will wait. Dodeth scowled. Batham had sounded as if he, Dodeth, had lost his senses. Maybe I have, he thought. Maybe I'll start running around mindlessly and get shot down by some patrol robot who thinks I'm a sniff. Maybe he should have investigated first and then called when he was sure one way or another. Maybe he should have told Batham he was certain it was a hoax instead of hedging his bets. Maybe a lot of things, but it was too... Hello... Uh, yes, sir, no, no, you will, yes, sir, yes, sir, I will give you a call as soon as I have checked. Yes, sir, thank you, sir. Though death felt like an absolute fool, individually and collectively, he consigned to the frying pan, bait them, we go, yard out the new beast, if it existed, and finally himself. By the time he had finished his all-encompassing curse, his two dozen pistoning legs, 
nearly brought him to the equipment room where Ardan and Wigo were waiting. Four hours and more of steady travelling did very little to sweeten Dodath Pell's temper. The armoured car was uncomfortable, and the silence within it was even more uncomfortable. He did not at all feel like making small talk with Wigo, and he had nothing as yet to say to Ardan or the patrol robots who were rolling along with the armoured car. One thing he had to admit, Wigo certainly didn't act like a man who was being carried to his own doom, which he certainly was, if this was hope. Wegor would lose all position and be reduced to living off his civil insurance. He would be pitied by all and respected by none. But it didn't look as though that worried him at all. Dodath contented himself with looking at the scenery. The car was not yet into the forest country. This was all rolling grassland. Off to one side, a small herd of grazing grancos lifted their graceful heads to watch the passage of the expedition, then lowered them again to feed. A fang zittiban, disturbed in the act of stalking the grancos, stiffened all his legs and froze for a moment, looking balefully at the car and the robots, then went on about his business. When they came to the forest, the going became somewhat harder, Centuries ago, those who had tried to build cities on the surface had also built paved strips to make travel by car easier and smoother. And Dodath almost wished there were one leading to the target area. Variety hated travelling, especially in a lurching armoured car. He wished he were bored enough or tired enough to go to sleep, but last, at long last, Wegor ordered the car to stop. We are within two miles of the clearing, sir, he told Dodath. All right, Dodath said morosely. I'll go the rest of the way on foot. I don't want to startle them at this stage of the game, so keep it quiet and stay hidden. Tell the patrol robots to spread out, and tell them I want all the movie shots we can get. I want all the keepers to see these things in action. Got that? Then let's get moving. They crept forward through the forest, Dodath and Ardan taking the right, while Wegor and his own robot, Hassan, stayed a few yards away to the left. They were all expert woodsmen, Dodath and Wegor by training and experience, and the robots by indoctrination. Even so, Dodath never felt completely comfortable above ground, with nothing over his head but the clouded sky. The team had purposely chosen to approach from a small rise, where they could look down on the clearing without being seen, and when they reached the incline that led to the ridge, one of the armed patrol robots who had been in the lead took a look over the ridge and then scuttled back to Dodath. There, there, sir. What are they doing? Dodath asked, scarcely daring to believe. Feeding, I believe, sir. They aren't cutting down any trees now. They are just sitting on one of the logs, feeding themselves with their handling limbs. How many are there? Twenty, sir. I'll take a look. I scrambled up the ridge and peeked over, and there they were, less than a quarter of a mile away. Dazedly, Dodath took a pair of field glasses from Ardan and focused them on the group. Oh, they were real all right, no doubt of that. None whatever. Mechanically, he counted them twenty. Most of them were feeding, but... Four of them seemed to be standing a little apart from the others, watching the forest, acting as lookouts. Typical herd action, Dodath thought. He waved, wished that Yedath were here. He would show that fool what good his ten to the billion thoughts were. And yet, in another way, Dodath had the feeling that his para-brother was right. How could the life of the world have suddenly evolved such creatures, for they looked even more impossible when seen in the flesh? Their locomotive limbs ended in lumpy protuberances that showed no sign of toes, and they were covered all over with a dull grey hide, except for the hands at the ends of their handling limbs, and the necks, and the faces of their oddly shaped heads, where the skin ranged in colour from a pinkish to a definite brown, depending on the individual. There was no hair anywhere on their bodies, except on the top and the back of their heads. No, wait, there were two long tufts above each eye. They... Do you see what they're eating? We gore's voice whispered. Dodeth hadn't. He'd been too busy looking at the things themselves, but when he did notice, he made a noise like a throttle. Get, go, 
there were few enough of the animals, only a few small population was needed to keep the balance, but they were important, and the swamps were drying up and the quiggies were moving in on them, and now Dudeth made a hasty count twenty by the universal motivator. These predators had eaten a hurkle apiece. Overhead, the yellow sun, a distant dot of intensely bright light, shed its warm glow over the ghastly scene. Dudeth wished the moon were out. Its much brighter light would have shown him more detail, but he could see well enough to count the gnawed skeletons of the little harmless hurkles, even the moon, which wouldn't bring morning for another fifteen work periods yet couldn't have made it any plainer that these beasts were deadly dangerous to the balance how often do they eat he asked in a strained voice it was Uyghur's robot Arsam who answered about three times every work period they sleep then their metabolic cycle seems to be timed about the same as yours sir <laughs> Said Doda, sixty hercules per sleep period. Why, they'll have the whole hercule population eaten before long we go. As soon as we can get shots of all this, we are going back. There's not a moment to lose. This is the most deadly, dangerous thing that has ever happened to the world. Fry me, yes, Vigo said in an awed voice. Three hercules in one period. Allow me to correct you, sir, said the patrol robot. They do not eat that many hercules. They eat other things besides. Like what? For instance? Dodath asked in a choked voice. The robot told him, and Dodath groaned. Omnivores, that is even worse, Ardan. Pass the word to the scouts to get their pictures and meet at that tree down there behind us in ten minutes. We've got to get back to the city. Dodeth Pell laid his palms flat on the speaker's bench and looked around at the assembled keepers of the balance, wise and prudent thinkers who had spent lifetimes in ecological service and had shown their capabilities many times over. And that is the situation, sirs, he said after a significant pause. The moving and still bathygraphs, the data sheets and the samplings of the area all tell the same story. I do not feel that I alone can make the decision. Emotionally, I must admit, I am tempted to destroy all twenty of the monsters. Intellectually, I realize that we should attempt to capture at least one family group if we can discover what constitutes a family group in this species. Unfortunately, we cannot tell the sexes apart by visual inspection. The sex organ themselves must be hidden in the folds of that grey hide. And this is evidently not their breeding season, for we have seen no sign of sexual activity. We have very little time, sirs, it seems to me. The damage they have already done will take years to repair, and the danger of upsetting the balance irreparably grows exponentially greater with every passing work period. Sirs, I ask your advice and your decision. There was a murmur of approval for his presentation as he came down from the speaker's bench. Then the keepers went into their respective committee meetings to discuss the various problems of detail that had arisen out of the one great problem. Dodath went into an anteroom and tried to relax and get a little sleep, though he doubted he'd get any. His nerves were too much on edge. I'd unwoke him gently, your breakfast, sir. Dodath blinked and jerked his head up. Oh, um, Arlan, have the keepers reached any decision yet? No, sir, not yet. The data is still coming in. It was three more work periods before the keepers called Dodeth Pell before them again. Dodeth could almost read the decision on their faces. There was both sadness and determination there. It was an uncomfortable decision, Dodeth Pell said the eldest keeper, without preliminary but a necessary one. We can find no place in the ecological balance for this species. We have already ordered a patrol column of two hundred fully armed pesticide robots to destroy the animals. Two are to be captured alive, if possible, but if not, the bodies will be brought to the biological laboratories for study. Within a few hours, the species will be nearly or completely extinct. By the way, you may tell your assistant, Uyghur, that the animal will go down in the files as Uyghurex, a unique distinction for him in many ways, but not, I fear, a happy one. Dodath nodded silently. Now that the decision had been made, he felt rather bad about it. Something in him rebelled at the thought of a species becoming extinct, no matter how great the need. 
he wondered if it would be possible for the biologists and the geneticists to trace the evolution of the animal. He hoped so. At least they deserved that much. Dodath Pell delayed returning to his own city. He wanted to wait until the final results had been brought in before he returned to his duties. The delay turned out to be a little longer than he expected, much longer, in fact. The communicator in his temporary room buzzed, and when he answered, Wigor's voice came to him, a rush of excited words that didn't make any sense at all at first, and when it did make sense, he didn't believe it. What is well, what? I said... Wigor repeated that the report has come back from the pesticide column. They have found no trace of any such animal as we have described. Then they were to be found in or near the clearing. I think, said Dereth very calmly, that I'll take a little trip over to the bright side and take up permanent residence there. It's going to be pretty hot for me around here before long. And he cut the connection without waiting for Wigor's answer. The armoured car jounced across the grassland at high speed. Behind it, two more cars followed, each taking care not to run exactly in the tracks of the one ahead, so that there would be as little damage as possible done to the grass. In the lead car, Dodeth Pell watched the forest loom nearer, wondering what sort of madness he would find there this time. Beside him, the eldest keeper dozed gently in the way that only the very young or the very old can doze. It was just as well. Dodeth didn't feel much like talking. This time, as they approached the clearing, he didn't bother to tell the car to stop two miles away. If the animals were gone, there was no point in being cautious. All through the wooded area he could see occasional members of the pesticide robots. He told the car to stop at the base of the little rise that he used before as a vantage point. Then, without further preliminaries, he got out of the car and marched up the slope to take a look at the clearing. Overhead, the burning spark of the yellow sun cast its pale radiance over the landscape. At the ridge, he stopped suddenly and ducked his head. Then he grabbed his field glasses and took a good look. The animals had built themselves. A few crude-looking shelters out of the logs, but he hardly noticed that. There were four of the animals in plain sight, standing guard. The others were obviously inside the root huts asleep. A great galloping fungus blight, was he out of his mind? What was going on around here? Couldn't the robots see the beasts? That's very odd, said the voice of the eldest keeper in puzzled tones. I thought the robots said they'd gone away. Lend me your field glasses. As he handed the powerful glasses over to the keeper, who had followed him up the hill, there had said, I'm glad you can see them. I thought maybe my brain had been short-circuited. I can see them, said the eldest keeper, peering through the glasses. Then he handed them back to Dodath. Let's get back down to the car. I want to find out what is going on around here. At the car, the eldest keeper just scowled for a moment, looking very worried. By this time, the other two cars had pulled up nearby, discharging that cargo of two more keepers apiece, while just the eldest keeper talked in low tones with his colleagues. Dodath stalked over to one of the pesticide robots who was prowling nearby. Found anything useful? he asked sarcastically, knowing that sarcasm was useless on a robot. I am not looking for anything useful, sir. I am looking for the animals we are supposed to destroy. You come over and tell the eldest keeper that, Dodath said. Yes, sir, the robot agreed promptly, rolling along beside Dodath as he returned to where the keepers were waiting. What is going on here? the eldest demanded curtly of the robot. Why haven't you destroyed the animals? Because we cannot find them, sir. What is your name? the eldest snapped. Arika, sir. All right, Arika, said the eldest somewhat angrily. Stand by for orders. He'll repeat them to the other robots. Understand? Yes, sir, said the robot. All right, then, said the eldest. First, you take a run up that hill and look into that clearing. You'll see those creatures in there. All right. Yes, sir. I've seen those creatures in there. The eldest keeper exploded. Then get in there and obey your orders. Don't you realize that their very existence threatens the life of all of us? They must be eliminated before our whole culture is destroyed. Do you understand? Obey. Yes, sir, said the robot. His voice sounded odd, but he spun around and went to pass the word on to the other robots. Within minutes, more and more of the pesticide robots were swarming toward and into the clearing. They could hear rumbling noises from the clearing, low grunts that were evidently made by animals who were trapped by the encircling robots, and then there was a vast silence. Dodath and the keepers waited. 
Not a shot was fired. It was as though a great soundproof blanket had been flung over the whole area. What in the unknown name of the universal motivator is going on around here? said Dodeth in a hushed tone. He wondered how many times he had asked himself that. We may as well take a look, said the eldest keeper. Two hundred pesticide robots were ranged around the perimeter of the clearing, their weapons facing inwards, not a one of them moved. Inside the circle of machines, the twenty Uyghurks stood motionless, watching the ring of robots. Now and then one of them gave a deep coughing rumble, but otherwise they made no noise. Dodeth Pearl could stand it no longer. Robots! he shouted as loudly as could his voice shrill with urgency. I order you to fire! It was as though he hadn't said a word. Both robots and Uyghurks ignored him completely. Dodeth turned and yelled to one of the patrol robots that were standing nearby. You! What is your name? Avam, sir. Avam, can you tell what it is those things have done to the robots? They haven't done anything, sir. Then why don't the robots fire as they have been told? Dodeth didn't want to admit it, even to himself, but he was badly frightened. He'd never heard of a robot behaving this way before. They can't, sir. They can't? Don't they realize that if those things aren't killed, we may all die? I didn't know that, said the patrol robot. If we do not kill them, then you may be killed, and you have ordered us to kill them. But if we obey your orders, then we will kill them, and that will mean that you won't be killed. But they will, so we can't do that. But if we don't, then you will be killed, and we must obey, and that means we must, but we can't. But if we don't, we will, and we can't. So we must, but we can't. But if we don't, you will. So we must, but we can't, but we... He kept repeating it over and over again, and on and on and on. Stop that! snapped Dodeth, but the robot didn't even seem to hear. Dodeth was really frightened now. He looked back at the five keepers and scuttled toward them. What is wrong with the robots? He asked shrilly. They have never failed us before. The elder keeper looked at him. What makes you think they failed us now? He asked softly. Dereth gaped speechlessly. The eldest didn't seem to be making any more sense than the patrol robot had. No, the keeper went on. They haven't failed us. They have served us well. They have pointed out to us something which we have failed to see, and in doing so, have saved us from making a catastrophic error. I don't understand, said Dodo. I will explain, the elder keeper said, but first go over to that patrol robot and tell him quietly that the situation has changed. Tell him that we are no longer in any danger from the Uyghurx. Then bring him over here. Dodo did as he was told, without understanding at all. I still don't understand, sir, he said bewilderedly. Dodo, what would happen... If I told Arbam here to fire on you, why, why, he'd refuse. Why should he? Because I'm human. That's the most basic robot command. I don't know, the eldest said. Eyeing Dodeth shrewdly, you might not be human. You might be Smith. You look like a Smith. Dodeth swallowed the insult, wondering what the eldest meant. Arbam, the eldest keeper said to the robot, doesn't he look like a Smith to you? Yes, sir, Arvam agreed. Dodeth swallowed that one, too. And how do you know he isn't a Smith, Arvam? Because he behaves like a human, sir. A Smith does not behave like a human. And if something does behave like a human, what then? Anything that behaves like a human is human, sir. Dodeth suddenly felt as though his eyes had suddenly focused after being unfocused for a long time. He gestured toward the clearing. You mean those, those things are human? Yes, sir, said Avam solidly. But they don't even talk. Pardon me for correcting you, sir, but they do. I cannot understand their speech, but the pattern is clearly recognizable as speech. Most of their conversation is carried on in terms of subsonic frequency, so your ears cannot hear it. 
Apparently your voices are supersonic to them. Well, I'll be fried, said Dodeth. He looked at the elder keeper. That's why the robots reported they couldn't find any animal of that description in the vicinity. Certainly, there weren't any. And we were so fooled by their monstrous appearance that we didn't pay any attention to their actions, said Dodeth exactly. But this makes the puzzle even worse, said Dodeth. How could such a creature evolve? Look, interrupted one of the other keepers, pointing up there in the sky. All eyes turned toward the direction the finger pointed. It was a silvery speck in the sky that moved and became larger. I don't think they're from our world at all, said the eldest keeper. He turned to the patrol robot. Arvan, go down and tell the pesticide robots that there is no danger to us. They are still confused, and I have a feeling that the humans in that ship up there might not like it if we are caught pointing guns at their friends. As Arvam rolled off, Dodeth said, Another world? Why not, asked the eldest. The moon, after all, is another world, smaller than ours, to be sure, and airless, but still another world. We haven't thought too much about other worlds, because we have our own world to take care of. But there was a time back in the days of the builders of the surface cities, when our people dreamed such things. But our moon was the only one close enough and there was no point in going to a place which is even more hellish than our bright side. But suppose the yellow sun also has a planet, or maybe even one of the more distant suns, which are hardly more than glimmers of light. They came, and they landed a few of their party to make a small clearing. Then the ship went somewhere else, to the dark side of our moon, maybe. I don't know. But they were within calling range, for the ship was called as soon as trouble appeared. We don't know anything about them yet, but we will. And we've got to show them that we too are human. We have a job ahead of us, a job of communication. But we also have a great future if we handle things right. Dodeth watched the ship, now grown to a silvery globe of tremendous size, drift slowly downward toward the clearing. He felt an inward glow of intense anticipation. And he fidgeted impatiently as he waited to see what would happen next. He rippled a stomp. End of The Asses of Balaam by Gordon Randall Garrett How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew. Larry Thomas bought a cuckoo clock for his wife, without knowing the price he would have to pay. That night, at the dinner table, he bought it out and set it down beside her plate. Doris stared at it, her hand to her mouth. My God, what is it? She looked up at him, bright-eyed. "'Well, open it!' Doris tore the ribbon and paper from the square package with her sharp nails, her bosom rising and falling. Larry stood watching her as she lifted the lid. He lit a cigarette and leaned against the wall. "'A cuckoo clock!' Doris cried. "'A real old cuckoo clock like my mother had!' 
She turned the clock over and over, just like my mother had when Pete was still alive. Her eyes sparkled with tears. It's made in Germany, Larry said. After a moment, he added, Carl got it for me wholesale. He knows some guy in the clock business. Otherwise, I wouldn't have... He stopped. Doris made a funny little sound. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to afford it. He scowled. What's the matter with you? You've got your clock, haven't you? Isn't that what you want? Doris sat holding on to the clock, her fingers pressed against the brown wood. Well, Larry said, what's the matter? He watched in amazement as she leapt up and ran from the room, still clutching the clock. He shook his head. Never satisfied. They're all that way. Never get enough. He sat down at the table and finished his meal. The cuckoo clock was not very large. It was handmade, however, and there were countless frets on it, little indentations and ornaments scored in the soft wood. Doris sat on the bed, drying her eyes and winding the clock. She set the hands by her wristwatch. Presently, she carefully moved the hands to two minutes of ten. She carried the clock over to the dresser and propped it up. Then she sat waiting, her hands twisting together in her lap, waiting for the cuckoo to come out, for the hour to strike. As she sat, she thought about Larry and what he had said, and what she had said too, for that matter, not that she could be blamed for any of it. After all, she couldn't keep listening to him forever without defending herself. You had to blow your own trumpet in the world. She touched her handkerchief to her eyes suddenly. Why did he have to say that, about getting it wholesale? Why did he have to spoil it all? If he felt that way, he needn't have got it in the first place. She clenched her fists. He was so mean, so damn mean. But she was glad of the little clock sitting there ticking to itself, with its funny grilled edges and the door. Inside the door was the cuckoo, waiting to come out. Was he listening, his head cocked on one side, listening to hear the clock strike so that he would know to come out? Did he sleep between hours? Well, she would soon see him. She could ask him. And she would show the clock to Bob. He would love it. Bob loved old things. Even old stamps and buttons. He liked to go with her to the stores. Of course, it was a little awkward. But Larry had been staying at the office so much, and that helped. If only Larry didn't call up sometimes to... There was a whir. The clock shuddered, and all at once the door opened. The cuckoo came out, sliding swiftly. He paused and looked around solemnly, scrutinizing her, the room, the furniture. It was the first time he had seen her, she realized, smiling to herself in pleasure. She stood up, coming towards him shyly. Go on, she said. I'm waiting. The cuckoo opened his bill. He whirred and chirped, quickly, rhythmically. Then, after a moment of contemplation, he retired, and the door snapped shut. She was delighted. She clapped her hands and spun in a little circle. He was marvelous, perfect. And the way he had looked around, studying her, sizing her up. He liked her. She was certain of it. And she, of course, loved him at once, completely. He was just what she had hoped would come out of the little door. Doris went to the clock. She bent over the little door, her lips close to the wood. Do you hear me? She whispered. I think you're the most wonderful cuckoo in the world. She paused, embarrassed. I hope you'll like it here. Then she went downstairs again, slowly, her head high. Larry and the cuckoo clock really never got along well from the start. Doris said it was because he didn't wind it right, and it didn't like being only half-wound all the time. Larry turned the job of winding over to her. The cuckoo came out every quarter hour and ran the spring down without remorse, and someone had to be ever after it, winding it up again. Doris did her best, but she forgot a good deal of the time. Then Larry would throw his newspaper down with an elaborate weary motion and stand up. He would go into the dining room where the clock was mounted on the wall over the fireplace. He would take the clock down, and making sure he had his thumb over the little door, he would wind it up. Why do you put your thumb over the door? Doris asked once. You're supposed to. She raised an eyebrow. Are you sure? I wonder if it isn't that you don't want him to come out while you're standing so close. Why not? Maybe you're afraid of him. Larry laughed. 
He put the clock back on the wall and gingerly removed his thumb. When Doris wasn't looking, he examined his thumb. There was still a trace of the nick cut out of the soft part of it. Who, or what, had pecked at him? One Saturday morning, when Larry was down at the office working over some important special accounts, Bob Chambers came to the front porch and rang the bell. Doris was taking a quick shower. She dried herself and slipped into her robe. When she opened the door, Bob stepped inside grinning. Ha! he said, looking around. It's all right. Larry's at the office. Fine. Bob gazed at her slim legs below the hem of the robe. How nice you look today. She laughed. Be careful. Maybe I shouldn't let you in after all. They looked at one another, half amused, half frightened. Presently, Bob said, If you want, I'll... No, for God's sake. She caught hold of his sleeve. Just get out of the doorway so I can close it. Miss Peters across the street, you know. She closed the door. And I want to show you something, she said. You haven't seen it. He was interested. An antique or what? She took his arm, leading him towards the dining room. You'll love it, Bobby. She stopped, wide-eyed. I hope you will. You must. You must love it. It means so much to me. He means so much. He? Bob frowned. Who is he? Doris laughed. You're jealous. Come on. A moment later, they stood before the clock, looking up at it. He'll come out in a few minutes. Wait until you see him. I know you two will get along just fine. What does Larry think of him? They don't like each other. Sometimes when Larry's here, he won't come out. Larry gets mad if he doesn't come out on time. He says... Says what? Doris looked down. He always says he's been robbed, even if he didn't get it wholesale. She brightened. But I know he won't come out because he doesn't like Larry. When I'm here alone, he comes right out for me every fifteen minutes, even though he really only has to come out on the hour. She gazed up at the clock. He comes out for me because he wants to. We talk. I tell him things. Of, of course, I'd like to have him upstairs in my room, but it wouldn't be right. There was the sound of footsteps on the porch. They looked at each other, horrified. Larry pushed the front door open, grunting. He set his briefcase down and took off his hat. Then he saw Bob for the first time. Chambers, I'll be damned. His eyes narrowed. What are you doing here? He came back into the dining room. Doris drew her robe around her helplessly, backing away. Ah, Bob began. That is, we, he broke off, glancing at Doris. Suddenly, the clock began to whir. The cuckoo came rushing out, bursting into sound. Larry moved towards him. Shut that din off, he said. He raised his fist towards the clock. The cuckoo snapped into silence and retreated. The door closed. That's better. Larry studied Doris and Bob, standing mutely together. I came over to look at the clock, Bob said. Doris told me that it's a rare antique and that... Nuts. I bought it myself. Larry walked up to him. Get out of here, he turned to Doris. You too, and take that damn clock with you. He paused, rubbing his chin. No. Leave the clock here. It's mine. I bought it and paid for it. In the weeks that followed after Doris left, Larry and the cuckoo clock got along even worse than before. For one thing, the cuckoo stayed inside most of the time, sometimes even at twelve o'clock, when he should have been busiest. And if he did come out at all, he usually only spoke once or twice, never the correct number of times. And there was a sullen, uncooperative note in his voice, a jarring sound that made Larry uneasy and a little angry. But he kept the clock wound, because the house was very still and quiet, and it got on his nerves not to hear someone running around, talking and dropping things. And even the whirring of the clock sounded good to him. But he didn't like the cuckoo at all, and sometimes he spoke to him. Listen, he said late one night to the closed little door. I know you can hear me. I ought to give you back to the Germans, back to the Black Forest. He paced back and forth. I wonder what they're doing now, the two of them, the young punk and his books and his antiques. 
A man shouldn't be interested in antiques. That's for women, he set his jaw. Isn't that right? The clock said nothing. Larry walked up in front of it. Isn't that right? he demanded. Don't you have anything to say? He looked at the face of the clock. It was almost eleven, just a few seconds before the hour. All right. I'll wait until eleven. Then I want to hear what you have to say. You've been pretty quiet the last few weeks since she left. He grinned wryly. Maybe you don't like it here since she's gone. He scowled. Well, I paid for you, and you're coming out whether you like it or not. You hear me? Eleven o'clock came. Far off, far off, at the end of town, the great tower clock boomed sleepily to itself. But the little door remained shut. Nothing moved. The minute hand passed on and the cuckoo did not stir. He was someplace inside the clock beyond the door, silent and remote. All right, if that's the way you feel, Larry murmured, his lips twisting. But it isn't fair. It's your job to come out. We all have to do things we don't like. He went unhappily into the kitchen and opened the great gleaming refrigerator. As he poured himself a drink, he thought about the clock. There was no doubt about it. The cuckoo should come out, Doris or no Doris. He had always liked her from the very start. They had got along well, the two of them. Probably he liked Bob, too. Probably he had seen enough of Bob to get to know him. They would be quite happy together, Bob and Doris and the cuckoo. Larry finished his drink. He opened the drawer at the sink and took out the hammer. He carried it carefully into the dining room. The clock was ticking gently to itself on the wall. Look, he said, waving the hammer. You know what I have here? You know what I'm going to do with it? I'm going to start on you first, he smiled. Birds of a feather, that's what you are, the three of you. The room was silent. Are you coming out, or do I have to come in and get you? The clock whirred a little. I hear you in there. You've got a lot of talking to do. Enough for the last three weeks. As I figure it, you owe me... The door opened. The cuckoo came out fast, straight at him. Larry was looking down, his brow wrinkled in thought. He glanced up, and the cuckoo caught him squarely in the eye. Down he went, hammer and chair and everything hitting the floor with a tremendous crash. For a moment, the cuckoo paused its small body poised rigidly. Then it went back inside its house. The door snapped tight shut after it. The man lay on the floor, stretched out grotesquely, his head bent over to one side. Nothing moved or stirred. The room was completely silent, except, of course, for the ticking of the clock. "'I see,' Doris said, her face tight. Bob put his arm around her, steadying her. "'Doctor?' Bob said. "'Can I ask you something?' "'Of course,' the doctor said. "'Is it very easy to break your neck, falling from so low a chair? "'It wasn't very far to fall. "'I wonder if it might not have been an accident. "'Is there any chance it might have been a suicide?' "'The doctor rubbed his jaw. "'I never heard of anyone committing suicide that way. "'It was an accident, I'm positive. "'I don't mean suicide.' Bob murmured under his breath, looking up at the clock on the wall. I meant something else. But no one heard him. End of Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew Crossroads of Destiny by H. Beam Piper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Monat. Crossroads of Destiny by H. Beam Piper I still have the dollar bill. It's in my box at the bank, and I think that's where it will stay. I simply won't destroy it, but I can think of nobody to whom I'd be willing to show it. Certainly nobody at the college, my history department colleagues least of all. Merely to tell the story would brand me irredeemably as a crackpot, but crackpots are tolerated even on college faculties. It's only when they begin producing physical evidence that they get themselves actively resented. 
When I went into the club car for a nightcap before going back to my compartment to turn in, there were five men there sitting together. One was an army officer with the insignia and badges of a staff intelligence colonel. Next to him was a man of about my own age with sandy hair and a bony Scottish-looking face who sat staring silently into a highball which he held in both hands. Across the aisle, an elderly man who could have been a lawyer or a banker, was smoking a cigar over a glass of port, and beside him sat a plump and slightly too well-groomed individual, who had a tall, colorless drink, probably gin and tonic. The fifth man, separated from him by a vacant chair, seemed to be dividing his attention between a book on his lap and the conversation, in which he was taking no part. I sat down beside the sandy-haired man. As I did so and rang for the waiter, the colonel was saying, No, that wouldn't. I can think of a better one. Suppose you have Columbus get his ships from Henry the Seventh of England and sail under the English instead of the Spanish flag. You know, he did try to get English backing before he went to Spain, but King Henry turned him down. That could be changed." I pricked up my ears. The period from 1492 to the Revolution is my special field of American history, and I knew at once the enormous difference that would have made. It was a moment later that I realized how oddly the colonel had expressed the idea, and by that time the plump man was speaking. Yes, that would work, he agreed. Those kings made decisions most of the time on whether or not they had a hangover, or what some court favorite thought. He got out a notebook and pen and scribbled briefly. I'll hand that to the planning staff when I get to New York. That's Henry the Seventh, not Henry the Eighth. Right. We'll fix it so that Columbus will catch him when he's in a good humor. That was too much. I turned to the man beside me. What goes on, I asked. Has somebody invented a time machine? He looked up from the drink he was contemplating and gave me a grin. <laughs> Sounds like it, doesn't it? Why, no, our friend here is getting up a television program. Tell the gentleman about it, he urged the plump man across the aisle. The waiter arrived at that moment. The plump man, who seemed to need little urging, waited until I had ordered a drink, and then began telling me what a positively sensational idea it was. We're calling it Crossroads of Destiny, he said. It'll be a series, one half-hour show a week. In each episode, we'll take some historic event and show how history could have been changed if something had happened differently. We dramatized the event up to that point, just as it really happened. And then, a commentary voice comes on and announces that this is the crossroads of destiny. This is where history could have been completely changed. Then he gives a resume of what really did happen, and then he says, But suppose so-and-so had done this and that instead of such-and-such. Then we pick up the dramatization at that point, only we show it the way it might have happened, like this thing about Columbus. We'll show how it could have happened and end with Columbus wading ashore with his sword in one hand and a flag in the other, just like the painting, only it'll be the English flag, and Columbus will shout, I take possession of this new land in the name of his majesty, Henry the Seventh of England. He brandished his drink to the visible consternation of the elderly man beside him. And then the sailors all sing, God save the king, which wasn't written till about 1745, I couldn't help mentioning. Oh, huh? the plump man looked startled. Are you sure? Then he decided that I was and shrugged. Well, they can all shout, God save King Henry or St. George for England or something. Then, at the end, we introduce the program guest, some history expert, a real name, and he tells how he thinks history would have been changed if it had happened this way. The conservatively dressed gentleman beside him wanted to know how long he expected to keep the show running. The crossroads will give out before long, he added. The sponsor will give out first, I said. 
History is just one damn crossroads after another. I mentioned in passing that I taught the subject. Why, since the beginning of this century, we've had enough of them to keep the show running for a year. We have about 20 already written and ready to produce, the plump man said comfortably, and ideas for twice as many that the planning staff is working on now. The elderly man accepted that and took another cautious sip of wine. What I wonder, though, is whether you can really say that history can be changed. Well, of course. The television man was taken aback. One always seems to be when a basic assumption is questioned. Of course, we only know what really did happen. But it stands to reason if something had happened differently, the results would have been different, doesn't it? But it seems to me that everything would work out the same in the long run. There'd be some differences at the time, but over the years, wouldn't they all cancel out? Non, monsieur, the man with the book, who had been outside the conversation until now, told him earnestly, Make no mistake, history can be changed. I looked at him curiously. The accent sounded French, but it wasn't quite right. He was some kind of a foreigner, though. I'd swear that he never bought the clothes he was wearing in this country. The way the suit fitted, and the cut of it, and the shirt collar, and the necktie. The book he was reading was Langmuir's Social History of the American People. Not one of my favorites. A bit too much on the doctrinaire side, but what a bookshop clerk would give a foreigner looking for something to explain America. What do you think, Professor? The plump man was asking me. It would work out the other way. The differences wouldn't cancel out, they'd accumulate. Say something happened a century ago, to throw a presidential election the other way. You'd get different people at the head of the government, opposite lines of policy taken, and eventually we'd be getting into different wars with different enemies at different times, and different batches of young men killed before they could marry and have families, different people being born or not being born. That would mean different ideas, good or bad, being advanced, different books written, different inventions, and different social and economic problems as a consequence. Look, he's only giving himself a century, the colonel added. Think of all the changes if this thing we were discussing, Columbus sailing under the English flag, had happened. Or suppose Leif Erikson had been able to plant a permanent colony in America in the 11th century. Or if the Saracens had won the Battle of Tours. Try to imagine the world today if any of those things had happened. One thing you can be sure of, any errors you make in trying to imagine such a world will be on the side of over-conservatism. The sandy-haired man beside me, who had been using his highball for a crystal ball, must have glimpsed in it what he was looking for. He finished the drink, set the empty glass on the stand tray beside him, and reached back to push the button. I don't think you realize just how good an idea you have here, he told the plump man abruptly. If you did, you wouldn't ruin it with such timid and unimaginative treatment. I thought he'd been staying out of the conversation because it was over his head. Instead, he had been taking the plump man's ideas apart, examining all the pieces, and considering what was wrong with it and how it could be improved. The plump man looked startled and then angry. Timid and unimaginative were the last things he'd expected his idea to be called. Then he became uneasy. Maybe this fellow was a typical representative of his lord and master, the faceless abstraction called the public. What do you mean? he asked. Misplaced emphasis. You shouldn't emphasize the event that could have changed history. You should emphasize the changes that could have been made. You're going to end this show where you were talking about with a shot of Columbus wading up to the beach with an English flag, aren't you? Well, that's the logical ending. That's the logical beginning, the sandy-haired man contradicted. And after that, your guest historian comes on. How much time will he be allowed? Well, maybe three or four minutes. We can't cut the dramatization too short. 
and he'll have to explain a couple of times, and in words of one syllable, that what we have seen didn't really happen. Because if he doesn't, the next morning, half the 12-year-old kids in the country will be rushing wild-eyed into school to slip the teacher the real inside about the discovery of America. By the time he gets that done, he'll be able to mumble a couple of generalities about vast and incalculable effects, and then it'll be time to tell the public about widgets, the really safe cigarettes, all filter and absolutely free from tobacco. The waiter arrived at this point, and the sandy-haired man ordered another rye highball. I decided to have another bourbon on the rocks, and the TV impresario said gin and tonic absently, and then went into a reverie which lasted until the drinks arrived. Then he came awake again. I see what you mean, he said. Most of the audience would wonder what difference it would have made where Columbus would have gotten his ships, as long as he got them and America got discovered. I could see it would have made a hell of a big difference. But how could it be handled any other way? How could you figure out just what the difference would have been? Well, you need a man who'd know the historical background, and you'd need a man with a powerful creative imagination, who is used to using it inside rigorously defined limits. Don't try to get them both in one. A collaboration would really be better. Then you work from the known situation in Europe and in America in 1492 and decide on the immediate effects. And from that, you have to carry it along, step by step, down to the present. It would be a lot of hard and very exacting work, but the result would be worth it. He took a sip from his glass and added, Remember, you don't have to prove that the world today would be the way you set it up. All you have to do is make sure that nobody else would be able to prove that it wouldn't. Well, how could you present that? As a play, with fictional characters and a plot. Time, the present... Under the changed conditions, the plot, the reason the coward conquers his fear and becomes a hero, the obstacle to the boy marrying the girl, the reason the innocent man is being persecuted, will have to grow out of this imaginary world you've constructed and be impossible in our real world. As long as you stick to that, you're all right. Oh, sure, I get that. The plump man was excited again. He was about half sold on the idea. But how will we get the audience to accept it? We're asking them to start with an assumption they know isn't true. Maybe it is. In another time dimension, the colonel suggested, you can't prove it isn't. For that matter, you can't prove there aren't other time dimensions. Ha! That's it, the sandy-haired man exclaimed. World of alternate probability. That takes care of that. He drank about a third of his highball and sat gazing into the rest of it, in an almost yogic trance. The plump man looked at the colonel in bafflement. Maybe this alternate probability time dimension stuff means something to you, he said, but be damned if it does to me. Well, as far as we know, we live in a four-dimensional universe, the colonel started. The elderly man across from him groaned. Fourth dimension. Good God. Are we going to talk about that? It isn't anything to be scared of. You carry an instrument for measuring in the fourth dimension all the time. A watch. You mean, it's just time? But that isn't... We know of three dimensions of space, the colonel told him, gesturing to indicate them. We can use them for coordinates to locate things, but we also locate things in time. I wouldn't like to ride on a train or a plane if we didn't. Well, let's call the time we know, the time your watch registers, time A. Now, suppose the entire infinite extent of time A is only an instant in another dimension of time, which we'll call time B. The next instant of time B is also the entire extent of time A, and the next, and the next. As in time A, Different things are happening at different instants. In one of these instants of time B, one of the things that's happening is that King Henry the Seventh of England is furnishing ships to Christopher Columbus. The man with the odd clothes was getting excited again. This 
how you say, this alternate probability, it is a theory is generally accepting this country? Got it, the sandy-haired man said before anybody could answer. He set his drink on the stand tray and took a big jackknife out of his pocket, holding it unopened in his hand. How's this sound, he asked, and hit the edge of the tray with the back of the knife. Bong! Crossroads of destiny, he intoned, and hit the edge of the tray again. Bong! This is the year 1959. But not the 1959 of our world, for we are in a world of alternate probability, in another dimension of time, a world parallel to and coexistent with, but separate from our own, in which history has been completely altered by a single momentous event. He shifted back to his normal voice. Not bad, only 25 seconds, the plump man said, looking up from his wristwatch. And a trained announcer could maybe shave five seconds off that. Yes, something like that. And at the end, we'll have another 30 seconds. And we can do without the guest. But this alternate probability in another dimension, the stranger was insisting, it, is this a concept original with you? He asked the colonel. Oh, no. That idea has been around for a long time. I never heard of it before now the elderly man said, as though that completely demolished it. Then it is generally accept by the scientist? Um, no. The sandy-haired man relieved the colonel. There is absolutely no evidence to support it, and scientists don't accept unsupported assumptions unless they need them to explain something, and they don't need this assumption for anything. Well, it would come in handy to make some of those reports of freak phenomena like mysterious appearances and disappearances or flying object sightings or reported falls of non-meteoric matter theoretically respectable. Reports like that usually get the ignore and forget treatment now. Then you believe that these other world of the alternate probability, they exist? No, I don't believe it either. I've no reason to, one way or another. He studied his drink for a moment and lowered the level of the glass slightly. I've said that once in a while things get reported that look as though such other worlds in another time dimension may exist. There have been whole books published by people who collect stories like that. I must say that academic science isn't very hospitable to them. You mean... Zings sometimes, uh, how you say, leak in from one of these other worlds? That has been known to happen? Things have been said to have happened that might, if true, be cases of things leaking through from another time world, the sandy-haired man corrected, or leaking away to another time world. He mentioned a few of the more famous cases of unexplained mysteries, the English diplomat in Prussia, who vanished in plain sight of a number of people, the ship found completely deserted by her crew. The lifeboats, all in place, stories like that. And there's this rash of alleged sightings of unidentified flying objects. I'd sooner believe that they came from another dimension than from another planet. But as far as I know, nobody seriously advanced this other time dimension theory to explain them. I think the idea is familiar enough, though, that we can use it as an explanation or, or pseudo-explanation for the program, the television man said. Fact is, we aren't married to this Crossroads title yet. We could just as easily call it Fifth Dimension. That would lead the public to expect something out of the normal before the show started. That got the conversation back onto the show, and we talked for some time about it each of us suggesting possibilities. The stranger even suggested one, that the Civil War had started during the Jackson administration. Fortunately, nobody else noticed that. Finally, a porter came through and inquired if any of us were getting off at Harrisburg, saying that we would be getting in in five minutes. The stranger finished his drink hastily and got up, saying that he would have to get his luggage. 
He told us how much he had enjoyed the conversation and then followed the porter toward the rear of the train. After he had gone out, the TV man chuckled. Was that one an oddball, he exclaimed. Where the hell do you suppose he got that suit? It was a tailored suit, the colonel said, a very good one. And I can't think of any country in the world in which they cut suits just like that. And did you catch his accent? Phony, the television man pronounced. The French accent of a Greek waiter in a fake French restaurant in the Bronx. Not quite. The pronunciation was all right for French accent, but the cadence, the way the word sounds were strung together, was German. The elderly man looked at the colonel keenly. I see your intelligence, he mentioned. Think he might be somebody up your alley, colonel? The colonel shook his head. I doubt it. There are agents of unfriendly powers in this country, a lot of them, I'm sorry to have to say. But they don't speak accented English, and they don't dress eccentrically. You know there's an enemy agent in a crowd. Pick out the most normally American type in sight, and you usually won't have to look further. The train ground to a stop. A young couple with hand luggage came in and sat at one end of the car, waiting until other accommodations could be found for them. After a while, it started again. I dallied over my drink, then got up and excused myself, saying that I wanted to turn in early. In the next car behind, I met the porter, who had come in just before the stop. He looked worried, and after a moment's hesitation, he spoke to me. "'Pardon, sir. The man in the club car who got off at Harrisburg. Did you know him?' "'Never saw him before. Why?' "'He tipped me with a dollar bill when he got off. Later I looked closely at it. I do not like it.' He showed it to me, and I didn't blame him. It was marked one dollar in United States of America, but outside that there wasn't a thing right about it. One side was gray, all right, but the other side was green.' The picture wasn't the right one, and there were lots of other things about it, some of them absolutely ludicrous. It wasn't counterfeit. It wasn't even an imitation of a United States bill. And then it hit me, like a bullet in the chest. Not a bill of our United States. No wonder he had been so interested in whether our scientists accepted the theory of other time dimensions and other worlds of alternate probability. On an impulse, I got out two ones and gave them to the porter. Perfectly good United States Bank gold certificates. You better let me keep this, I said, trying to make it sound the way he'd think a federal agent would say it. He took the bill, smiling, and I folded his bill and put it into my vest pocket. Thank you, sir, he said. I have no wish to keep it. Some part of my mind below the level of consciousness must have taken over and guided me back to the right car and compartment. I didn't realize where I was going till I put on the light and recognized my own luggage. Then I sat down, as dizzy as though the two drinks I had 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 been a dozen. For a moment, I was tempted to rush back to the club car and show the thing to the colonel and the sandy-haired man. On second thought, I decided against that. The next thing I banished from my mind was the adjective incredible. I had to credit it. I had the proof in my vest pocket. The coincidence arising from our topic of conversation didn't bother me too much either. It was the topic which had drawn him into it. And, as the sandy-haired man had pointed out, we know nothing, one way or another, about these other worlds— we certainly don't know what barriers separate them from our own, or how often those barriers may fail. I might have thought more about that if I'd been in physical science. I wasn't. I was in American history. So what I thought about was what sort of country that other United States must be, and what its history must have been. The man's costume was basically the same as ours, same general style, but many little differences of fashion. I had the impression that it was the costume of a less formal and conservative society than ours, and a more casual way of life. It could be the sort of costume into which ours would evolve in another thirty or so years. There was another odd thing. 
I noticed him looking curiously at both the waiter and the porter, as though something about them surprised him. The only thing they had in common was their race, the same as every other passenger car attendant, but he wasn't used to seeing Chinese working in railway cars. And there had been that remark about the Civil War and the Jackson administration. I wondered what Jackson he had been talking about. Not Andrew Jackson, the Tennessee militia general who got us into war with Spain in 1810, I hoped. In the Civil War, that had baffled me completely. I wondered if it had been a class war or a sectional conflict. We'd have plenty of the latter during our first century, but all of them had been settled peacefully and constitutionally. Well, some of the things he'd read in Lingmuir's social history would be surprises for him, too. And then I took the bill out for another examination. It must have gotten mixed with his spendable money. It was about the size of ours, and I wondered how he had acquired enough of our money to pay his train fare. Maybe he'd had a diamond and sold it, or maybe he'd had a gun and held somebody up. If he had, I didn't know that I blamed him under the circumstances. I had an idea that he had some realization of what had happened to him, the book and the fake accent, to cover any mistakes he might make. Well, I wished him luck, and then I unfolded the dollar bill and looked at it again. In the first place, it had been issued by the United States Department of Treasury itself, not the United States Bank or one of the state banks. I'd have to think over the implications of that carefully. In the second place, it was a silver certificate. Why, in this other United States, silver must be an acceptable monetary metal, maybe equally so with gold, though I could hardly believe that. Then I looked at the picture on the gray obverse side and had to strain my eyes on the fine print under it to identify it. It was Washington, all right, but a much older Washington than any of the pictures of him I had ever seen. Then I realized that I knew just where the crossroads of destiny for his world and mine had been. As every school child among us knows, General George Washington was shot dead at the Battle of Germantown in 1777 by an English, or rather Scottish, officer, Patrick Ferguson, the same Patrick Ferguson who invented the breech-loading rifle that smashed Napoleon's armies. Washington, today, is one of our lesser national heroes, because he was our first military commander-in-chief. But in this other world, he must have survived to lead our armies to victory and become our first president, as was the case with the man who took his place when he was killed. I folded the bill and put it away carefully among my identification cards where it wouldn't a second time get mixed with the money I spent, and as I did, I wondered what sort of a president George Washington had made, and what part in the history of other United States had been played by the man whose picture appears on our dollar bills, General and President Benedict Arnold. End of Crossroads of Destiny by H. Beam Piper The Crystal Crypt by Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Bradford Nungunungataha, Pew Attention! Interflight ship, attention! You are ordered to land at the control station on Deimos for inspection. Attention! You are to land at once. The metallic rasp of the speakers echoed through the corridors of the great ship. The passengers glanced at each other uneasily, murmuring and peering out the port windows at the small speck below, the dot of rock that was the Martian checkpoint Deimos. What's up? An anxious passenger asked one of the pilots hurrying through the ship to check the escape lock. We have to land. Keep seated. The pilot went on. Land? But why? They all looked at each other. Hovering above the bulging inner flight ship were three slender Martian pursuit craft, poised and alert for any emergency. 
As the inner flight ship prepared to land, the pursuit ships dropped lower, carefully maintaining themselves a short distance away. "'There's something going on,' a woman passenger said nervously. "'Lord, I thought we were finally through with those Martians. Now what?' I don't blame them for giving us one last going over, a heavyset businessman said to his companion. After all, we're the last ship leaving Mars for Terra. They're, we're damn lucky they'll let us go at all. You think there really will be a war? A young man said to the girl sitting in the seat next to him. Those Martians don't dare fight, not with our weapons and ability to produce. We could take care of Mars in a month. It's all talk. The girl glanced at him. Don't be so sure. Mars is desperate. They'll fight tooth and nail. I've been on Mars three years. She shuddered. Thank goodness I'm getting away. If... Prepare to land, the pilot's voice came. The ship began to settle slowly, dropping down towards the tiny emergency field on the seldom-visited moon. Down. Down the ship dropped. There was a grinding sound, a sickening jolt. Then silence. We've landed, the heavy-set businessman said. They better not do anything to us. Terra will rip them apart if they violate one space article. Please keep your seats, the pilot's voice came. No one is to leave the ship, according to the Martian authorities. We are to remain here. A restless stir filled the ship. Some of the passengers began to read uneasily. Others stared out at the deserted field. Nervous and on edge, watching the three Martian pursuit ships land and disgorge groups of armed men. The Martian soldiers were crossing the field quickly, moving towards them, running double time. The inner flight spaceship was the last passenger vessel to leave Mars for Terra. All other ships had long since left, returning to safety before the outbreak of hostilities. The final group of Terrans to leave the grim red planet, businessmen, expatriates, tourists, and any and all Terrans who had not already gone home. "'What do you suppose they want?' the young man said to the girl. "'It's hard to figure Martians out, isn't it? First they give the ship clearance, let us take off, and now they radio us to set down again. Oh, by the way, my name's Thatcher, Bob Thatcher, since we're going to be here a while.' The port lock opened. Talking ceased abruptly as everyone turned. A black-clad Martian official... A province leader stood framed against the bleak sunlight, staring around the ship. Behind him, a handful of Martian soldiers stood waiting, their guns ready. "'This will not take long,' the leader said, stepping into the ship, the soldiers following him. "'You will be allowed to continue your trip shortly.' An audible sigh of relief went through the passengers. Look at him, the girl whispered to Thatcher. How I hate those black uniforms. He's just a provincial leader, Thatcher said. Don't worry. The leader stood for a moment, his hands on his hips, looking around at them without expression. I have ordered your ship grounded so that an inspection can be made of all persons aboard, he said. You Terrans are the last to leave our planet. Most of you are ordinary and harmless. I am not interested in you. I am interested in finding three saboteurs, three Terrans, two men and a woman who have committed an incredible act of destruction and violence. They are said to have fled to this ship. Murmurs of surprise and indignation broke out on all sides. The leader motioned the soldiers to follow him up the aisle. Two hours ago, a Martian city was destroyed. Nothing remains. Only a depression in the sand where the city was. The city and all its people have completely vanished, an entire city destroyed in a second. Mars will never rest until the saboteurs are captured, and we know they are aboard this 
ship. It's impossible, the heavyset businessman said. There aren't any saboteurs here. We'll begin with you, the leader said to him, stepping up beside the man's seat. One of the soldiers passed the leader a square metal box. This will soon tell us if you're speaking the truth. Stand up. Get on your feet. The man rose slowly, flushing. See here. Are you involved in the destruction of the city? Answer. The man swallowed angrily. I know nothing of any destruction of any city, and furthermore, he is telling the truth, the metal box said tonelessly. Next person, the leader moved down the aisle. A thin, bald-headed man stood up nervously. No, sir, he said, I don't know a thing about it. He is telling the truth, the box affirmed. Next person, stand up. One person after another stood, answered, and sat down again in relief. At last there were only a few people left who had not been questioned. The leader paused, studying them intently. Only five left. The three must be among you. We have narrowed it down. His hand moved to his belt. Something flashed, a rod of pale fire. He raised the rod, pointing it steadily at the five people. All right. The first one of you. What do you know about this destruction? Are you involved with the destruction of our city? No, not at all, the man murmured. Yes, he is telling the truth, the box intoned. Next. Nothing. I know nothing. I had nothing to do with it. True, the box said. The ship was silent. Three people remained, a middle-aged man and his wife and their son, a boy of about twelve. They stood in the corner, staring white-faced at the leader, at the rod in his dark fingers. It must be you, the leader grated, moving towards them. The Martian soldiers raised their guns. It must be you. You there, the boy. What do you know about the destruction of our city? Answer. The boy shook his head. Nothing, he whispered. The box was silent for a moment. He is telling the truth, it said reluctantly. Next. Nothing, the woman muttered. Nothing. The truth. Next. I had nothing to do with the blowing up of your city, the man said. You're wasting your time. It is the truth, the box said. For a long time the leader stood, toying with his rod. At last he pushed it back in his belt and signaled the soldiers towards the exit lock. You may proceed on your trip, he said. He walked after the soldiers. At the hatch, he stopped, looked back at the passengers, his face grim. You may go, but Mars will not allow her enemies to escape. The three saboteurs will be caught, I promise you. He rubbed his dark jaw thoughtfully. It is strange. I was certain they were on this ship. Again he looked coldly around at the Terrans. Perhaps I was wrong. All right. Proceed. But remember, the three will be caught. Even if it takes endless years, Mars will catch them and punish them. I swear it. For a long time no one spoke. The ship lumbered through space again, its jets firing evenly, calmly, 
moving the passengers towards their own planet, towards home. Behind them, Deimos and the red ball that was Mars dropped further and further away each moment, disappearing and fading into the distance. A sigh of relief passed through the passengers. "'What a lot of hot air that was!' one grumbled. "'Barbarians!' a woman said. A few of them stood up, moving out into the aisle, towards the lounge and the cocktail bar. Beside Thatcher, the girl got to her feet, pulled her jacket around her shoulders. "'Pardon me,' she said, stepping past him. "'Going to the bar,' Thatcher said. "'Mind if I come along?' "'I suppose not.' They followed the others into the lounge, walking together up the aisle. "'You know,' Thatcher said, "'I don't even know your name yet.' "'My name is Mara Gordon.' "'Mara! That's a nice name. What part of terror are you from? North America? New York?' "'I've been in New York,' Mara said. "'New York is very lovely.' She was slender and pretty, with a cloud of dark hair tumbling down her neck against her leather jacket. They entered the lounge and stood undecided. "'Let's sit at a table,' Mara said, looking around at the people at the bar, mostly men. "'Perhaps that table over there.' "'But somebody's already there,' Thatcher said. The heavy-set businessman had sat down at the table and deposited his sample case on the floor. "'Do we want to sit with him?' "'Oh, it's all right,' Mara said, crossing to the table. "'May we sit here?' she said to the man." The man looked up, half-rising. "'It's a pleasure,' he murmured. He studied Thatcher intently. "'However, a friend of mine will be joining me in a moment.' "'I'm sure there's enough room for us all,' Mara said. She seated herself, and Thatcher helped her with her chair. He sat down, too, glancing up suddenly at Mara and the businessman. They were looking at each other almost as if something had passed between them. The man was middle-aged, with a florid face and tired, gray eyes. His hands were mottled, with the veins showing thickly. At the moment, he was tapping nervously. "'My name's Thatcher,' Thatcher said to him, holding out his hand. "'Bob Thatcher. Since we're going to be together for a while, we might as well get to know each other.' The man studied him. Slowly, his hand came out. "'Why not? My name's Erickson. Ralph Erickson.' "'Erickson?' Thatcher smiled. "'You look like a commercial man to me.' He nodded towards the sample case on the floor. Am I right? The man named Erickson started to answer, but at that moment there was a stir. A thin man, about thirty, had come up to the table, his eyes bright, staring down at them warmly. Well, we're on our way, he said to Erickson. Hello, Mara. He pulled out a chair and sat down quickly, folding his hands on the table before him. He noticed Thatcher and drew back a little. Pardon me, he murmured. Bob Thatcher's my name. Thatcher said. I hope I'm not intruding here. He glanced around at the three of them. Mara, alert, watching him intently. Heavy set Erickson, his face blank, and this person. Say, do you three know each other? He asked suddenly. There was silence. The robot attendant slid over soundlessly, poised to take their orders. Erickson roused himself. Uh, let's see, he murmured. What will we have? Mara? Whiskey and water? You, Jan. The bright, slim man smiled. The same. Thatcher. Gin and tonic. A whiskey and water for me also, Erickson said. The robot attendant went off. He returned at once with the drinks, setting them on the table. Each took his own. Well, Erickson said, holding up his glass, to our mutual success. All drank, Thatcher and the three of them. Heavy said Erickson. Mara, her eyes nervous and alert, Jan, who had just come along. Again, a look passed between Mara and Erickson, a look so swift that he would not have caught it had he not been looking directly at her. "'What line do you represent, Mr. Erickson?' Thatcher asked. Erickson glanced at him, then down at the sample case on the floor. He grunted, "'Well, uh, as you see, I'm a salesman.' Thatcher smiled. I knew it. You get so you can always spot a salesman right off by his sample case. A salesman always has to carry something to show. What are you in, sir? Erickson paused. He licked his thick lips, his eyes blank and lidded like a toad's. At last, he rubbed his mouth with his hand and reached down, lifting up the sample case. 
he set it on the table in front of him. Well, he said, perhaps we might even show Mr. Thatcher. They all stared down at the sample case. It seemed to be an ordinary leather case with a metal handle and a snap lock. I'm getting curious, Thatcher said. What's in there? You're all so tense. Diamonds? Stolen jewels? Jan laughed harshly, mirthlessly. Eric, put it down. We're not far enough away yet. Nonsense, Eric rumbled. We're away, Jan. Please, Mara whispered. Wait, Eric. Wait? Why? What for? You're so accustomed to... Eric, Mara said. She nodded towards Thatcher. We don't know him, Eric. Please. He's Terran, isn't he? Erickson said. All Terrans are together in these times. He fumbled suddenly at the cat's lock on the case. Yes, Mr. Thatcher, I'm a salesman. We're all salesmen, the three of us. Then you do know each other. Yes, Erickson nodded. His two companions sat rigidly, staring down. Yes, we do. Here, I'll show you our line. He opened the case. From it he took a letter knife, a pencil sharpener, a glass globe paperweight, a box of thumbtacks, a stapler, some clips, a plastic ashtray, and some things Thatcher could not identify. He placed the objects in a row in front of him on the tabletop. Then he closed the sample case. "'I gather you're in office supplies,' Thatcher said. He touched the letter knife with his finger. "'Nice quality steel. Looks like Swedish steel to me.' Erickson nodded, looking into Thatcher's face. "'Not really an impressive business, is it? Office supplies, ashtrays, paper clips. He smiled. Oh, Thatcher shrugged. Why not? They're a necessity in modern business. The only thing I wonder... What's that? Well, I wonder how you'd ever find enough customers on Mars to make it worth your while. He paused, examining the glass paperweight. He lifted it up, holding it to the light, staring at the scene within until Erickson took it out of his hand and put it back in the sample case. And another thing... If you three know each other, why did you sit apart when you got on? They looked at him quickly. And why didn't you speak to each other until we left Demos? He leaned towards Erickson, smiling at him. Two men and a woman. Three of you, sitting apart in a ship, not speaking, not until the check station was passed. I find myself thinking over what that Martian said. Three saboteurs. A woman and two men. Erickson put the things back in the sample case. He was smiling, but his face had gone chalk white. Mara stared down, playing with a drop of water on the edge of her glass. Jan clenched his hands together nervously, blinking rapidly. You three are the ones the leader was after, Thatcher said softly. You are the destroyers, the saboteurs. But they're lie detector... Why didn't it trap you? How did you get by that? And now you're safe, outside the check station. He grinned, staring around at them. I'll be damned, and I really thought you were a salesman, Erickson. You really fooled me. Erickson relaxed a little. Well, Mr. Thatcher, it's in a good cause. I'm sure you have no love for Mars, either. No Terran does, and I see you're leaving with the rest of us. True, Thatcher said. You must certainly have an interesting account to give the three of you. He looked around the table. We still have an hour or so of travel. Sometimes it gets dull, this Mars Terra run. Nothing to see, nothing to do but sit and drink in the lounge. He raised his eyes slowly. Any chance you'd like to spin a story to keep us awake? Jan and Mara looked at Erickson. Go on, Jan said. He knows who we are. Tell him the rest of the story. You might as well, Mara said. Jan let out a sigh suddenly, a sigh of relief. Let's put the cards on the table, get this weight off us. I'm tired of sneaking around, slipping. Sure, Erickson said expansively. Why not? He settled back in his chair, unbuttoning his vest. Certainly, Mr. Thatcher. I'll be glad to spin you a story, and I'm sure it will be interesting enough to keep you awake. They ran through the groves of dead trees, leaping across the sun-baked Martian soil, running silently together. 
they went up a little rise, across a narrow ridge. Suddenly Eric stopped, throwing himself down flat on the ground. The others did the same, pressing themselves against the soil, gasping for breath. "'Be silent!' Eric muttered. He raised himself a little. "'No noise! There'll be leeches nearby from now on. We don't dare take any chances!' Between the three people lying in the grove of dead trees and the city was a barren, level waste of desert over a mile of blasted sand. No trees or bushes marred the smooth, parched surface. Only an occasional wind, a dry wind eddying and twisting, blew the sand up into little rills. A faint odor came to them, a bitter smell of heat and sand carried by the wind. Eric pointed. Look! The city! There it is! They stared still breathing deeply from their race through the trees. The city was close, closer than they had ever seen it before. Never had they gotten so close to it in times past. Terrans were never allowed near the great Martian cities, the centers of Martian life. Even in ordinary times, when there was no threat of approaching war, the Martians shrewdly kept all Terrans away from their citadels, partly from fear, partly from a deep, innate sense of hostility towards the white-skinned visitors whose commercial ventures had earned them the respect and the dislike of the whole system. "'How does it look to you?' Eric said. The city was huge, much larger than they had imagined from the drawings and models they had studied so carefully back in New York, in the War Ministry office. Huge it was, huge and stark, black towers rising up against the sky, incredibly thin columns of ancient metal, columns that had stood wind and sun for centuries. Immense bricks that had been lugged there and fitted into place by slaves of the early Martian dynasties, under the whiplash of the first great kings of Mars. An ancient, sun-baked city, a city in the middle of a wasted plain, beyond groves of dead trees, a city seldom seen by Terrans, but a city studied on maps and charts in every war office on Terra. A city that contained, for all its ancient stone and archaic towers, the ruling group of all Mars, the council of senior leaders, black-clad men who governed and ruled with an iron fist. The senior leaders, twelve fanatic and devoted men, black priests, but priests with flashing rods of fire, lie detectors, rocket ships, intraspace cannon, many more things the Terran Senate could only conjecture about, the senior leaders and their subordinate province leaders. Eric and the two behind him suppressed a shudder. "'We've got to be careful,' Eric said. "'We'll be passing among them soon, if they guess who we are or what we're here for.' He snapped open the case he carried, glancing inside for a second. Then he closed it again, grasping the handle firmly. "'Let's go,' he said. He stood up slowly. "'You two, come up beside me. I want to make sure you look the way you should.' Mara and Jan stepped quickly ahead. Eric studied them critically as the three of them walked slowly down the slope, onto the plain, towards the towering black spires of the city. Jan, Eric said, take hold of her hand. Remember, you're going to marry her. She's your bride. And Martian peasants think a lot of their brides. Jan was dressed in the short trousers and coat of the Martian farmer. A knotted rope tied around his waist, a hat on his head to keep off the sun. His skin was dark, colored by dye until it was almost bronze. You look fine, Eric said to him. He glanced at Mara. Her black hair was tied in a knot, looped through a hollowed-out yuke bone. Her face was dark, too, dark and lined with colored ceremonial pigment, green and orange stripes across her cheeks. Earrings were strung through her ears. On her feet were tiny slippers of peru hide, laced around her ankles. And she wore long, translucent Martian trousers with a bright sash tied around her waist. Between her small breasts a chain of stone beads rested, good luck charms for the coming marriage. All right, Eric said. He himself wore the flowing gray robe of a Martian priest, dirty robes that were supposed to remain on him all his life, to be buried around him when he died. I think we'll get past the guards. There should be heavy morning traffic on the road. They walked on, the hard sand crunching under their feet. Against the horizon they could see specks moving, other persons going towards the city, farmers and peasants and merchants bringing their crops and goods to market. "'See the cart?' Mara exclaimed. They were nearing a narrow road, two ruts worn into the sand. A Martian hoofa 
was pulling the cart, its great sides wet with perspiration, its tongue hanging out. The cart was piled high with bales of cloth, rough country cloth, hand-dipped. A bent farmer urged the hoofa on. And there, she pointed, smiling. A group of merchants riding small animals were moving along beside the cart, Martians in long robes, their faces hidden by sand masks. On each animal was a pack, carefully tied on with rope, and beyond the merchants, plodding dully along, were peasants and farmers in an endless procession, some riding carts or animals, but mostly on foot. Mara and Jan and Eric joined the line of people, melting in behind the merchants. No one noticed them. No one looked up or gave any sign. The march continued as before. Neither Jan nor Mara said anything to each other. They walked a little behind Eric, who paced with a certain dignity, a certain bearing becoming his position. Once he slowed down, pointing up at the sky. Look, he murmured, in the Martian hill dialect. See that? Two black dots circled lazily. Martian patrol craft, the military on the outlook for any sign of unusual activity. War was almost ready to break out with Terra, any day, almost any moment. "'We'll be just in time,' Eric said. "'Tomorrow will be too late. The last ship will have left Mars.' "'I hope nothing stops us,' Mara said. "'I want to get back home when we're through.' Half an hour passed. They neared the city, the wall growing as they walked, rising higher and higher until it seemed to blot out the sky itself. A vast wall— a wall of eternal stone that had felt wind and sun for centuries. A group of Martian soldiers were standing at the entrance, the single passage gate hewn into the rock, leading into the city. As each person went through, the soldiers examined him, poking his garments, looking into his load. Eric tensed. The line had slowed almost to a halt. "'It'll be our turn soon,' he murmured. "'Be prepared.' "'Let's hope no leaders come around,' Jan said." The soldiers aren't so bad. Mara was staring up at the wall and the towers beyond. Under their feet the ground trembled, vibrating and shaking. She could see tongues of flame rising above the towers, from the deep underground factories and the forges of the city. The air was thick and dense with particles of soot. Mara rubbed her mouth, coughing. Here they come, Eric said softly. The merchants had been examined and allowed to pass through the dark gate, the entrance through the wall into the city. They and their silent animals had already disappeared inside. The leader of the group of soldiers was beckoning impatiently to Eric, waving him on. "'Come along,' he said. "'Hurry up there, old man!' Eric advanced slowly, his arms wrapped around his body, looking down at the ground. "'Who are you, and what's your business here?' the soldier demanded, his hands on his hips, his gun hanging idly at his waist. Most of the soldiers were lounging lazily, leaning against the wall, some even squatting in the shade. Flies crawled on the face of one who had fallen asleep, his gun on the ground beside him. "'My business,' Eric murmured. "'I'm a village priest.' "'Why do you want to enter the city?' "'I must bring these two people before the magistrate to marry them.' He indicated Mara and Jan, standing a little behind him. "'That is the law the leaders have made.' The soldier laughed. He circled around Eric. What do you have in that bag you carry? Laundry. We stay the night. What village are you from? Kronos. Kronos? The soldier looked to his companion. Ever heard of Kronos? A backwater pigsty. I saw it once on a hunting trip. The leader of the soldiers nodded to Jan and Mara. The two of them advanced, their hands clasped, standing close together. One of the soldiers put his hand on Mara's bare shoulder, turning her around. "'Nice little wife you're getting,' he said. "'Good and firm-looking,' he winked, grinning lewdly. Jan glanced at him in sullen resentment. The soldiers guffawed. "'All right,' the leader said to Eric. "'You people can pass.' Eric took a small purse from his robe and gave the soldier a coin. The three of them went into the dark tunnel that was the entrance— passing through the wall of stone into the city beyond. They were within the city. Now, Eric whispered, hurry. Around them the city roared and cracked, the sound of a thousand vents and machines shaking the stones under their feet. Eric led Mara and Jan into a corner by a row of brick warehouses. 
People were everywhere, hurrying back and forth, shouting above the din, merchants, peddlers, soldiers, street women. Eric bent down and opened the case he carried. From the case he quickly took three small coils of fine metal. Intricate meshed wires and veins worked together into a small cone. Jan took one and Mara took one. Eric put the remaining cone into his robe and snapped the case shut again. Now remember, the coils must be buried in such a way that the line runs through the center of the city. We must trisect the main section where the largest concentration of buildings is. Remember the maps. Watch the alleys and streets carefully. Talk to no one if you can help it. Each of you has enough Martian money to buy your way out of trouble. Watch especially for cut purses, and for heaven's sake, don't get lost. Eric broke off. Two black-clad leaders were coming along the inside of the wall, strolling together with their hands behind their backs. They noticed the three who stood in the corner by the warehouses and stopped. Go, Eric muttered, and be back here at sundown, he smiled grimly, or never come back. Each went off a different way, walking quickly without looking back. The leaders watched them go. The little bride was quite lovely, one leader said. Those hill people have the stamp of nobility in their blood from the old times. A very lucky peasant to possess her, the other said. They went on. Eric looked after them, smiling a little. Then he joined the surging mass of people that milled eternally through the streets of the city. At dusk they met outside the gate. The sun was soon to set, and the air had turned thin and frigid. It cut through their clothing like knives. Mara huddled against Jan, trembling and rubbing her bare arms. Well, Eric said, did you both succeed? Around them, peasants and merchants were pouring from the entrance, leaving the city to return to their farms and villages, starting the long trip back across the plain towards the hills beyond. None of them noticed the shivering girl and the young man and the old priest standing by the wall. Mine's in place, Jan said, on the other side of the city, on the extreme edge, buried by a well. Mine's in an industrial section, Mara whispered, her teeth chattering. Jan, give me something to put over me. I'm freezing. Good, Eric said. Then the three coils should trisect dead center, if the models were correct. He looked up at the darkening sky. Already, stars were beginning to show. Two dots the evening patrol, moving slowly towards the horizon. Let's hurry. It, it won't be long. They joined the line of Martians, moving along the road, away from the city. Behind them, the city was losing itself into the somber tones of night, its black spires disappearing into the darkness. They walked silently with the country people until a flat ridge of dead trees became visible on the horizon. Then they left the road and turned off, walking towards the trees. Almost time, Eric said. He increased his pace, looking back at Jan and Mara impatiently. Come on! They hurried, making their way through the twilight, stumbling over rocks and dead branches, up the side of the ridge. At the top, Eric halted, standing with his hands on his hips, looking back. See? he murmured. The city. The last time we'll see it this way. Can I sit down? Mara said. My feet hurt me. Jan pulled at Eric's sleeve. Hurry, Eric. Not much time left, he laughed nervously. If everything goes all right, we'll be able to look at it forever. But not like this, Eric murmured. He squatted down, snapping his case open. He took some tubes and wiring out and assembled them together on the ground at the peak of the ridge. A small pyramid of wire and plastic grew, shaped by his expert hands. At last he grunted, standing up. All right. Is it pointed directly at the city? Mara asked anxiously, looking down at the pyramid. Eric nodded. Yes, it's placed according. He stopped, suddenly stiffening. Get back. It's time. Hurry. Jan ran down the far side of the slope, away from the city, pulling Mara with him. Eric came quickly after, still looking back at the distant spires, almost lost in the night sky. Down! Jan sprawled out. Mara beside him, her trembling body pressed against his. Eric settled down in the sand and dead branches, still trying to see. 
I want to see it, he murmured. A miracle. I want to see. A flash, a blinding burst of violet light lit up the sky. Eric clapped his hands over his eyes. The flash whitened, growing larger, expanding. Suddenly there was a roar and a furious hot wind pushed past him, throwing him on his face in the sand. The hot dry wind licked and seared at them, crackling the bits of branches into flame. Mara and Jan shut their eyes, pressed tightly together. God, Eric muttered. The storm passed. They opened their eyes slowly. The sky was still alive with fire, a drifting cloud of sparks that was beginning to dissipate with the night wind. Eric stood up unsteadily, helping Jan and Mara to their feet. The three of them stood, staring silently across the dark waste, the black plain, none of them speaking. The city was gone. At last, Eric turned away. That part's done, he said. Now the rest. Give me a hand, Jan. There'll be a thousand patrol ships around here in a minute. I see one already, Mara said, pointing up. A spot winked in the sky, a rapidly moving spot. They're coming, Eric. There was a throb of chill fear in her voice. I know. Eric and Jan squatted on the ground around the pyramid of tubes and plastic, pulling the pyramid apart. The pyramid was fused, fused together like molten glass. Eric tore the pieces away with trembling fingers. From the remains of the pyramid he pulled something forth, something he held up high, trying to make it out in the darkness. Jan and Mara came close to see, both staring up intently, almost without breathing. "'There it is,' Eric said. "'There!' In his hand was a globe, a small, transparent globe of glass. Within the glass something moved, something minute and fragile, spires almost too small to be seen, microscopic, a complex web swimming within the hollow glass globe, a web of spires, a city. Eric put the globe into the case and snapped it shut. Let's go, he said. They began to lope back through the trees, back the way they had come before. We'll change in the car, he said as they ran. I think we should keep these clothes on until we're actually inside the car. We still might encounter someone. I'll be glad to get my own clothing on again, Jan said. I feel funny in these little pants. How do you think I feel? Mara gasped. I'm freezing in this, what there is of it. All the young Martian brides dress that way, Eric said. He clutched the case tightly as they ran. I think it looks fine. Thank you, Mara said, but it is cold. What do you suppose they'll think? Jan asked. They'll assume the city was destroyed, won't they? That's certain. Yes, Eric said. They'll be sure it was blown up. We can count on that. And it will be damn important to us that they think so. The car should be around here someplace, Mara said, slowing down. No, farther on, Eric said. Past that little hill over there, in the ravine by the trees. It's so hard to see where we are. Shall I light something? Jan said. No, there are maybe patrols around who... He halted abruptly. Jan and Mara stopped beside him. What? Mara began. A light glimmered. Something stirred in the darkness. There was a sound. Quick! Eric rasped. He dropped, throwing the case far away from him into the bushes. He straightened up tensely. A figure loomed up, moving through the darkness, and behind it came more figures, men, soldiers in uniform. The light flashed up brightly, blinding them. Eric closed his eyes. The light left him, touching Mara and Jan, standing silently together, clasping hands. Then it flicked down to the ground and around in a circle. A leader stepped forward, a tall figure in black, with his soldiers close behind him, their guns ready. You three, the leader said. Who are you? Don't move. Stand where you are. He came up to Eric, peering at him intently, his hard Martian face without expression. He went all around Eric, examining his robes, his sleeves. Please, Eric began in a quavering voice, but the leader cut him off. I'll do the talking. 
Who are you three? What are you doing here? Speak up. We are going back to our village, Eric muttered, staring down, his hands folded. We were in the city, and we're going home. One of the soldiers spoke into a mouthpiece. He clicked it off and put it away. Come with me, the leader said. We're taking you in. Hurry along. In? Back to the city? One of the soldiers laughed. The city is gone, he said. All that's left of it you can put in the palm of your hand. But what happened? Mara said. No one knows. Come on, hurry it up. There was a sound. A soldier came quickly out of the darkness. A senior leader, he said, coming this way. He disappeared again. A senior leader. The soldier stood waiting, standing at a respectful attention. A moment later, the senior leader stepped into the light. A black-clad old man, his ancient face thin and hard, like a bird's, eyes bright and alert. He looked from Eric to Jan. Who are these people? Villagers going back home. No, they're not. They don't stand like villagers. Villagers slump. Diet, poor food. These people are not villagers. I came from the hills, and I know. He stepped close to Eric, looking keenly into his face. Who are you? Look at his chin. He never shaved with a sharpened stone. Something is wrong here. In his hand, a rod of pale fire flashed. The city is gone, and with it at least half the leader council. It is very strange. A flash, then heat, and a wind. But it was not fission. I am puzzled. All at once, the city has vanished. Nothing is left but a depression in the sand. We'll take them in, the other leader said. Soldiers, surround them. Make certain that... Run! Eric cried. He struck out, knocking the rod from the senior leader's hand. They were running, soldiers shouting, flashing their lights, stumbling against each other in the darkness. Eric dropped to his knees, groping frantically in the bushes. His fingers closed over the handle of the case, and he leaped up. In Terran, he shouted to Mara and Jan, Hurry! To the car! Run! He set off down the slope, stumbling through the darkness. He could hear soldiers behind him, soldiers running and falling. A body collided against him and struck out. Some place behind him there was a hiss, and a section of the slope went up in flames. The leader's rod! Eric! Mara cried from the darkness. He ran towards her. Suddenly he slipped, falling on a stone. Confusion and firing, the sound of excited voices. Eric, is that you? Jan caught hold of him, helping him up. The car! Uh, it, it, it's over here! Where's Mara? I'm here! Mara's voice came. Over here! By the car! A light flashed. A tree went up in a puff of fire, and Eric felt the singe of the heat against his face. He and Jan made their way towards the girl. Mara's hand caught his in the darkness. Now the car, Eric said, if they haven't got to it. He slid down the slope into the ravine, fumbling in the darkness, reaching and holding onto the handle of the case, reaching, reaching. He touched something cold and smooth, metal, a metal door handle. Relief flooded through him. I've found it. Jan, get inside. Mara, come on. He pushed Jan past him into the car. Mara slipped in after Jan, her small, agile body crowding in beside him. "'Stop!' a voice shouted from above. "'There's no use hiding in that ravine! We'll get you! Come up and—' The sound of the voices was drowned out by the roar of the car's motor. A moment later, they shot into the darkness, the car rising into the air. Treetops broke and cracked under them as Eric turned the car from side to side. The last furious thrusts from the two leaders and their soldiers. Then they were away, above the trees, high in the air, gaining speed each moment, leaving the knot of Martians far behind. Towards Marsport, Jan said to Eric. Right? Eric nodded. Yes, we'll land outside the field in the hills. 
We can change back into our regular clothes there, our, our commercial clothing. Damn it, we'll be lucky if we can get there in time for the ship. The last ship, Mara whispered, her chest rising and falling. What if we don't get there in time? Eric looked down at the leather case in his lap. We'll have to get there, he murmured. We must. For a long time there was silence. Thatcher stared at Erickson. The older man was leaning back in his chair, sipping a little of his drink. Mara and Jan were silent. So you didn't destroy the city, Thatcher said. You didn't destroy it at all. You shrank it down and put it in a glass globe in a paperweight. And now you're a salesman again, with a sample case of office supplies. Erickson smiled. He opened the briefcase, and reaching into it, he brought out the glass globe paperweight. He held it up, looking into it. Yes, we stole the city from the Martians. That's how we got by the lie detector. It was true that we knew nothing about a destroyed city. But why, Thatcher said, why steal a city? Why not merely bomb it? Ransom, Mara said fervently, gazing into the globe, her dark eyes bright. Their biggest city, half of their council, in Eric's hand. Mars will have to do what Terra asks, Erickson said. Now Terra will be able to make her commercial demands felt. Maybe there won't even be a war. Perhaps Terra will get her way without fighting. Still smiling, he put the glass globe back into the briefcase and locked it. Quite a story, Thatcher said. What an amazing process. Reduction of size. A whole city reduced to microscopic dimensions. Amazing. No wonder you were able to escape. With such daring as that, no one could hope to stop you. He looked down at the briefcase on the floor. Underneath them, the jets murmured and vibrated evenly, and the ship moved through space towards distant Terra. We still have quite a way to go, Jan said. You've heard our story, Thatcher. Why not tell us yours? What sort of line are you in? What's your business? Yes, Mara said. What do you do? What do I do? Thatcher said. Well, if you like, I'll show you. He reached into his coat and brought out something. Something that flashed and glinted. Something slender. A rod of pale fire. The three stared at it. Sickened shock settled over them. Thatcher held the rod loosely, calmly, pointing it at Erickson. We knew you three were on this ship, he said. There was no doubt of that. But we didn't know what had become of the city. My theory was the city had not been destroyed at all, that something else had happened to it. Council instruments measured a sudden loss of mass in the area, a decrease equal to the mass of the city. Somehow the city had been spirited away, not destroyed. But I could not convince the other council leaders of it. I had to follow you alone. Thatcher turned a little, nodding to the men sitting at the bar. The men rose at once, coming towards the table. A very interesting process you have. Mars will benefit a great deal from it. Perhaps it will even turn the tide in our favor. When we return to Marsport, I wish to begin work on it at once. And now, if you will please pass me the briefcase. End of The Crystal Crypt by Philip K. Dick Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew Do Unto Others by Mark Clifton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Silk Do Unto Others by Mark Clifton My Aunt Maddie, Matthew H. Toombs, is president of the Daughters of Terra. I am her nephew, the one who didn't turn out well christened Hapland Graves, after Earth President Hapland, a cousin by marriage. The fellows at school naturally called me Happy Graves. Haphazard Graves it should be, Aunt Mattie commented acidly the first time she heard it. It was her not very subtle way of reminding me of the way I lived my life, and did things or didn't do them. She shuddered at anything disorderly, which of course included me. 
and it was her beholden duty to right anything which to her appeared wrong there won't be any evil to march on after you get through aunt mattie i once said when i was a child i like now to think that even at the age of six i must have mastered the straight face but i'm afraid i was so awed by her that i was sincere that will do hapland she said sternly but i think she knew i meant it then and i think that was the day i became her favorite nephew for some reason never quite clear to me she was my favorite aunt i think she liked me most because i was the cross she had to bear i liked her most i'm sure because it was such a comfortable ride a few billions spent around the house can make things quite comfortable she had need of her billions to carry out her hobbies or as she called it her life's work aunt mattie always spoke in clichés because people could understand what you meant one of those hobbies was our collection of flora of the universe it was begun by her maternal grandfather one of the wealthier plots and increased as the family fortunes were increased by her father one of the more ruthless tombs but it was under aunt mattie's supervision that it came so to speak into full flower love she would say means more to a flower than all the scientific knowledge in the world apparently she had felt that the small army of gardeners each a graduate specialist in duplicating the right planetary conditions hardly mattered the collection covered some two hundred acres in our grounds at the west side of the house small perhaps as some of the more vulgar displays by others go but very very choice the other hobby which she combines with the first is equally expensive she and her club members the daughters of terra dt's for short often find it necessary to take junkets on the family space yacht out to some distant planet to straighten out reprehensible conditions which have come to her attention i usually went along to take care of symbolically at least the bags and their baggage my psychiatrist would say that expressing it in this way shows i have never outgrown my juvenile attitudes he says i am simply a case of arrested development mental caused through too much overshadowing by the rest of the family he says that like the rest of them i have inherited the family compulsion to make the universe over to my own liking so i can pass it on to prosperity with a clear conscience and my negative attitude towards this is simply a defense mechanism because i haven't had a chance to do it he says i really hate my aunt's flora collection because i see it as a rival for her affection i tell him that if i have any resentments toward it at all it is for the long hours spent in getting the latinized names of things drilled into me i ask him why gardeners always insist on forcing long meaningless names upon non-gardeners who simply don't care he ignores that and says that subconsciously i hate my aunt mattie because i secretly recognize that she is a challenge too great for me to overcome i ask him why if i subconsciously hate aunt mattie why i would care about how much affection she gives her flora collection he says aha we are making progress he says he can't cure me of what i'm never clear until i find the means to cut down and destroy my aunt mattie this is all patent nonsense because aunt mattie is the rock the firm foundation in a universe of shifting values even her clichés are precious to me because they are unchanging on her i can depend he tells aunt mattie his diagnoses and conclusions too unethical well now between a mere psychiatrist and my aunt mattie is there any doubt about who shall say what is ethical after one of their long conferences about me she calls me into her study looks at me wordlessly sadly shakes her head sighs then squares her shoulders until the shelf of her broad although maiden bosom becomes huge enough to carry any burden even the burden of my alleged hate this she bears bravely even gratefully i might resent this needless pain the psychiatrist gives her except that it really seems to make her happy in some obscure way perhaps she has some kind of guilt complex and i am her deserved punishment aunt mattie with a guilt complex never aunt mattie knows she is right and goes ahead so all his nonsense is completely ridiculous i love my aunt mattie i adore my aunt mattie i would never do anything to hurt my aunt mattie or well i didn't mean to hurt her anyway all i did was wink i only meant we were met at the spaceport of capella four by the planet administrator himself one john j mccabe it was no particular coincidence that i knew him my school was progressive 
It admitted not only the scions of the established families, but those of the ambitious families as well. Its graduates, naturally, went into the significant careers. Johnny McCabe was one of the ambitious ones. We hadn't been anything like bosom pals at school, but he'd been tolerant of me, and I'd admired him, and fitfully told myself that I should be more like him. Perhaps this was the reason Aunt Mattie had insisted on this particular school, the hope that some of the ambition would rub off on me. Capella 4 wasn't much of a post, not even for the early stages in a young man's career, although, socially, it was perhaps the best beginning Johnny's family could have expected. It was a small planet, entirely covered by salt. Even inside the port bubble with its duplication of Earth atmosphere, the salt lay like a permanent snow scene. Actually, it was little more than a way station along the space route out in that direction, and Johnny's problems were little more than the problems of a professional host at some obscure resort. But no doubt his dad spoke pridefully of my son, the planet administrator. And when I called on the family to tell them I'd visited their son, I wouldn't be one to snitch. There was doubt in my mind that even Johnny's ambitions could make the planet into anything more than it was already. It had nothing we wanted, or at least was worth the space freight it would cost to ship it. The natives had never given us any trouble, and up until now, we hadn't given them any. So Earth's brand upon it was simply a small bubble enclosing a landing field, a hangar for checkup and repair of ships requiring an emergency landing, some barracks for the men and women of the port personnel, a small hotel to house stranded space passengers while repairs were made to their ship, or stray VIPs, a small administration building flying Federated Earth flag, and a warehouse to contain supplies, which had to be shipped in, completed the installation. The planet furnished man nothing but water pumped from deep in the rock strata beneath the salt, and even that had to be treated to remove enough of the saline content to make it usable. At the time, I didn't know what the natives outside our bubble lived on. The decision to come had been a sudden one, and I hadn't had more than enough time to call the State Department to find out who the planet administrator might be. I was first out of the yacht and down the landing steps to the salt-covered ground. Aunt Mattie was still busy giving her ship captain his instructions, and possibly inspecting the crew's teeth to see if they'd brushed them this morning. The two members of her special committee of the DTs who'd come along, a Miss Point and a Mrs. Waddle, naturally would be standing at her sides, and half a pace to the rear, to be of assistance should she need them in dealing with males. There was a certain stiff formality in the way McCabe, flanked by his own two selected subordinates, approached the ship until I turned around at the foot of the steps and he recognized me. Hap, he yelled then. Happy Graves, you old son of a gun! He broke into a run, dignity forgotten, and when he got to me, he grabbed both my shoulders and his powerful hands to shake me as if he were some sort of terrier and I a rat. His joy seemed all out of proportion until I remembered he probably hadn't seen anybody from school for a long time, and until I further remembered that he would have been alerted by the State Department to Aunt Mattie's visit and would have been looking forward to it with dread and misgivings. To realize he had a friend at court must really have overjoyed him. Johnny, I said, a long time. It had been. Five, six years, anyway. I held out my hand in the old school gesture. He let loose my shoulders and grabbed it in the traditional manner. We went through the ritual, which my psychiatrist would have called juvenile, and he looked at me pointedly. "'You remember what it means,' he said, a little anxiously, I thought, and looked significantly at my hand. "'That we will always stand by each other, through thick and thin?' His eyes were pulled upward to the open door of the yacht. "'You can expect it to be both thick and thin,' I said dryly. "'If you know my Aunt Maddie.' "'She's your aunt?' he asked, his eyes widening. Matthew H. Toombs is your aunt? I never knew. To think, all those years at school and I never knew. Why, hap, happy old boy, this is wonderful. Man, have I been worried. Don't stop on my account, I said, maybe a little dolefully. Somebody reported to the Daughters of Terra that you let the natives run around out here stark naked, and if Aunt Mattie says she's going to put Mother Hubbards on them, then that's exactly what she's going to do. You can depend on that, old man. Mother Hub, he gasped. He looked at me strangely. It's a joke, he said. Somebody's pulled a practical joke on the DTs. Have you ever seen our natives? Pictures of them? Didn't anybody check up on what they're like before you came out here? It's a joke. A practical joke on the DTs. It has to be. I wouldn't know, I said. 
but if they're naked, they won't be for long. I can tell you that. Aunt Maddie. His eyes left my face and darted up to the door of the ship, which was no longer a black oval. The unexplained bewilderment of his expression was not diminished as Aunt Maddie came through the door, out on the loading platform, and started down the steps. He grew a little white around the mouth, licked his lips, and forgot all his joy at meeting an old schoolmate. His two subordinates, who had remained standing just out of earshot, as if recognizing a crisis now, stepped briskly up to his sides. Aunt Maddie's two committee women, as if to match phalanx with phalanx, came through the door and started down the steps behind her. I stepped to one side as the two forces met face to face on the crunching salt that covered the ground. It might look like a Christmas scene, but under Capella's rays it was blazing hot, and I found myself in sympathy with the men's open neck shirts and brief shorts. Still, they should have known better than to dress like that. Somebody in the State Department had goofed. Aunt Maddie and her two committee women were dressed conservatively in something that might have resembled an English colonel's wife's idea of the correct tweeds to wear on a cold, foggy night. If they were already sweltering beneath these coverings, as I was beginning to in my lighter suit, they were too ladylike to show it. Their acid glance at the men's attire showed what they thought of the informality of dress in which they'd been received, but they were too ladylike to comment. After that first pointed look at bare knees, they had no need of it. This is the official attire prescribed for us by the State Department, Johnny said, a little anxiously, I thought. It was hardly the formal speech of welcome he, as planet administrator, must have prepared. I have no doubt of it, Aunt Maddie said, and her tone told them what she thought of the State Department under the present administration. You would hardly have met ladies in such, ah, uh, otherwise. I could see that she was making a mental note to speak to the State Department about it. Make a note she said, and turned to Miss Point. I will speak to the State Department. How can one expect natives to? If our own representatives don't, etc., etc. May I show you to your quarters, ma'am? Johnny asked humbly. No doubt you will want to freshen up, or... Miss Point blushed furiously. We are already quite fresh, young man, Aunt Mattie said firmly. I happen to know that Aunt Mattie didn't like to browbeat people. Not at all. It would all have been so much more pleasant, gracious, if they'd been brought up to know right from wrong. But what parents in school had failed to do, she must correct as her duty. I thought it about time I tried to smooth things over. I stepped up into their focus. Aunt Maddie, I said, this is Johnny McCabe. We were at school together. Her eyebrows shot upward. You were, she asked, and looked piercingly at Johnny. Then, I realize, young man that your attire is not your fault. You must have been acting under orders, and against your personal knowledge of what would be correct. I understand. She turned again to Miss Point. Underscore that note to the State Department, she said. Mark it emergency. She turned back to Johnny. Very well, Mr. McCabe. We would appreciate it, after all, if you would show us to our quarters so that we may, uh, to freshen up a bit. It is rather a warm day, isn't it? She was quite gracious now, reassured because Johnny was an old schoolmate of mine, and would therefore know right from wrong. If I sometimes didn't seem to, she knew me well enough to know that it had not been the fault of the school. The three of us, Johnny on one side of Aunt Maddie and I on the other side, started toward the frame building on the other side of the bubble, which I assumed was the hotel. The four subordinates trailed along behind, silent, wary of one another. Behind them, the baggage truck, which had been piled high by the ship's crew, hissed into life and started moving along on its tractor treads. Johnny caught a glimpse of it, without actually turning around, and his eyes opened wide. He misinterpreted, of course. From the mountain of baggage, it looked like our intention to stay a long time. But then, he wouldn't have been particularly reassured, either, had he realized that our own supplies were quite scant in these bags, boxes, and crates, contained sewing machines and many, many bolts of gaily colored cloth. I had hardly more than, uh, freshened up a bit myself in my hotel room when I heard a discreet knock on my door. I opened it and saw Johnny McCabe. May I come in, Hap? he asked. As if against his will, he glanced quickly down the hall toward the suite where Aunt and her committee had been put. Sure, Johnny, I said, and opened the door wide. I pointed to an aluminum tube torture rack, government issues idea of a chair. 
You can have that chair, I said. I'll sit on the edge of the bed. I'm sorry about the furnishings, he said apologetically as he sat down, and I closed the door. It's the best government will issue us in this hole. Aunt Mattie would be disappointed if it were better, I said, as I sat on the edge of the bed, which was little softer than the chair. She expects to rough it, and finds special virtue in doing her duty as uncomfortably as possible. He looked sharply at me, but I had merely stated an accepted fact, not an opinion, and was therefore emotionless about it. I'm in trouble, Hap, he said desperately. He leaned forward with his clasped hands held between his knees. Well, old man, I answered, you know me. Yes, he said, but there isn't anybody else I can turn to. Then we understand each other, I agreed. He looked both resentful and puzzled. No, I never did understand you, he disagreed. I suppose it's all those billions that act as shock insulation for you. You never had to plan and scheme and stand alert indefinitely like a terrier at a rat hole waiting for an opportunity to stick out its nose so you could pounce on it. So I don't see how you can appreciate my problem now. I might try, I said humbly. This job, he said, it's not much, and I know it, but it was a start. The department doesn't expect anything from me but patience. It's not so much ability, you know, just a matter of who can hang on the longest without getting into trouble. I've been hanging on and keeping out of trouble. But you're in trouble now? I will be when your aunt fails to put Mother Hubbard's on the natives. She won't fail, I said confidently. And when she storms into the State Department with fire in her eyes and starts turning things upside down, it'll be my fault, somehow, he said miserably. So let her put some clothes on some natives, I said. She'll go away happy, and then, for all you care, you can take them off and burn them if they insist on going around naked. Just swing with the punch, man. Don't stand up and let them knock your block off. Surely you have some influence with the natives. I don't hear any war drums, any tom-toms. I don't see them trying to tear holes in the sides of your bubble to let the air out. You must be at peace with them. You must have some kind of mutual cooperation. So just get a tribe or so to go along with the idea for a while. He looked at me and shook his head sadly, sort of the way Aunt Mattie shook her head after a conference with my psychiatrist. But Johnny didn't seem somehow happier. He had a pretty good chest, but it didn't look enormous enough to carry any burden. I've been pretty proud of myself, he said, after five years of daily attempts and after using everything I ever learned in school courses on extraterrestrial psychology, plus some things I've made up myself. I established a kind of communication with the natives, if you could call it communication. I'd go out in my spacesuit into their chlorinated atmosphere. I'd stand in front of one of them and talk a blue streak, think a blue streak. After about five years of it, one of them slowly closed his eye and then opened it again. I invited one of them to come inside the bubble. I told him about the difference in atmosphere, that it might be dangerous. I got one of them to come in. It made no difference to him. Well, fine then, I said. Just get some of them to come in again. Let Aunt Mattie put some clothes on them, and everybody's happy. He stood up suddenly. Take a walk with me, Hap, he said. It was more of a command than an invitation. Over to the edge of the bubble. I want to show you some natives. I was willing. On the way around to the back of the building, over the crunching salt, I had a thought. If all he did was close an eye, I said. How did you learn their language, so you could invite them inside, explain about the atmosphere? I don't even know they have a language, he said. Maybe he learned mine. I used to draw pictures in the salt, the way they taught us at school, and say words. Maybe it took him five years to put the thoughts together. Maybe they don't have any concept of language at all, or need it. Maybe he was thinking about something else all those five years, and just got around to noticing me. I don't know, Hap. We came around the edge of an outbuilding then to an unobstructed view of the bubble edge. Even through dark glasses he'd cautioned me to wear with a gesture, as he put on another pair for himself, the scene through the clear plastic was blinding white, scattered here and there on the glistening salt were blobs of black. Why, I exclaimed, those are octopi. I suppose that's what the natives use for food? I wondered. Those are the natives, he answered dryly. By now we were up to the plastic barrier of our bubble and stood looking out at the scene. Well, I said after some long moments of staring, it will be a challenge to the DTs, won't it? He looked at me with disgust. What do they eat, I asked. Salt? I don't know if they eat, he said. 
Can't you get it through your thick skull, man? That these things are alien? Completely alien? How do I know? Well, you must know some things after five years of study. You must have observed them. They must get food somehow. They must sleep and wake. They must procreate. You must have observed something. I've observed the process of procreation, he answered cautiously. Well, fine then, I said. That's what's going to concern Aunt Maddie the most. Here's something that may help you understand them, he said, and I felt a bit of the sardonic in his voice, a grimness. When that one visited me inside here, he said, I took him to my office, so I could photograph him better with all the equipment. I was explaining everything, not knowing how much he understood. I happened to pick up a cigarette and a lighter. Soon as I flipped the lighter on, he shot up a tentacle and took it out of my hand. I let him keep it, of course. Next day, when I went outside, every one of them, as far as I could see in the distance, had a lighter exactly like the one I'd given him. Furthermore, in a chlorinated atmosphere, without oxygen, those lighters burn normally. Does that help you to understand them better? He asked with no attempt to hide the heavy irony. I didn't have a chance to answer, because we both heard it crunching in the salt behind us. We turned about, and there was Aunt Maddie and her two committee women behind her, also now in dark glasses. I waited until the ladies had come up to us. Then I waved my arm grandly at the scene beyond the plastic. Behold the natives in all their nakedness, Aunt Maddie, I said. Then, to soften the blow it must have been, I'm afraid somebody was pulling your leg when they reported it to the DTs. Miss Point gasped audibly. Miss Waddle said, Shocking! I couldn't tell whether it was the sight of the natives, or my remark which indicated I knew they had legs to pull. For the first time in my life, I saw uncertainty in Aunt Maddie's eyes as she looked, startled, at me and then at Johnny. Then her chin squared, her back straightened still more, the shelf of her bosom firmed. It really won't be too much of a problem, girls, she said. Actually, simpler than some we've solved. Take a square of cloth. Cut a hole in the center for that head-like pouch to come through where its eye is. Put in a drawstring to cinch it up tight above those, uh, those protuberances. And let it flow out over those, uh, legs. Simple and quite attractive, don't you think? The girls nodded happily, and Johnny just stood there gasping for breath. It was simpler than any of us had thought. Johnny looked at me desperately when Aunt Maddie told him to have one of the natives come in so she could fit a pattern on it, to see if any gussets would be needed for fullness, whatever gussets might be. One of them came inside here before, I said, in answer to Johnny's pleading look. Ask him again. If he refuses, Mohammed will go to the mountain. I'm sure you have extra spacesuits. I'm sure the ladies won't mind going out to the natives if the natives won't come to them. I don't know, Johnny said miserably. He may have had sufficient curiosity to come inside once, but not sufficient to bring him in again. You see, ladies, he turned to them desperately, they don't seem to care about us, one way or the other. The two committee women looked apprehensively at Aunt Maddie. Not to care about her, one way or the other. This was beyond comprehension, but Aunt Maddie was equal to it. Very well, she said crisply. We shall not ask them to come to us. We shall go to them. It is our duty to carry enlightenment to the ignorant, wherever they may be, so that they can be taught to care. In the performance of our duty, we have no room for pride. We shall go to them, humbly, happily. We did, too. By the time we'd got into the spacesuits and through the bubble lock out into the ordinary landscape of Capella Four, Capella, the sun, was sinking rapidly. We will just have time, Aunt Maddie said crisply, through the intercom of our suits, to set the pattern and get some idea of the sizes needed. Then tomorrow we can begin our work. Through his faceplate, I caught a look at Johnny's wide, apprehensive eyes. Ladies, he said desperately, I must warn you again. I've never tried to touch one of them. I don't know what will happen. I can't be held responsible. You have been most remiss, young man. Aunt Maddie said sternly. But then, she added, as if remembering that he had gone to a proper school, you're young, no doubt overburdened by nonsensical red tape in your administrative duties, and if you had done this already, there'd be no reason for my being here. I am always willing to help wherever I'm needed. All five of us marched silently and bravely on after that. A hundred yards brought us to the first native, 
It lay there, spread-eagled in eight directions, on the salt. In the center of the tentacles, there arose a column of black rubbery flesh, topped by a rounded dome in the center of which was one huge liquid black eye. There was not a twitch of a tentacle as we came to a halt beside it. "'Is this the one you talked to, Johnny?' I asked. "'How should I know?' he asked bitterly. "'I never knew if I talked to the same one twice.' "'They're much bigger than I thought,' Miss Point said with a little dismay in her voice. "'Some of them are ten feet in diameter,' Johnny said, I thought with a bit of vindictiveness in his tone. "'Never mind,' Aunt Mattie said. "'We'll simply sew three lengths of cloth together to get our square. I'm sure they won't mind a neatly done seam.' She had a length of cloth in one arm of her spacesuit, and a pair of scissors in the mechanical claw of the other hand. With her eye, she seemed to measure the diameter of the dome, and, manipulating the scissors with the claw like an expert space mechanic, she cut a sizable hole in the center of the cloth. Entirely without fear or hesitation, she stepped into the triangle between two long black tentacles that lay on the salt and walked up to the erect column at the center. Expertly, she flipped the cloth so that the hole settled over the creature's head, or whatever it was. Fore and aft, the cloth rippled out to cover the tentacles. The creature did not move. With an amazing speed, she took some bundles of cloth from the arms of Mrs. Waddle, and with even more amazing dexterity of the space claw, which showed she was no amateur, she basted a length of cloth on either side of the first strip. Then with her scissors, careful not to gouge his hide, she cut off the corner so that the eight tentacles barely peeped out from underneath the cloth. Somehow, it reminded me of a huge red flower with a black pistol laying there on the white salt. There, sir, my aunt said with satisfaction to the monster. This will hide your nakedness, instill in you a sense of true modesty. She turned to Johnny. They must not only know what, she instructed. They must also know why. She turned back and faced the monster again. It is not your fault, she said to it, that you have been living in a state of sin. On earth, where I come from, we have a code which must be followed. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I am sure that if I lived in a state of ignorant sin, I would humbly appreciate the kindness of someone letting me know. I am sure that, in time, you will also come to appreciate it. It was quite a noble speech, and her two companions bowed their spacesuit helmets in acknowledgment. Johnny's mouth and eyes were wide and desperate. She stepped back then, and we all stood there looking at the monster. The dome of its head began to tilt, until the eye was fastened upon us. It swept over the three ladies, hesitated on Johnny as if recognizing him, but came to rest upon me. It stared at me for a full minute. I stared back. In some strange way, I felt as if my psychiatrist were staring at me, as he often did. Then the great eye slowly closed and opened again. As slowly, and somewhat to my amazement, I felt one of my eyes close and open. I winked at it. That's all for this evening, Aunt Mattie said crisply. Let it have its clothes. Get used to them. I have a pattern in my mind. Tomorrow we will get our sewing machines and really get busy, girls. All the way back to the entrance of the bubble, I felt that huge eye upon me, following me. Why me? The girls did not need to get busy the next morning. I was awakened by a shout. There was the sound of running feet in the hall and a pounding on my door. Sleepy-eyed, for I had dreamed of the monster's eye all night long, I opened the door as soon as I found a robe to cover my own nakedness. It was Johnny, of course. Most amazing thing! He rushed in and collapsed into a sitting position on the side of my bed. Absolutely amazing. You should see them. What? I asked. The rumpus must have disturbed the ladies, too, for there came another knock on my door, and when I opened it, all three of them stood there fully dressed. Apparently they had arisen at the crack of dawn to get busy with their sewing. Miss Point and Mrs. Waddle averted their eyes modestly from the v-neck of my robe and my bare legs. Aunt Mattie was used to my shameless ways. "'What is it?' Aunt Mattie asked crisply. Johnny leapt to his feet again. "'Amazing,' he said again. "'I'll have to show you. You'll never believe it.' "'Young man,' Aunt Mattie said sharply, "'no one has accused you of untruthfulness, "'and you are hardly a judge of what we are capable of believing.' He stood looking at her with his mouth open. "'Now, ladies,' I said, and started closing the door. 
If you'll excuse me for two minutes, I'll dress, and we'll go see what Mr. McCabe wants to show us. The door clicked on my last words, and I hastily doffed the robe and slid into pants and a shirt. Oddly enough, I knew what he was going to show us. I just knew. I slipped on some shoes without bothering about socks. All right, I said. I'm ready. They had started down the hall, and we quickly overtook them. Johnny went ahead, led us out of the hotel, around its side, and when we came around the corner of the outbuilding which obscured the view, there before us, through the bubble wall, we saw what I had expected. As far as the eye could see, dotted here and there like poppies on snow, the natives lay in the early sun, each dressed in flaring cloth like that Aunt Mattie had designed the night before. You see, Johnny cried out, it's the same as with the lighter. One liked it, so they all have it. By now we were up against the plastic barrier. The two subordinates were gasping such words as fantastic, amazing, astounding, incredible, wondrous, weird. Aunt Mattie took it all in, and her face lit into a beatific smile. You see, young man, she said to Johnny, they needed only to be shown right from wrong. Let this be a lesson to you. But how did they do it? Mrs. Waddle gasped. Give them some credit for diligence and ingenuity. Aunt Mattie almost snapped at her assistant. I always say we underrate the intelligence and ingenuity of the lesser orders, and that it saps their strengths if we are overprotective. I admire self-reliance, and these have shown they have it, so we will not have to do the sewing after all. Come, girls, we must pack and be on our way back to Earth. Our mission here is accomplished. The two ladies obeyed their leader without question. The three of them, in their sturdy walking shoes and their tweed suits, crunched off across the salt back to their rooms to start packing. Johnny and I walked along more slowly behind. The incredible Mathua H. Toombs, he breathed. She's a legend, you know, Hap, but I never believed it before. Then, in a complete and sudden change of mood, he snickered. Or, at least, it was the nearest thing to a small boy snicker I'd heard since prep school. The snicker turned into a roar of laughter, a grown man's laughter. If they only knew, he shouted, apparently feeling secure because they'd turned the corner and gone out of sight. Knew what, I asked. Why, he said, and doubled up with laughter again. They've covered up all the innocent parts and left the reprehensible part, which is right behind the eye, fully exposed. Johnny, my boy, I said with a chuckle. Do you really believe there are innocent parts and reprehensible parts of any creature in the universe? He stood stock still and stared at me. It takes a nasty, salacious mind to make that kind of separation, I said. But your aunt, the daughters of... I know my aunt and the daughters of Terra, I said. I've lived with them for years. I know their kind of mind. Who would know it better? But you, the human race, I said, is very young. It's only in the last few thousand years that it has discovered sex as a concept. So like little kids in kindergarten, it goes around being embarrassed and snickering. But we'll grow up. Give us time. But you, he said again. But they, that's the kind of organization that keeps us from growing up, Hap. Don't you see that? They've kept us mentally retarded for generations, centuries. How can we make progress when, what's the hurry, Johnny? We've got millions of years. Billions. Eternity. He looked at me again, sharply, shrewdly. I've underestimated you, Hap, he said. I'm afraid I always did. I had no idea you... I shrugged and passed it off. I had no idea either, not until this morning. Last night, yesterday evening when that eye had turned on me, and I'd winked back. I didn't know how to tell him, or any reason why I should. But there couldn't be anything right or wrong good or bad, that nothing could happen, nothing at all, excepting through the working of the law of nature. Could one say that water running down a hill is good, and water being pumped uphill is bad? Both are operating within known physical laws. With millions of years to go, wasn't it likely we would go on discovering the laws governing how things worked? Until, one by one, we had to give up all notion of good and bad happenings understood them as only the operation of natural laws? In all the universe, how could there be any such thing as unnatural happenings? Don't worry about it, Johnny, I said as we started walking again. And don't worry about your career, either. 
Aunt Maddie likes you, and she's mighty pleased with the result of her work out here. Certain people in the State Department may consider her a bit of a meddlesome pest, but make no mistake about it. Every politician in the universe trembles in his boots at the very mention of the DTs, and she likes you, Johnny. Thanks, Hap, he said as we came to a stop before the doorway of the hotel. I'll see you before your ship takes off. Oh, uh, you won't tell her she covered up the wrong... Well, what she would think was the wrong part. I could have told her that last night, I said. He walked away with that startled, incredulous look he'd worn ever since our arrival. On Earth, Aunt Mattie had to rush off to a convention of the DTs, where I had no doubt her latest exploit in combating ignorance and sin would be the main topic of conversation and add to the triumph of her lionization. To give her credit, I think this lionization bothered her, embarrassed her a little, and she probably wondered at times if it were all sincere. But I also think she would have been lonely and disappointed without it. When one is doing all he can to make the universe we have inherited a better place for our posterity to inherit, one likes it to be appreciated. For two or three weeks after she came back home, she was immersed in administrative duties for the DT, setting wheels in motion to carry out all the promises she'd made at the convention. I spent the time in my own suite in the south wing of our house. Mostly, I just sat. No one bothered me except the servants necessary to eating, dressing, sleeping, and they were all but mute about it. My psychiatrist called once, but I sent word that I didn't need any today. I called none of my regular friends and did not answer their messages. I did send to the Library of Science in Washington for the original science survey report on Capella 4. It told me little, but allowed me to surmise some things. Apparently, the original scientists were singularly uncurious about the octopoids, perhaps because they didn't have five years to hang around and wait for one to blink an eye, as Johnny had. As always, they were overworked and understaffed. They did their quick survey and rushed on to some new planet job. If one hoped that someday somebody might go back and take another look at the octopoids, I found no burning yearning for it in the dry reports. As far as they went, their surmise was accurate. Some millions, many millions of years ago, the planet had lost the last of its ocean water. Apparently, as they failed to adapt to the increasing salinity of the little left, one by one of the original life forms died out. Something in the octopoid metabolism, or mentality, allowed them to survive, to become land instead of water animals. Something in their metabolism, or mentality, allowed them to subsist on the air and sunlight. Really now, did they even need these? That was as far as the reports went. They did not draw the picture of highly developed mentalities who lay there for millions of years and thought about the nature of being. Such things as how mental manipulation of force fields can provide each of them with a cigarette lighter that burns without any fluid in it and any oxygen around its wick. Or such things as Mother Hubbard's which had caught their fancy. Or perhaps gave them some kind of sensual kick caused by heat filtering through red cloth. But mostly I just sat. I went to see Aunt Mattie when she came back from the convention, of course. She had the west wing where her sitting room looked out upon her flora collection, and the gardeners who were supposed to keep busy... Our greeting was fond, but brief. She did look at me rather quizzically, rather shrewdly, but she made no comment. She did not return my visit. This was not unusual. She never visited my suite. When I was twenty-one, she took me into the south wing and said, Choose your own suite, Hapland. You are a man now, and I understand about young men. If she had in mind what I thought she had, it was a mighty big concession to reality. Although, of course... She was five years late in coming around to it. This older generation, so wise, so naive, she probably resolutely refrained from imagining far worse things than really went on. About two weeks after she'd come back from the convention, a month since we returned from Capella 4, there was an interruption, an excited one. For once in his life, the butler forgot to touch my door with feather fingertips and cough discreetly. Instead, he knocked two sharp raps and opened the door without invitation. "'Come quickly, Mr. Hapland,' he chittered urgently. "'There are creatures on our private landing field!' There were, too. When I got there in my garden scooter, and pushed my way through the crowd of gardeners who were clustered on the path and around the gate to the landing field, I saw them. At least a dozen of the Capella Four octopoids were spread-eagled, their tentacles out flat on the hot cement of the runway.' 
their eyes stared unblinking into the sun. Over the spread of tentacles, like inverted hibiscus blossoms, they wore their mother hubbards. Behind them, over at the far edge of the field, was an exact duplicate of our own space yacht. I wondered, rather hysterically perhaps, if each of them on Capella 4 now had one. I suspected the yacht was simply there for show, that they hadn't needed it, not any more than they needed the mother hubbards. There was a hiss of another scooter, and I turned around to see Aunt Maddie come to a stop. She stepped out and came over to me. Our social call on Capella 4 is being returned, I said, with a grin and twinkle at her. She took in the sight with only one blink. Very well, she answered. I shall receive them, of course. Somebody once said that the most snobbish thing about the whole tribe of tombs was that they'd never learned the meaning of the word, or had to, but I did wonder what the servants would think when the creatures started slithering into our drawing room. There was a gasp and a low rumble of protesting voices from the gardeners as Aunt Mattie opened the gate and walked through it. I followed, of course. We walked up to the nearest monster and came to a stop at the edge of its skirt. "'I'm deeply honored. Aunt Mattie said with more cordiality than I'd seen her use on a Secretary of State. "'What can I do to make your visit to Earth more comfortable?' There was no reply, not even the flicker of a tentacle. They were even more unusual than one might expect. Aunt Mattie resolutely went to each of the dozen and gave the same greeting. She felt her duty as hostess required it, although I knew that a greeting to one was a greeting to all. Not one of them responded. It seemed rather ridiculous. They came all this way to see us, then didn't bother to acknowledge that we were there. We spent more than an hour waiting for some kind of a response. None came. Aunt Mattie showed no sign of impatience, which I thought was rather praiseworthy, all things considered. But finally we left. She didn't show what she felt, perhaps felt only that one had to be patient with the lack of manners in the lower orders. I was more interested in another kind of feeling, the one we left behind. What was it? I couldn't put my finger on it. Sadness? Regret? Distaste? Pity? Magnanimity? Give a basket of goodies to the poor at Christmas? Give them some clothes to cover their nakedness? Teach them a sense of shame? No, I couldn't put my finger on it. Hilarity? I found myself regretting that back there on Capella 4, when Aunt Mattie put clothes on him, and the monster had looked at me, I winked. I wondered why I should regret that. I didn't have long to wonder. Nothing happened during the rest of the day. We went back, together and separately, several times during the daylight hours and during the early hours of the night. For a wonder, nobody had leaked anything to the newspapers, and for what it was worth, we had the show to ourselves. Perhaps tomorrow, Aunt Mattie said around midnight, as we left the field for the last time. Perhaps they must rest. I could use some of that, I said with a yawn. Yes, Hapland, she agreed. We must conserve our strength. Heaven knows what may be required of us on the morrow. Did she feel something, too? It was so strong, how could she help it? And yet, the monster had not looked into her eye. I didn't expect to sleep well, but I fooled myself. I was quite sure I hadn't more than closed my eyes when I was roused by another excited rapping on my bedroom door, and again the butler rushed in without ceremony. "'Look, Master Haplin!' he shouted in a near falsetto. He pulled so hard on my drapes they swept back from my windows like a stage curtain, and I looked. To the very limit of our grounds in the distance, but not beyond, the trees, the shrubs, the drives and walkways, the lawns and ponds, all were covered with a two-foot-thick blanket of glistening salt. "'And the monsters are gone,' the butler was saying, "'and I must go to your aunt.' "'So must I,' I said, and grabbed up a robe. As I ran, overtook him, passed him, from all over the house I could hear excited outcries, wonder, amazement, anger, fear from the servants. I finished the length of my wing, sprinted through the main body of the house, and down the hallway of her wing to the door of her suite. I didn't need to knock. Someone had left it open. Her own personal maid, I saw, as I ran past the little alcove into the sitting room. The maid was standing beside Aunt Mattie, wringing her hands and crying. The drapes here, too, were swept full back, and through the windows I could see the collection, the highly prized, wondrous collection of flora, all covered in salt. Aunt Mattie stood there, without support, looking at it. 
When I came up to her, there were tears in her eyes and glistening streaks on her wrinkled cheeks. Why? she asked. It was very quietly spoken. By now the butler had made the trip and came into the room. I turned to him. If we hurry, I said, a good deal of the collection is enclosed under plastic domes. If we don't wet the salt, and if we hurry and have it scraped away from the buildings, it won't poison the ground inside them. We can save most of the collection that way. No, Mr. Hapland, he said and shook his head. The salt is inside the buildings just as much as here. A gardener shouted it at me as I passed. Aunt Mattie's closed fist came up to her lips and then dropped again. That was all. Why, Hapland? she asked again. Evil for good? Why? I motioned the maid and butler to leave, and take with them the cluster of servants around the door in the hall. I took Aunt Mattie over to her favorite chair, the one where she could sit and look out at her collection. No point in pretending the salt wasn't there. I sat down at her feet, the way I used to when I was ten years old. I looked out at the salt, too. It was everywhere. Every inch of our grounds was covered with it, to poison the earth so that nothing would grow in it. It would take years to restore the grounds, and many more years to restore the collection. Try to understand, Aunt Mattie, I said. Not only what I say, but all the implications of it. They didn't return evil for good. Let's see it from what might have been their point of view. They live on a world of salt, an antiseptic world. We went there, and you intended good. You told them that our code was to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. They returned our visit, and what did they find? What kind of pestilent horror did we live in? Bare ground, teeming with life, billions of life forms in every cubic foot of ground beneath our feet, above the ground too, raw, growing life all around us, towering over us. If they were doomed to live in such a world, they would want it covered in salt to kill all the life, make it antiseptic. They owed nothing to the rest of the earth, but they owed this kindness to you. They did unto others, as they would have others do unto them. I never realized. I was sure I couldn't be. I've built my life around it, she said. I know, I said, with a regretful sigh. So many people have. And yet... I still wonder if it might not have happened after all, if I hadn't winked. I wonder if that pesty psychiatrist has been right all along. End of Do Unto Others by Mark Clifton Recording by Scott Silk of the Tales to Terrify Horror Story Podcast The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. As yet, I haven't done anything about it. I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe it's even under control. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning pages of a paperback book someone had left on the bus, when I came across the reference that first put me on the trail. For a moment, I didn't respond. It took some time for the full import to sink in. After I'd comprehended... It seemed odd I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties, not indigenous to Earth. A species, I hasten to point out, customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became apparent in the face of the following observations by the author. It was at once obvious the author knew everything, knew everything, and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble remembering it even now, read, His eyes slowly roved about the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air, not over the surface. Rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. 
Later, the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person to person. There it was in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded and my breath choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race, obviously non-terrestrial. Yet, to the characters in the book, it was perfectly natural, which suggests they belong to the same species. And the author? A slow suspicion burned in my mind. The author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Evidently, he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal this knowledge. The story continued. Presently, his eyes fastened on Julia. Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this, I sighed with relief. They weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly, his eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! But here the girl turned and stomped off and the matter ended. I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. What's the matter, dear? My wife asked. Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. I had to keep it to myself. Nothing, I gasped. I leapt up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. In the garage, I continued reading. There was more. Trembling, I read the next revealing passage. He put his arm around Julia. Presently, she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. Maybe it was left standing upright in the corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. In, in any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will. Eyes, arms, and maybe more, without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy at this point. Obviously, they were simple beings, unicellular, some sort of primitive, single-celled things, beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know? I read on, and came to this incredible revelation, tossed off coolly by the author without the faintest tremor. Outside the movie theater, we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the cafe for dinner. Binary fission, obviously. Splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably each lower half went to the cafe, it being farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, hands shaking. I had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney had lost his head again. Which was followed by, and Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was described as totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julia, whom I had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life form similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julia had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the organ was, but I really didn't care. It was evident Julia had gone right on living in her usual manner, like all the others in the book. Without her heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera divided up into two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereupon, she gave him her hand. I sickened. The rascal now had her hand, as well as her heart. I shudder to think what he's done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had to start dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leaped to my feet. But not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. Her eyes followed him all the way down the road and across the meadow. I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house as if the accursed things were following me. My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I joined them and played with frantic fervor. 
brow feverish, teeth chattering. I had had enough of the thing. I wanted to hear no more about it. Let them come. Let them invade Earth. I don't want to get mixed up in it. I had absolutely no stomach for it. End of The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunganungataha, Pew The Game of Rat and Dragon by Cordwainer Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Rat and Dragon by Cordwainer Smith The Table Penlighting is a hell of a way to earn a living. Underhill was furious as he closed the door behind himself. It didn't make much sense to wear a uniform and look like a soldier if people didn't appreciate what you did. He sat down in his chair, laid his head back in the headrest, and pulled the helmet down over his forehead. As he waited for the pin set to warm up, he remembered the girl in the outer corridor. She had looked at it, then looked at him, scornfully. Meow. That was all she had said, yet it had cut him like a knife. What did she think he was? A fool? A loper? A uniformed non-entity? Didn't she know that for every half-hour of pen-lighting he got a minimum of two months' recuperation in the hospital? By now the set was warm. He felt the squares of space around him, sensed himself at the middle of an immense grid, a cubic grid full of nothing. Out in that nothingness he could sense the hollow, aching horror of space itself, and could feel the terrible anxiety which his mind encountered whenever it met the faintest trace of inert dust. As he relaxed, the comforting solidity of the sun, the clockwork of the familiar planets and the moon, rang in on him. Our own solar system was as charming and as simple as an ancient cuckoo clock, filled with familiar ticking and with reassuring noises. The odd little moons of Mars swung around their planet like frantic mice, yet their regularity was itself an assurance that all was well. Far above the plain of the ecliptic, he could feel half a ton of dust more or less drifting outside the lanes of human travel. Here there was nothing to fight, nothing to challenge the mind, to tear the living soul out of a body with its roots dripping in effluvium as tangible as blood. Nothing ever moved in on the solar system. He could wear the pinset forever, and be nothing more than a sort of telepathic astronomer, a man who could feel the hot, warm protection of the sun throbbing and burning against his living mind. Woodley came in. Same old ticking world, said Underhill. Nothing to report. No wonder they didn't develop the pin set until they began to plan a form. Down here, with the hot sun around us, it feels so good and so quiet. You can feel everything spinning and turning. It's nice and sharp and compact. It's sort of like sitting around home. Woodley grunted. He was not much given to flights of fantasy. Undeterred, Underhill went on. It must have been pretty good to have been an ancient man. I wonder why they burned up their world with war. They didn't have to plan a form. They didn't have to go out to earn their livings among the stars. They didn't have to dodge the rats or play the game. They couldn't have invented pinlighting because they didn't have any need of it, did they, Woodley? Woodley grunted. Uh -huh. Woodley was twenty-six years old and due to retire in one more year. He already had a farm picked out. He had gotten through ten years of hard work pinlighting with the best of them. He had kept his sanity by not thinking very much about his job, meeting the strains of the task whenever he had to meet them, and thinking nothing more about his duties until the next emergency arose. Woodley never made a point of getting popular among the partners. None of the partners liked him very much. Some of them even resented him. 
He was suspected of thinking ugly thoughts of the partners on occasion, but since none of the partners ever thought a complaint in articulate form, the other pinlighters and the cheaps of the instrumentality left him alone. Underhill was still full of the wonder of their job. Happily, he babbled on, "'What does happen to us when we plan a form? Do you think it's sort of like dying? Did you ever see anybody who had his soul pulled out?' "'Pulling souls is just a way of talking about it,' said Woodley. "'After all these years, nobody knows whether we have souls or not.' "'But I saw one once. I saw what Dog would look like when he came apart. There was something funny. It looked wet and sort of sticky.' as if it were bleeding, and it went out of him. And do you know what they did to Dogwood? They took him away, up in that part of the hospital where you and I never go, way up at the top part, where the others are, where the others always have to go, if they are alive, after the rats of the up and out have gotten. Woodley sat down and lit an ancient pipe. He was burning something called tobacco in it. It was a dirty sort of habit, but it made him look very dashing, and adventurous. Look here, youngster. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Pinlighting is getting better all the time. The partners are getting better. I've seen them pinlight two rats forty-six million miles apart in one and a half milliseconds. As long as people had to try to work the pincets themselves, there was always the chance that with a minimum of 400 milliseconds for the human mind to set a pin light, we wouldn't light the rats up fast enough to protect our planet-forming ships. The partners have changed all that. Once they get going, they're faster than rats, and they always will be. I know it's not easy, letting a partner share your mind. It's not easy for them either says Underhill. Don't worry about them. They're not human. Let them take care of themselves. I've seen more pinlighters go crazy from monkeying around with partners than I have ever seen caught by the rats. How many do you actually know of them that got grabbed by rats? Underhill looked down at his fingers, which shone green and purple in the vivid light thrown by the tuned-in pinset and counted ships, the thumb with the Andromeda, lost with crew and passengers, the index finger and the middle finger, for release ships 43 and 56, found with their pincets burned out, and every man, woman, and child on board, dead or insane. The ring finger, the little finger, and the thumb of the other hand were the first three battleships to be lost to the rats, lost as people realized that there was something out there, underneath space itself which was alive, capricious, and malevolent. Planet forming was sort of funny. It felt like, well, like nothing much. Well, like the twinge of a mild electric shock. Like the ache of a sore tooth bitten on for the first time. Like a slightly painful flash of light against the eyes. Yet in that time, a 40,000-ton ship lifting free above Earth disappeared somehow or other into two dimensions, and appeared half a light-year or fifty light-years off. At one moment he would be sitting in the fighting-room, the pinset ready, and the familiar solar system ticking around inside his head. For a second, or a year, he could never tell how long it really was, subjectively, the funny little flash went through him, and then he was loose in the up-and-out, the terrible open spaces between the stars— where the stars themselves felt like pimples on his telepathic mind, and the planets were too far away to be sensed or read. Somewhere in this outer space a gruesome death awaited, death and horror of a kind which man had never encountered until he reached out for interstellar space itself. Apparently the light of the suns kept the dragons away. Dragons! That was what people called them. To ordinary people there was nothing, nothing except the shiver of planiforming, and the hammer-blow of sudden death, or the dark, spastic note of lunacy descending into their minds. But to the telepaths they were dragons. 
in the fraction of a second between the telepath's awareness of a hostile something out in the black, hollow nothingness of space, and the impact of a ferocious, ruinous, psychic blow against all living things within the ship, the telepaths had sensed entities, something like the dragons of ancient human lore, beasts more clever than beasts, demons more tangible than demons, hungry vortices of aliveness and hate, compounded by unknown means out of the thin, tenuous matter between the stars. It took a surviving ship to bring back the news, a ship in which by sheer chance a telepath had a light beam ready, turning it out at the innocent dust, so that within the panorama of his mind the dragon dissolved into nothing at all, and the other passengers themselves non-telepathic went about their way not realising that their own immediate deaths had been averted. From then on it was easy, almost. Planner-forming ships always carried telepaths. Telepaths had their sensitiveness enlarged to an immense range by the pincets, which were telepathic amplifiers adapted to the mammal mind. The pincets, in turn, were electronically geared into small dirigible light bombs. Light did it. Light broke up the dragons, allowed the ships to reform three-dimensionally, skip, 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 as they moved from star to star. The odd suddenly moved down from a hundred to one against mankind to sixty to forty in mankind's favour. This was not enough. The telepaths were trained to become ultra-sensitive, trained to become aware of the dragons in less than a millisecond. But it was found that the dragons could move a million miles in just under two milliseconds, and that this was not enough for the human mind to activate the light beams. Attempts had been made to sheathe the ships in light at all times. This defence wore out. As mankind learned about the dragons, so too apparently the dragons learned about mankind. Somehow they flattened their own bulk, and came in on extremely flat trajectories, very quickly. Intense light was needed, light of sun-like intensity. This could be provided only by light bombs. Pinlighting came into existence. Pinlighting consisted of the detonation of ultra-vivid, miniature, photonuclear bombs, which converted a few ounces of a magnesium isotope into pure, visible radiance. The odds kept coming down in mankind's favour, yet ships were being lost. It became so bad that people didn't even want to find the ships, because the rescuers knew what they would see. It was sad to bring back to earth three hundred bodies ready for burial, and two hundred or three hundred lunatics, damaged beyond repair, to be wakened and fed and cleaned and put to sleep, wakened and fed again, until their lives were ended. Telepaths tried to reach into the minds of the psychotics who had been damaged by the dragons, but they found nothing there beyond vivid, spouting columns of fiery terror, bursting from the primordial id itself, the volcanic source of life. Then came the partners. Man and partner could do together what man could not do alone. Men had the intellect. Partners had the speed. The partners rode their tiny craft, no larger than footballs, outside the spaceships. They planiformed with the ships, they rode beside them in their six-pound craft, ready to attack. The tiny ships of the partners were swift. Each carried a dozen pinlights, bombs no bigger than thimbles. The pinlighters threw the partners, quite literally threw, by means of mind-to-firing relays direct at the dragons. What seemed to be dragons to the human mind appeared in the form of gigantic rats in the minds of the partners. Out in the pitiless nothingness of space, the partners' minds responded to an instinct as old as life. The partners attacked, striking with a speed faster than man's, going from attack to attack, until the rats or themselves were destroyed. Almost all the time it was the partners who won. With the safety of the interstellar skip, skip, skip of the ships, commerce increased immensely, the population of all the colonies went up, 
and the demand for trained partners increased. Underhill and Woodley were a part of the third generation of pinlighters, and yet to them it seemed as though their craft had endured for ever. Gearing space into mines by means of the pincet, adding the partners to those mines, keying up the mine for the tension of a fight on which all depended, this was more than human synapses could stand for long. Underhill needed his two months' rest after half an hour of fighting. Woodley needed his retirement after ten years of service. They were young, they were good, but they had limitations. So much depended on the choice of partners, so much on the sheer luck of who drew whom. The Shuffle Father Moontree and the little girl named West entered the room. They were the other two pinlighters. The human complement of the fighting room was now complete. Father Moontree was a red-faced man of forty-five, who had lived the peaceful life of a farmer until he reached his fortieth year. Only then, belatedly, did the authorities find he was telepathic, and agree to let him late in life enter upon the career of pinlighter. He did well at it, but he was fantastically old for this kind of business. Father Moontree looked at the glum Woodley and the musing Underhill. How are the youngsters today? Ready for a good fight? Father always wants a fight, giggled the little girl named West. She was such a little little girl. Her giggle was high and childish. She looked like the last person in the world one would expect to find in the rough, sharp dueling of pinlighting. Underhill had been amused one time, when he found one of the most sluggish of the partners coming away happy from contact with the mind of the girl named West. Usually the partners didn't care much about the human minds with which they were paired for the journey. The partners seemed to take the attitude that human minds were complex and fouled up beyond belief anyhow. No partner ever questioned the superiority of the human mind, though very few of the partners were much impressed by that superiority. The partners liked people. They were willing to fight with them. They were even willing to die for them. But when a partner liked an individual the way, for example, that Captain Wow or the Lady May liked Underhill, the liking had nothing to do with intellect. It was a matter of temperament, of feel. Underhill knew perfectly well that Captain Wow regarded his Underhill's brains as silly. What Captain Wow liked was Underhill's friendly emotional structure, the cheerfulness and glint of wicked amusement that shot through Underhill's unconscious thought patterns, and the gaiety with which Underhill faced danger. The words, the history books, the ideas, the science. Underhill could sense all that in his own mind reflected back from Captain Wow's mind as so much rubbish. Miss West looked at Underhill. I bet you put stick him on the stones. I did not. <laughs> Underhill felt his ears grow red with embarrassment. During his novitiate he had tried to cheat in the lottery because he got particularly fond of a special partner, a lovely young mother named Murr. It was so much easier to operate with Murr, and she was so affectionate toward him that he forgot pinlighting was hard work, and that he was not instructed to have a good time with his partner. They were both designed and prepared to go into deadly battle together. One cheating had been enough. They had found him out, and he had been laughed at for years. Father Moontree picked up the imitation leather cup and shook the stone dice which assigned them their partners for the trip. By senior rights, he took first draw. He grimaced. He had drawn a greedy old character, a tough old male, whose mind was full of slobbering thoughts of food, veritable oceans full of half-spoiled fish. Father Moontree had once said that he burped cod liver oil for weeks after drawing that particular glutton so strongly had the telepathic image of fish impressed itself upon his mind yet the glutton was a glutton for danger as well as for fish he had killed sixty-three dragons more than any other partner in the service and was quite literally worth his weight in gold the little girl west came next 
She drew Captain Wow. When she saw who it was, she smiled. I like him, she said. He's such fun to fight with. He feels so nice and cuddly in my mind. Cuddly hell, said Woodley. I've been in his mind, too. It's the most leering mind in this ship, bar none. Nasty man, said the little girl. She said it declaratively, without reproach. Underhill, looking at her, shivered. He didn't see how she could take Captain Wow so calmly. Captain Wow's mind did leer. When Captain Wow got excited in the middle of a battle, confused images of dragons, deadly rats, luscious beds, the smell of fish, and the shock of space all scrambled together in his mind as he and Captain Wow, their consciousnesses linked together through the pincet, became a fantastic composite of human being and Persian cat. That's the trouble with working with cats, thought Underhill. It's a pity that nothing else anywhere will serve as partner. Cats were all right once you got in touch with them telepathically. They were smart enough to meet the needs of the fight, but their motives and desires were certainly different from those of humanity. They were companionable enough, as long as you thought tangible images at them, but their minds just closed up and went to sleep when you recited Shakespeare or Colgrove, or if you tried to tell them what space was. It was sort of funny realising that the partners, who were so grim and mature out here in space, were the same cute little animals that people had used as pets for thousands of years back on Earth. He had embarrassed himself more than once while on the ground, saluting perfectly ordinary non-telepathic camps, because he had forgotten for the moment that they were not partners. He picked up the dice and shook out the stone dice he was lucky. He drew the Lady May. The Lady May was the most thoughtful partner he had ever met. In her, the finely bred pedigree mind of a Persian cat had reached one of its highest peaks of development. She was more complex than any human woman, but the complexity was all one of emotions, memory, hope, and discriminated experience, experience sorted through without benefit of words. When he had first come into contact with her mind, he was astonished at its clarity. With her he remembered her kittenhood. He remembered every mating experience she had ever had. He saw in a half-recognizable gallery all the other pinlighters with whom she had been paired for the fight, and he saw himself radiant, cheerful, and desirable. He even thought he caught the edge of a longing, a very flattering and yearning thought. What a pity he is not a cat. Woodley picked up the last stone. He drew what he deserved. A sullen, scared old tomcat with none of the verve of Captain Wow. Woodley's partner was the most animal of all the cats on the ship, a low, brutish type with a dull mind. Even telepathy had not refined his character. His ears were half chewed off from the first fights in which he had engaged. He was a serviceable fighter, nothing more. Woodley grunted. Underhill glanced at him oddly. Didn't Woodley ever do anything but grunt? Father Moontree looked at the other three. You might as well get your partners now. I'll let the scanner know we're ready to go into the up and out. The Deal Underhill spun the combination lock on the Lady May's cage. He woke her gently and took her into his arms. She humped her back luxuriously, stretched her claw, started to purr, thought better of it, and licked him on the wrist instead. He did not have the pincet on, so their minds were closed to each other. But in the angle of her moustache, and in the movement of her ears, he caught some sense of gratification she experienced in finding him as her partner. He took to her in human speech, even though speech meant nothing to a cat when the pincet was not on. It's a damn shame sending a sweet little thing like you whirling around in the coldness of nothing to hunt for rats that are bigger and deadly than all of us put together. You didn't ask for this kind of fight, did you? For answer she licked his hand, purred, 
tickled his cheek with a long fluffy tail, turned around and faced him, golden eyes shining. For a moment they stared at each other, man squatting, cat standing erect on her hind legs, front claws digging into his knee. Human eyes and cat eyes looked across an immensity which no words could meet but which affection spanned in a single glance. Time to get in, he said. She walked docilely into her spheroid carrier. She climbed in. He saw to it that a miniature pincet rested firmly and comfortably against the base of her brain. He made sure that her claws were padded so that she could not tear herself in the excitement of battle. Softly he said to her, Ready? For answer, she preened her back as much as her harness would permit, and purred softly within the confines of the frame that held her. He slapped down the lid and watched the sealant ooze around the seam. For a few hours she was welded into her projectile until a workman with a short cutting arc would remove her after she had done her duty. He picked up the entire projectile and slipped it into the ejection tube. He closed the door of the tube, spun the lock, seated himself in his chair, and put his own pincet on. Once again he flung the switch. He sat in a small room, small, small, warm, warm, the bodies of the other three people moving close around him, the tangible lights in the ceiling bright and heavy against his closed eyelids. As the pincet warmed, the room fell away. The other people ceased to be people, and became small glowing heaps of fire, embers, dark red fire, with the consciousness of life burning like old red coals in a country fireplace. As the pincet warmed a little more, he felt earth just below him, felt the ship slipping away, felt the turning moon as it swung on the far side of the world, felt the planets and the hot clear goodness of the sun, which kept the dragons so far from mankind's native ground. Finally, he reached complete awareness. He was telepathically alive to a range of millions of miles. He felt the dust which he had noticed earlier high above the ecliptic. With a thrill of warmth and tenderness, he felt the consciousness of the Lady May pouring over into his own. Her consciousness was as gentle and clear and yet sharp to the taste of his mind, as if it were scented oil. It felt relaxing and reassuring. He could sense her welcome of him. It was scarcely a thought, just a raw emotion of greeting. At last they were one again. In a tiny remote corner of his mind, as tiny as the smallest toy he had ever seen in his childhood, he was still aware of the room and the ship, and of Father Moon Tree picking up a telephone and speaking to a scanner captain in charge of the ship. His telepathic mind caught the idea long before his ears could frame the words. The actual sound followed the idea, the way the thunder on an ocean beach follows the lightning inward from far out over the seas. The fighting room is ready. Clear to planiform, sir. The play. Underhood was always a little exasperated the way that Lady May experienced things before he did. He was braced for the quick vinegar thriller planiforming, but he caught a report of it before his own nerves could register what happened. Earth had fallen so far away that he groped for several milliseconds before he found the sun in the upper rear right-hand corner of his telepathic mind. That was a good jump, he thought. This way we'll get there in four or five skips. A few hundred miles outside the ship, the Lady May thought back at him. O oh, warm, O oh, generous, O oh, gigantic man, O oh, brave, O oh, friendly, O oh, tender and huge partner, O oh, wonderful with you, with you so good, 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 warm, warm, now to fight, now to go, good with you. He knew that she was not thinking words, that his mind took the clear, amiable babble of her cat intellect, and translated it into images which his own thinking could record and understand. 
neither one of them was absorbed in the game of mutual greetings he reached out far beyond her range of perception to see if there was anything near the ship it was funny how it was possible to do two things at once. He could scan space with his pinset mind, and yet at the same time catch a vagrant thought of hers, a lovely, affectionate thought, about a son who had a golden face and a chest covered with soft, incredibly downy white fur. While he was still searching, he caught the warning from her. We jump again! And so they had. The ship had moved to a second planiform. The stars were different. The sun was immeasurably far behind. Even the nearest stars were barely in contact. This was good dragon country. This open, nasty, hollow kind of space. He reached farther, faster, sensing and looking for danger, ready to fling the Lady May at danger wherever he found it. Terror blazed up in his mind, so sharp, so clear, that it came through as a physical wrench. The little girl named West had found something, something immense, long, sharp, black, greedy, horrific. She flung Captain Wow at it. Underhill tried to keep his own mind clear. Watch out, he shouted telepathically at the others, trying to move the Lady May around. At one corner of the battle, he felt the lustful rage of Captain Wow as the big Persian tomcat detonated lights while he approached the streak of dust which threatened the ship and the people within. The light scored near misses. The dust flattened itself, changing from the shape of a stingray into the shape of a spear. Not three milliseconds had elapsed. Father Moon Tree was talking human words and was saying in a voice that moved like cold molasses out of a heavy jar, Captain. Underhill knew that the sentence was going to be, Captain, move fast. The battle would be fought and finished before Father Moon Tree got through talking. Now, fractions of a second later, the Lady May was directly in line. Here was where the skill and speed of the partners came in. She could react faster than he. She could see the threat as an immense rat coming direct at her. She could fire the light bombs with a discrimination which he might miss. He was connected with her mind. Oh, but he could not follow it. His consciousness absorbed the tearing wound inflicted by the alien enemy. It was like no wound on earth, raw, crazy pain, which started like a burn at his navel. He began to writhe in his chair. Actually, he had not yet had time to move a muscle when the Lady May struck back at the enemy. Five evenly spaced photonuclear bombs blazed out across a hundred thousand miles. The pain in his mind and body banished. He felt a moment of fierce, terrible feral elation running through the mind of the Lady May as she finished her kill. It was always disappointing to the cats to find out that their enemies, whom they sensed as gigantic space rats, disappeared at the moment of destruction. Then he felt her hurt, the pain and the fear that swept over both of them, as the battle quicker than the movement of an eyelid had come and gone. In the same instant there came the sharp and acid twinge of planiform. Once more the ship went skip. He could hear Woodley thinking at him. He didn't have to bother much. This old son of a gun and I will take over for a while. Twice again the twinge, the skip, he had no idea where he was until the lights of the Caledonia spaceboard shone below. With a weariness that lay almost beyond the limits of thought, he threw his mind back into rapport with the tinset, fixing the Lady May's projectile gently and neatly in its launching tube. She was half dead with fatigue, but he could feel the beat of her heart, could listen to her panting, and he gasped. The grateful edge of a thanks reaching from her mind to his. The score. They put him in the hospital at Caledonia. The doctor was friendly but firm. You actually got touched by that dragon. That's as close a shave as I've ever seen. It's also quick that it'll be a long time before we know what happened scientifically. But I suppose you'd be ready for the insane asylum now if the contact had lasted several tenths of a millisecond longer. What kind of cat did you have out in front of you? 
Underhill felt the words coming out of him slowly. Words were such a lot of trouble compared with the speed and the joy of thinking, fast and sharp and clear, mind to mind. But words were all that could reach ordinary people like this doctor. His mouth moved heavily as he articulated words. Don't call our partners cats. The right thing to call them is partners. They fight for us in a team. You ought to know we call them partners, not cats. How is mine? I don't know, said the doctor contritely. We'll find out for you. Meanwhile, old man, you take it easy. There's nothing but rest can help you. Can you make yourself sleep, or would you like us to give you some kind of sedative? I can sleep, said Underhill. I just want to know about the Lady May. The nurse joined in. She was a little antagonistic. Don't you want to know about the other people? They're okay, said Underhill. I knew that before I came in here. He stretched his arms and sighed and grinned at them. He could see they were relaxing and were beginning to treat him as a person instead of a patient. I'm all right, he said. Just let me know when I can go see my partner. A new thought struck him. He looked wildly at the doctor. They didn't send her off with the ship, did they? I'll find out right away, said the doctor. He gave Underhill a reassuring squeeze of the shoulder and left the room. The nurse took a napkin of a goblet of chilled fruit juice. Underhill tried to smile at her. There seemed to be something wrong with the girl. He wished she would go away. First she had started to be friendly, and now she was distant again. It's a nuisance being telepathic, he thought. You keep trying to reach, even when you are not making contact. Suddenly she swung around on him. You pinlighters! You and your damn cats! Just as she stamped out, he burst into her mind. He saw himself a radiant hero, clad in his smooth suede uniform, the pinset crown shining like ancient royal jewels around his head. He saw his own face, handsome and masculine, shining out of her mind. He saw himself very far away, and he saw himself as she hated him. She hated him in the secrecy of her own mind. She she hated him because he was, she thought, proud and strange and rich, better and more beautiful than people like her. He cut off the sight of her mind, and as he buried his face in the pillow, he caught an image of the Lady May. She is a cat, he thought. That's all she is, a cat. But that was not how his mind saw her, quick beyond all dreams of speed, sharp, clever, unbelievably graceful, beautiful, wordless, and undemanding. Where would he ever find a woman who could compare with her? End of the Game of Rat and Dragon by Cordwainer Smith. Chapter 3 Games by Catherine McLean This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard Games by Catherine McLean it is a tough assignment for a child to know where a daydream ends and impossibility begins. Ronnie was playing by himself, which meant he was two tribes of Indians having a war. Bang, he muttered, firing an imaginary rifle. He decided that it was a time in history before the white people had sold the Indians any guns and changed the rifle into a bow. Whiz, thunk he substituted, mimicking from an Indian film on TV the graphic sound of an arrow striking flesh. 
Oof! He folded down onto the grass, moaning, Oh! and relaxing into defeat and death. Want some chocolate milk, Ronnie? asked his mother's voice from the kitchen. No thanks, he called back, climbing to his feet to be another man. Was stuck, was stunk, he added to the flights of arrows as the best archer in the tribe. Last arrow, whiz, he said, missing one enemy for realism. He addressed another battling brave. Who has more arrows? They are coming too close. No time, I'll have to use my knife. He drew the imaginary knife, ducking an arrow as it shot close. Then he was the tribal chief, standing somewhere else, and he saw that the warriors left alive were outnumbered. We must retreat. We cannot leave our tribe without warriors to protect the women. Ronnie decided that the chief was heroically wounded, his voice wavering from weakness. He had been propping himself against a tree to appear unarmed, but now he moved so that his braves could see he was pinned to the trunk by an arrow and could not walk. They cried out. He said, Leave me and escape, but remember. No words came, just the feeling of being what he was, a dying old eagle, a chief of warriors, speaking to young warriors who would need advice of seasoned humor and moderation to carry them through their young battles. He had to finish the sentence, tell them something wise. Ronnie tried harder, pulling the feeling around him like a cloak of resignation and pride, leaning indifferently against the tree where the arrow had pinned him. Hearing dimly in anticipation the sound of his aged voice conquering weakness to speak wisely of what they needed to be told. They had many battles ahead of them, and the battles would be against odds, with so many dead already. They must watch and wait, be flexible and tenacious, determined and persistent, but not too rash, subtle and indirect, not cowardly, and above all, be patient with the triumph of the enemy and not maddened into suicidal direct attack. His stomach hurt with the arrow wound, and his braves waited to hear his words. He had to sum a part of his life's experience in words. Ronnie tried harder to build the scene realistically. Then suddenly it was real. He was the man. He was an old man, guide and adviser in an oblique battle against great odds. He was dying of something, and his stomach hurt with a knotted ache, like hunger, and he was thirsty. He had refused to let the young men make the sacrifice of trying to rescue him. He was hostage in the jail and dying, because he would not surrender to the enemy, nor cease to fight them. He smiled and said, Remember to live like other men, but remember to remember. And then he was saying things that could not be put into words, complex feelings that were ways of taking bad situations that made them easier to smile at, and then sentences that were not sentences, but single alphabet letters pushing each other with signs, with a feeling of being connected like two halves of a swing, one side moving up when the other moved down or like swings, or like cogs and pendulums inside a clock, only without the cogs, just with the push. It wasn't adding or multiplication, and it used letters instead of numbers, but Ronnie knew it was some kind of arithmetic, and he wasn't Ronnie. He was an old man, teaching young men, and the old man did not know about Ronnie. He thought sadly how little he would be able to convey to the young men, and he remembered more, trying to sum long memories and much living into a few direct thoughts. And Ronnie was the old man, and himself, both at once. It was too intense. Part of Ronnie wanted to escape and be alone, and that part withdrew and wanted to play something. Ronnie sat in the grass and played with his toes like a much younger child. Part of Ronnie that was Dr. Revert Purcell 
sat on the edge of a prison cot, concentrating on secret unpublished equations of biogenic stability, which he wanted to pass on to the responsible hands of young researchers in the concealed research chain. He was using the way of thinking which they had told him was the telepathic sending of ideas to anyone ready to receive. It was odd that he himself could never tell when he was sending, probably a matter of age. They had started trying to teach him when he was already too old for anything so different. The water tap, four feet away, was dripping steadily, and it was hard for Purcell to concentrate, so intense was his thirst. He wondered if he could gather strength to walk that far. He was sitting up, and that was good, but the struggle to raise himself that far had left him dizzy and trembling. If he tried to stand, the effort would surely interrupt his transmitting of equations and all the data he had not sent yet. Would the man with the keys who looked in the door twice a day care whether Purcell died with dignity? He was the only audience, and his expression never changed when Purcell asked him to point out to the authorities that he was not being given anything to eat. It was funny to Purcell to find that he wanted the respect of any audience to his dying, even of a man without response, who treated him as if he were already a corpse. Perhaps the man would respond if Purcell said, I have changed my mind, I will tell. But if he said that, he would lose his own respect. At the biochemists and biophysicists' convention, the reporter had asked him if any of his researches could be applied to warfare. He had answered with no feeling of danger, knowing that what he did was common practice among researchmen, sure that it was an unchallengeable right. Some of them can, but those I keep to myself. The reporter remained deadpan. For instance... Well, I have to choose something that won't reveal how it's done now, but, ah, uh, for example, a way of cheaply mass-producing specific antitoxins against any germ. It sounds harmless if you don't think about it, but actually it would make germ warfare the most deadly and inexpensive weapon yet developed, for it would make it possible to prevent the backspread of contagion into a country's own troops, without much expense. There would be hell to pay if anyone ever let that out. Then he added, trying to get the reporter to understand enough to change his cynical, unimpressed expression. You understand, germs are cheap. There would be a new plague to spread every time some pipsqueak biologist mutated a new germ. It isn't even expensive or difficult, as atom bombs are. The headline was, Scientist Refuses to Give Secret of Weapon to Government. Government men came and asked him if this was correct, and on having it confirmed, pointed out that he had an obligation. The research foundations where he had worked were subsidized by government money. He had been deferred from military service during his early years of study and work so he could become a scientist instead of having to fight or die on the battlefield. This might be so, he had said. I am making an attempt to serve mankind by doing as much good and as little damage as possible. If you don't mind, I'd rather use my own judgment about what constitutes service. The statement seemed too blunt the minute he had said it, and he recognized that it had implications that his judgment was superior to that of the government. It probably was the most antagonizing thing that could have been said, but he could see no other possible statement, for it represented precisely what he thought. There were bigger headlines about that interview, and when he stepped outside his building for lunch the next day, several small gangs of patriots arrived with the proclaimed purpose of persuading him to tell. They fought each other for the privilege. The police had rescued him after he had lost several front teeth and had one eye badly gouged.
They then left him to the care of the prison doctor in protective custody. Two days later, after having been questioned several times on his attitude toward revealing the parts of his research he had kept secret, he was transferred to a place that looked like a military jail and left alone. He was not told what his status was. When someone came and asked him questions about his attitude, Purcell felt quite sure that what they were doing to him was illegal. He stated that he was going on a hunger strike until he was allowed to have visitors and see a lawyer. The next time the dinner hour arrived, they gave him nothing to eat. There had been no food in the cell since, and that was probably two weeks ago. He was not sure just how long, for during part of the second week his memory had become garbled. He dimly remembered something that might have been delirium, which could have lasted more than one day. Perhaps the military, who wanted the antitoxins for germ warfare, were waiting quietly for him either to talk or die. Ronnie got up from the grass and went into the kitchen, stumbling in his walk like a beginning toddler. Chuck milk, he said to his mother. She poured him some and teased gently. What's the matter, Ronnie? Back to baby talk? He looked at her with big, solemn eyes and drank slowly, not answering. In the cell somewhere distant, Dr. Purcell, famous biochemist, began waveringly trying to rise to his feet, unable to remember hunger as anything separate from him that could ever be ended, but weakly wanting a glass of water. Ronnie could not feed him with the chocolate milk. Even though this was another himself, the body that was drinking was not the one that was thirsty. He wandered out into the backyard again, carrying the glass. Bang, he said deceptively, pointing with his hand in case his mother was looking. Bang! Everything had to seem usual. He was sure of that. This was too big a thing and too private to tell a grown-up. On the way back from the sink, Dr. Purcell slipped and fell and hit his head against the edge of the iron cot. Ronnie felt the edge gashing through skin and into bone, and then a relaxing blankness inside his head, like falling asleep suddenly when they are telling you a fairy story, while you want to stay awake to find out what happened next. Bang! said Ronnie, vaguely, pointing at a tree. Bang! He was ashamed because he had fallen down in the cell and hurt his head and become just Ronnie again, before he had finished sending out his equations. He tried to make believe he was alive again, but it didn't work. You can never make believe anything to a real good finish. They never ended neatly. There was always something unfinished, and something that would go right on after the end. It would have been nice if the jailers had come in, and he had been able to say something noble to them before dying, to show that he was brave. Bang, he said randomly, pointing his finger at his head, and then jerked his hand away as if it had burned him. He had become the wrong person that time. The feel of a bullet jolting the side of his head was startling and unpleasant even if not real, and the flash of someone's vindictive anger and self-pity while pulling a trigger. My wife will be sorry she ever. He didn't like that kind of make-believe. It felt unsafe to do it without making up a story first. Ronnie decided to be Indian Braves again. They weren't very real, and when they were, they had simple, straightforward emotions about courage and skill and pride and friendship that he would like. A man was leaning his arms on the fence, watching him. Nice day. What's the matter, kid? Are you an esper? Hello. Ronnie stood on one foot and watched him. Just making believe I only want to play. They make it too serious, having all these troubles. Good countryside. The man gestured at the backyards, all opened in together with tangled bushes here and there to crouch behind, when other kids were there to play hide-and-seek, and with trees to climb. It can be the universe if you pick and choose who to be, 
and don't let wrong choices make you shut off from it. You can make yourself learn from this if you are strong enough. Who have you been? Ronnie stood on the other foot and scratched the back of his leg with his toes. He didn't want to remember. He always forgot right away, but this grown-up man was confident and young and strong-looking and meant something when he talked, not like most grown-ups. I was playing Indian. I was an old chief, captured by enemies, trying to pass on to other warriors the wisdom of my life before I died. He made believe he was the chief a little to show the young man what he was talking about. The man drew in his breath between his teeth, and his face paled. He pulled back from reaching Ronnie with his feelings, like holding his breath in. Good game! You can learn it from him. Don't leave him shut off. I beg you. You can let him influence you without being pulled off your own course. He was a good man. You were honored, and I envy the man you will be if you contacted him on resonant similarities. The grown-up looked frightened. But you are too young. You'll block him out and lose him. Kids have to grow and learn at their own speed. Then he looked less afraid, but uncertain, and his thoughts struggled against each other. Their own speed. But there should be someone alive with Purcell's pattern and memories. We loved him. Kids should grow at their own speed. But? How strong are you, Ronnie? Can you move ahead of the normal growth pattern? Grown-ups always want you to do something. Ronnie stared back, clenching his hands and moving his feet uneasily. The thoughts were open to him. Do you want to be the old chief again, Ronnie? Be him often, so you can learn to know what he knew? And feel, as he felt, it would be a stiff dose for a kid. It will be rich and exciting, full of memories and skills, but hard to chew. I'm doing this for Purcell, Ronnie, not for you. You have to make up your own mind. That was a good game. Are you going to play it any more? His mother would not like it. She would feel the difference in him, as much as if he had read one of the books she kept away from him, books that were supposed to be for adults only. The difference would hurt her. He was being bad, like eating between meals. But to know what grown-ups knew? He tightened his fists and looked down at the grass. I'll play it some more. The young man smiled, still pale, and holding half his feelings back behind the dam. Then mesh with me a moment. Let me in. He was in with the thought, feeling Ronnie's confused consent, reassuring him by not thinking or looking around inside while sending out a single call. Purcell, Doc, that found the combination key to Ronnie's guarded yesterday's and last night's and ten minutes ago. A goes. Ronnie, I'll set that door, Purcell's memories, open for you. You can't close it, but feel like this about it. And he planted in a strong set, questioning, cool, open. A feeling of absorbing without words. It will give information when you need it like a dictionary. The grown-up straightened away from the fence, preparing to walk off. Behind a dam pressed grief and anger for the death of the man he called Purcell. And any time you want to be the old chief, at any age he lived, just make believe you are him. Grief and anger pressed more strongly against the dam, and the man turned and left rapidly, letting his thoughts flicker and scatter through private memories that Ronnie did not share, that no one shared, breaking thought contact with everyone so that the man could be alone in his own mind to have his feelings in private. Ronnie picked up the empty glass that had held his chocolate milk from the back steps where he had left it and went inside. As he stepped into the kitchen, he knew what another kitchen had looked like for a five-year-old child who had been Purcell ninety years ago. There had been an iron sink, and a brown and green spotted faucet, and the glass 
had been heavier and transparent, like real glass. Ronnie reached up and put the colored plastic tumbler down. That was a nice young man, dear. What did he say to you? Ronnie looked up at his mamma, comparing her with the remembered mamma of fifty years ago. He loved the other one, too. He told me he's glad I play Indian. End of Games by Catherine McLean The Holes Around Mars This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by George Thomas the Holes Around Mars by Jerome Bixby Science said it could not be, but there it was. And whoosh, look out, here it is again. Spaceship crews should be selected on the basis of their non-irritating qualities as individuals. No chronic complainers, no hypochondriacs, no bugs on cleanliness particularly, no one-man parties, I speak from bitter experience, because on the first expedition to Mars, Hugh Allenby damn near drove us nuts with his puns. We finally got, so we just ignored them. But no one can ignore that classic last one. It is written right into the annals of astronomy, and it's there to stay. Allenby, in command of the expedition, was first to set foot outside the ship. As he stepped down from the airlock of the Mars One, he placed that foot on a convenient rock, caught the toe of his weighted boot in a hole in the rock, wrenched his ankle, and smote the ground with his pants. Sitting there, eyes pained behind the transparent shield of his oxygen mask, he stared at the rock. It was about five feet high, ordinary granite, no special shape, and several inches below its summit, running straight through it, in a northeasterly direction, was a neat, round, four-inch hole. I'm upset by the whole thing, he grunted. The rest of us scrambled out of the ship and gathered around his plump form, only one or two of us winced at his miserable double pun. "'Break anything, Hugh?' asked Burton, our pilot, kneeling beside him. "'Get out of my way, Burton,' said Allenby. "'You're obstructing my view.' Burton blinked. A man constructed of long bones and caution, he angled out of the way, looking around to see what he was obstructing view of." He saw the rock and the round hole through it. He stood very still, staring. So did the rest of us. Well, I'll be damned, said Janice, our photographer. A hole. In a rock, added Gonzales, our botanist. Round, said Randolph, our biologist. An artifact, finished Allenby softly. Burton helped him to his feet. Silently we gathered around the rock. Janice bent down and put an eye to one end of the hole. I bent down and looked through the other end. We squinted at each other. As mineralogist, I was expected to opinionate. Not drilled, I said slowly. Not chipped, not melted, certainly not eroded. I heard a rasping sound by my ear and straightened. Burton was scratching a thumbnail along the rim of the hole. Weathered, he said. Plenty old, but I'll bet it's a perfect circle if we measure. Janice was already fiddling with his camera, testing the cooperation of the tiny distant sun with a light meter. Let us see whether it is or not, Allenby said. Burton brought out a steel tape measure, and the hole was four and three-eighths inches across. It was perfectly circular, 
and about sixteen inches long, and four feet above the ground. But why, said Randolph, why should anyone bore a four-inch tunnel through a rock way out in the middle of the desert? Religious symbol, said Janice. He looked around, one hand on his gun. We'd better keep an eye out. Maybe we've landed on sacred ground or something. A totem hole, perhaps, Allenby suggested. Oh, I don't know, Randolph said to Janice, not Allenby. As I've mentioned, we always ignored Allenby's puns. Note the lack of ornamentation, not at all typical of religious articles. On earth, Gonzales reminded him. Besides, it might be utilitarian, not symbolic. Utilitarian? How? asked Janice. An altar for snakes, Burton said dryly. Well, said Allenby, you can't deny that it has its holy aspects. Get your hand away, will you, Peters? asked Janice. He did. When Janice's camera had clicked, he bent again and peered through the hole. It sights on that low ridge over there, he said. Maybe it's some kind of surveying setup. I'm going to take a look. Careful warned Janice. Remember, it might be sacred. As I walked along, I heard Allenby said, Take some scrapings from inside of the hole, Gonzales. We might be able to determine if anything is kept in it. One of the stumpy, purplish, barrel-type cacti on the ridge had a long vertical bite out of it, as if someone had carefully carved out a narrow U-shaped section from the top down, finishing the bottom of the U in a neat semicircle. It was as flat and clean-cut as the inside surface of a horseshoe magnet. I hollered. The others came running. I pointed. Oh, my God, said Allenby. Another one. The pulp of the cactus in and around the U-hole was dried and dead-looking. Silently, Burton used his tape measure. The hole measured four and three-eighths inches across. It was eleven inches deep, and semicircular bottom was about a foot above the ground. This ridge, he said, is about three feet higher than where we landed the ship. I bet the hole in the rock and the hole in this cactus are on the same level. Gonzales said slowly, this was not done all at once. It's a result of periodic attacks. Look here and here, these overlapping depressions along the outer edges of the hole, he pointed. On this side of the cactus, there are the signs of repeated impact and the scalloped effect on this side, where whatever made the hole emerged, there are juices still flowing not at the point of impact where the plant is desiccated, but below, where the shock was transmitted. A distant shout turned us around. Burton was at the rock beside the ship. He was bending down, his eye to the far side of the mysterious hole. We checked our guns. We put on our oxygen masks. We checked our guns again. We got out of the ship and made damn sure the airlock was locked. An hour later, we crawled inch by painstaking inch up a high sand dune and poked our heads over the top. The Martians were runts, the tallest of them less than five feet tall, and skinny as a pencil. Dried up and brown, they wore loincloths of woven fiber. They stood among the dusty-looking inverted bowl buildings of their village, and every one of them was looking straight up at us with unblinking brown eyes. The six safeties of our six guns clicked off like a rattle of dice. The Martians stood there and gawped. Probably a highly developed sense of hearing in this thin atmosphere, Allenby murmured, heard us coming. They thought that landing of Burton's was an earthquake, Randolph grumbled sourly. 
Marsquake, corrected Janice. One look at the village's scrawny occupants seemed to have convinced him that his life was no longer in danger. Holding the Martians covered, we examined the village from atop the thirty-foot dune. The dome-like buildings were constructed of something that looked like adobe. No windows, probably built with sandstorms in mind. The doors were about halfway up the sloping sides, and from each door a stone ramp wound down around the houses to the ground, again with sandstorms in mind, no doubt, so drifting dunes wouldn't block the entrances. The center of the village was a wide street and a long sandy area some thirty feet wide on either side of it. The houses were scattered at random, as if each Martian had simply hunted for a comfortable place to sit, and then built a house around it. Look, whispered Randolph. One Martian had stepped from a group situated on the far side of the street from us. He started to cross the street, his round brown eyes on us, his small bare feet plodding sand, and we saw that in addition to a loincloth he wore jewelry, a hammered metal ring, a bracelet on one skinny ankle. The sun caught a copperish gleam on his bald, narrow head, and we saw a band of metal there, just above where his eyebrows should have been. The super chief, Allenby murmured, Oh, shaman me! <laughs> As the bejeweled Martian approached the center of the street, he glanced briefly at the ground at his feet. Then he raised his head, stepped with dignity across the exact center of the street, and came on toward us, passing the dusty-looking buildings of his realm and the dusty-looking groups of his subjects. He reached the slope of the dune, and we lay on it, paused, and raised his small hands over his head, palms toward us. I think, Allenby said, that an anthropologist would give odds on that gesture meaning peace. He stood up, holstered his gun, without buttoning the flap, and raised his own hands over his head. We all did. The Martian language consisted of squeaks. We made friendly noises, the chief squeaked, and pretty soon we were the center of a group of wide-eyed Martians, none of whom made a sound. Eventually, one of them dared peep while the chief spoke. Very likely the most articulate Martians simply squeaked themselves into the job, Allenby, of course, said they just squeaked by. He was going through the business of drawing concentric circles in the sand, pointing at the third orbit away from the sun and thumping his chest. The crowd around us kept growing as more Martian emerged from the dome buildings to see what was going on. Down the winding ramps of the buildings on our side of the wide, sandy street they came, and from the buildings on the other side of the street, plodding through the sand, blinking brown eyes at us, not making a sound. Allenby pointed at the third orbit and thumped his chest. The chief squeaked and thumped his own chest and pointed at the copperish band around his head. Then he pointed at Allenby. I seem to have conveyed to him, Allenby said dryly, the fact that I'm chief of our party. Well, let's try again. He started over on the orbits. He didn't seem to be getting any place, so the rest of us watched the Martians instead. A last handful was straggling across the wide street. Curious, said Gonzales. Note what happens when they reach the center of the street. Each Martian, upon reaching the center of the street, glanced at his feet just for a moment, without even breaking stride, and then came on. What can they be looking at, Gonzales wondered. The chief did it, too, Burton mused. Remember when he first came toward us? We all stared intently at the middle of the street. We saw absolutely nothing but sand. 
The Martians milled around us and watched Allenby in his orbits. A Martian child appeared from between two buildings across the street. On six-inch legs, it started across, got halfway, glanced downward, and came on. I don't get it, Burton said. What in the hell are they looking at? The child reached the crowd and squeaked a thin, high note. A number of things happened at once. Several of the members of the group around us glanced down, and along the edge of the crowd nearest the center of the street there was a mild stir as individuals drifted off to either side. Quite casually, nothing at all urgent about it, they just moved concertedly to get farther away from the center of the street, not taking their interested gaze off of us for one second in the process. Even the chief glanced up from Allenby's concentric circles at the child's squeak, and Randolph, who had been fidgeting uncomfortably and paying very little attention to our conversation, decided that he must answer nature's call. He moved off into the dunes surrounding the village, or rather, he started to move. The moment he set off across the wide street, the little Martian chief was in front of him, brown eyes wide, hands out before him as if to thrust Randolph back. Again, six safeties clicked. The Martians didn't even bleak at the sudden appearance of our guns. Probably the only weapon they recognized was a club, or maybe a rock. What can the matter be? Randolph said. He took another step forward. The chief squeaked and stood his ground. Randolph had to stop or bump into him. Randolph stopped. The chief squeaked, looking right into the bore of Randolph's gun. Hold still, Allenby told Randolph, till we know what's up. Allenby made an interrogative sound at the chief. The chief squeaked and pointed at the ground. We looked. He was pointing at his shadow. Randolph stirred uncomfortably. Hold still, Allenby warned him, and again made the questioning sound. The chief pointed up the street, then he pointed down the street. He bent to touch his shadow, thumping it with thin fingers. Then he pointed at the wall of the house nearby. We all looked. Straight lines had been painted on the curved brick-colored wall, up and down and across, to form many small squares of about four inches across. In each square was a bit of squiggly writing, and blackish paint, with a small wooden peg jutting out from the wall. Burton said, Looks like a damn crossword puzzle. Look, said Janice. In the lower right corner, a metal ring hanging from one of the pegs. And that was all he saw on the wall, hundreds of squares with figures in them, a small peg set in each and a ring hanging on one of the pegs. You know what, Allenby said slowly, I think it's a calendar, just a second Thirty squares wide by twenty-two high. That's six hundred and sixty-six. And that bottom line has twenty-six, twenty-seven squares. Six hundred and eighty-seven squares in all. That's how many days there are in a Martian year. He looked thoughtfully at the middle ring. I'll bet that ring is hanging from the peg in the square that represents today. They must move it along every day to keep track. What's a calendar got to do with my crossing the street? Randolph asked in a pained tone. He started to take another step. The chief squeaked as if it were a matter of desperate concern that he make us understand. Randolph stopped again and swore impatiently. Allenby made his questioning sound again. The chief pointed emphatically at his shadow, then at the communal calendar, and we could see now that he was pointing at the metal ring. Burton said slowly, I think he's trying to tell us that this is today, and such and such a time of day. 
I bet he's using his shadow as a sundial. Perhaps, Allen B. grunted. Randolph said, if this monkey doesn't let me go in another minute. (laughs) The chief squeaked, eyes concerned. Stand still, Allen B. ordered. He's trying to warn you of some danger. The chief pointed down the street again, and instead of squealing, revealed that there was another sound at his command. He said, Whoosh! We all stared at the end of the street. Nothing. Just the wide avenue between the houses and the high sand dune down at the end of it, from which we had first looked upon the village. The chief described a large circle with one hand sweeping the hand above his head, down to his knees, and up again, as fast as he could. He pursed his monkey lips and said, Whoosh! and made the circle again. A Martian emerged from the door in the side of the house across the avenue and blinked at the sun, as if he had just awaked. Then he saw what was going on below and blinked again, this time in interest. He made his way down around the winding lamp and started to cross the street. About halfway he paused, eyed the calendar on the house wall, glanced at his shadow, Then he got down on his hands and knees and crawled across the middle of the street. Once past the middle, he rose, walked on the rest of the way to join one of the groups and calmly stared at us, along with the rest of them. They're all crazy, Randolph said disgustedly. I'm going to cross that street. Shut up. So it's a certain time of a certain day, Allen B. mused. And from the way the chief is acting, he's afraid for you to cross the street. And that other one just crawled. By God, do you know what this might tie in with? We were silent for a moment. Then Gonzales said, Of course. And Burton said, The holes. Exactly, said Allenby. Maybe whatever made or makes the holes comes right down the center of the street here. Maybe that's why they built the village this way, to make room for... For what? Randolph asked unhappily, shifting his feet. I don't know, Allenby said. He looked thoughtfully at the chief. That circular motion he made. Could he have been describing something that went around and around the planet? Something like, oh, no, Allenby's eyes glazed. I wouldn't believe it in a million years. His gaze went to the far end of the street, to the high sand dune that rose there. The chief seemed to be waiting for something to happen. I'm going to crawl, Randolph stated. He got to his hands and knees and began to creep across the center of the avenue. The chief let him go. The sand dune at the end of the street suddenly erupted. A forty-foot spout of dust shot straight out of the sloping side, as if a bullet had emerged. Powdered sand hazed the air, yellowed it almost the full length of the avenue. Grains of sand stung the skin and rattled minutely on the houses. Whoosh! Randolph dropped flat on his belly. He didn't have time to continue his trip. He made other arrangements. That night in the ship, while we all sat around still shaking our heads, every once in a while, Allenby talked with Earth. He sat there, wearing his headphones, trying to make himself understood about the god-awful static. An exceedingly small body, he repeated wearily to his unbelieving audience. About four inches in diameter, it travels at a mean distance of four feet above the surface of the planet at a velocity yet to be calculated. Its unique nature results in many hitherto unobserved, I might say even unimagined, phenomena. He stared blankly in front of him for a moment then delivered the understatement of his life. 
The discovery may necessitate a re-examination of many of our basic postulates in the physical sciences. His headphones squawked. Patiently, Alan B. assured Earth he was entirely serious and reiterated the results of his observations. I suppose that he, an astronomer, was twice as flabbergasted as the rest of us. On the other hand, perhaps he was better equipped to adjust to the evidence. Evidently, he said, when the body was formed, it traveled at such fantastic velocity as to enable it to, his voice was almost a whisper, to punch holes in things. The headphone squawked. In rocks, Allenby said, in mountains, in anything that got in its way, and now the holes form a large portion of its fixed orbit. Squawk. Its mass must be on the order of... Squawk. Process of making the hole slow dit, so that now it travels just fast enough. Squawk. Maintain its orbit and penetrate occasional objects such as... Squawk. And sand dunes. Squawk. My God, I know it's a mathematical monstrosity, Allen B. snarled. I didn't put it there, squawk. Allenby was silent for a moment. Then he said slowly, A name, squawk. Hmm, said Allenby. Well, well. He appeared to brighten just a little. So it's up to me as leader of the expedition to name it, squawk. Well, well, he said. That chop-licking tone was in his voice. We'd heard it all too often before. We shuddered, waiting. Inasmuch as Mars' outermost moon is called Deimos, and the next Phobos, he said, I think I shall name the third moon of Mars Bottommos. End of recording. End of the Holes Around Mars. Recorded by George Thomas. Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. September 2015
and spent a lifetime with the long-lived Putnam wives and died, leaving their strange signs, telephone wires, electric lights, water pumps, brass plumbing. Sam Harris came and married Simone, bringing with him an invasion of washer, dryer, toaster, mixer, coffee master, until the current poured through the walls of the house with more vigour than the blood in the old woman's veins. You don't approve of him, Simone said to her grandmother. It's his trade. Cecily Putnam answered, Her men have been carpenters, or farmers, or even schoolmasters, but an engineer. <laughs> Simone was washing the dishes, gazing out across the window sill, where two pink and white murex shells stood, to the tidy garden beyond, when Nina was engaged in her private games. She dried the dishes, by passing her hand once above each plate or glass, bringing it to a dry sparkle. It saved wear on the dish towels, and it amused her. Sam's not home very much, she said in a placating voice, she herself had grown terrified since her marriage that she wouldn't be able to bear the weight of her past. She felt its power on her and couldn't carry it. Cecily had brought her up after her father had disappeared and her mother had died in an unexplained accident. Daily she saw the reflection of her failure in the face of her grandmother, who seemed built of the same seasoned and secure wood, as the old Putnam house. Simone looked at her grandmother, whom she loved, and became a mere vapour. He's not home so much, Simone said. Her face was small, with a pointed chin, and she had golden red hair, which she wore loose on her shoulders. Nina, too, had a small face, but it was neither so pale nor so delicate as her mother's, as if Sam's tougher substance had filled her out and strengthened her bone structure. If it was true that she, Simone, was a weak link, then Sam's strength might have poured into the child, and there would be no more Putnam family in tradition. People don't change that easily, the old woman said. But things, Simone began, the china, which had a history of five generations, slipped out of her hands and smashed. Sam's toaster wouldn't toast or pop up. Simone couldn't even use the telephone for fear of getting a wrong number or no number at all. Things, things, her grandmother cried. It's blood that counts. If the blood is strong enough, things dissolve. They're just garbage. All those things floating on the surface of our history. It's our history that's deep. That's what counts. You're afraid of Sam, the young woman accused. Not afraid of any man, Cecily said, straightening her back. But I'm afraid for the child. Sam has no family tradition, no depth, no talent handed down and perfected, a man with his head full of wheels and wires. Simone loved him. She leaned on him and grew about him, and he supported her tenderly. 
she wasn't going to give him up for the sake of some abstract tradition. It is not abstract, her grandmother said with spirit. It is in your blood. Oh, why don't you sweep the floors the way other women do? The way Sam's mother must. Simone had begun to clean the house while she was thinking, moving her hand horizontally across the floor, at the height of her hip, and the dust was following the motion of her hand, and moving in a small sun-brightened river toward the trash-basket in the kitchen corner. Now Simone raised her hand to her face to look at it, and the river of dust rose like a serpent, and hung a foot below her hand. Yes, she agreed. At least I can clean the house. If I don't touch the good china and look where I'm going. <coughs> the old woman said again, angrily. Don't feel so sorry for yourself. Not for myself, Simone mumbled, and looked again toward the garden, where her daughter was doing something with three stones and a pipe plate full of spring water. I do despair of Nina. "'Cecily said, as she had said before, "'she's four, and has no appearance, not even balance. "'She fell out of the apple-rose tree and couldn't even help herself.' "'Suddenly the old woman thrust her face close to her granddaughter. "'It was smooth, round, and sweet as a young kernel of corn. "'The eyes sunk down under the bushy grey brows were cold and clear grey. "'Simone!' the old woman said. You didn't lie to me. You didn't know she was falling and couldn't get back in time to catch her. A shudder passed through Simone's body. There was no blood in her veins, only water, no marrow in her bones. They were empty and porous as a bird's. Even the roots of her hair were weak, and now the sweat was starting out on her scalp as she faced her grandmother and saw the bristling shapes of seven generations of Putnam women behind her. You lied, the old woman said. You didn't know she was falling. Simone was a vapour, a mere froth blowing away on the first breeze. My poor dear... "'the old woman said in a gentle voice. "'But how could you marry someone like Sam? "'Don't you know what will happen? "'He will dissolve us, our history, our talents, our pride. "'Nina is nothing but an ordinary little child. "'She's a good child,' Simone said.' "'trying not to be angry. "'She wanted her child to be loved, to be strong. "'Nina isn't a common child,' she said, with her head bent. "'She's very bright. "'A man with his head full of wheels, "'who's at home with electricity and wires,' "'the old woman went on. "'We've had them before, but never allowed them to dominate us. "'My own husband was such a man, "'but he was only allowed to make token gestures, "'such as having the power lines put in. "'He never understood how they worked.' "'She lowered her voice to a whisper. "'Your Sam understands. "'I've heard him talk to the water pump.' "'That's why you're afraid of him,' Simone said. "'Not because I am weak and he might take something away from me, "'but because he is strong and he might give us something. "'Then everything would change, and you're afraid of that.' Nina might be a change, she pointed toward the garden. Following the white line of her granddaughter's finger, Cecily looked out into the garden and saw Nina turn toward them as though she knew they were angry. The child pointed with one finger directly at them in the house. There was a sharp crackle, and something of a brilliant and vibrating blue leapt between the outstretched fingers of mother and daughter and flew up like a bird to the power lines above. Mummy, Nina called. Simone's heart nearly broke with wonder and fright. Her grandmother contemptuously passed through the kitchen door and emerged on the step outside, but Simone opened the door and left it open behind her. 
"'What was that?' she asked Nina. "'Was it a bluebird?' "'Don't be silly,' Nina said. "'She picked up the pie-plate and brought it toward them. "'Cecily's face was white and translucent. "'One hand went to her throat as the child approached. "'Brimful of crackling blue fire with a fluctuating heart of yellow, "'the pie-plate came toward them, held between Nina's small, dusty hands. "'Nina grinned at them. "'I stole it out of the wire,' she said.' Simone thought she would faint with a mixture of joy and fear. Put it back, she whispered. Please put it back. Oh, mummy, Nina said, beginning to whine. Not now, not right away. I just got it. I've done it lots of times. The pipe plate crackled and hissed in the steady small hands. Simone could feel the old woman's shocked silence behind her. You mustn't carry it in a pie plate. It is dangerous, Simone said to her child. But she could see Nina was in no danger. How often have you done this? She could feel her skirt and her hair billow with electricity. Lots of times. You don't like it, do you? She became teasing and roguish when she looked most like Sam. Suddenly she threw back her head and opened her mouth, and tilting up the pie plate she drank it empty. Her reddish-gold hair sprang out in crackling rays around her face. Her eyes flashed and sparks flew out between her teeth before she closed her mouth. Nina! The old woman cried and began to crumple, falling slowly against Simone in a complete faint. Simone caught her in trembling hands and lowered her gently. She said to her daughter, You mustn't do that in front of Grandy. "'You are a bad girl. You knew it would scare her.' And to herself she said, "'I must stop babbling. The child knows I'm being silly. "'Oh, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it awful? "'Oh, Sam, how I love you!' "'Daddy said it would scare you,' Nina admitted. "'That's why I never showed you before.' Her hair was falling softly into place again, and she was gazing curiously at her great-grandmother lying on the doorstep. "'It did. "'Scare me,' Simone said. "'I'm not used to it, darling, but don't keep it secret any more. "'Is Grandy asleep?' "'Simone said hastily. "'Oh, yes, she's taking a nap. "'She is old, you know, and likes to take naps. "'That's not a nap,' Nina said, "'leaning over and patting the old woman's cheek. "'I think she's having a bad dream.' Simone carried her grandmother into the house. If that old, tired heart had jumped and floundered like her own, there must be some damage done to it. If anything happened to her grandmother, the world would end, Simone thought, and was furious with Nina, and at the same time full of joy for her. Cecily Putnam opened her eyes widely, and Simone said, "'It does change, you see, but it is in the family.' After all, the old woman sat upright quickly. That wicked child, she exclaimed, to come and threaten us like that, she ought to be spanked. She got up with great strength and rushed out to the garden. Nina, she called imperiously. The child picked up one of the small stones from the pipe plate now full of spring water and came to her great-grandmother. I'll make something for you, Grandy. She said seriously. She put the stone in the palm of her hand and breathed on it, and then held out her hand and offered the diamond. It's lovely. Thank you, the old woman said with dignity, and put her hand on the child's head. Let us go for a walk, and I'll show you how to grow rose apples. That is more becoming to a young lady. You slept on the step. Ah, "'I'm old, and I like to take little naps,' Cecily answered. Simone saw them disappear among the apple-rose trees side by side. She was still trembling, but gradually, as she passed her hand back and forth, and the dust followed, moving in a sparkling river toward the trash-basket, Simone stopped trembling and began to smile with the natural pride of a Putnam woman. The End of the Putnam Tradition by Sonia Dorman
Raiders of the Universes by Donald Wandre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Mashing. Raiders of the Universes by Donald Wandre. Childlike, the great astronomer Phobar stands before the metallic invaders of the ravished solar system. It was in the thirty-fourth century that the Dark Star began its famous conquest, unparalleled in stellar annals. Phobar, the astronomer, discovered it. He was sweeping the heavens with one of the newly invented, multi-powered Susendorf comet hunters when something caught his eye. A new star of great brilliance in the foreground of the constellation Hercules. For the rest of the night he cast aside all his plans and concentrated on the one star. He witnessed an unprecedented event. Mercia's nullifier had just been invented, a curious and intricate device based on four-dimensional geometry that made it possible to see occurrences in the universe which had hitherto required the hundreds of years needed for light to cross the intervening space before they were visible on Earth. By a hasty calculation, with the aid of this invention, Phobar found that the new star was about 3,000 light-years distant, and that it was hurtling backward into space at the rate of 1,200 miles per second. The remarkable feature of his discovery was this appearance of a fourth-magnitude star where none had been known to exist. Perhaps it had come into existence this very night. On the succeeding night he was given a greater surprise— in line with the first star, but several hundred light-years nearer, was a second new star of even more brightness, and it, too, was hurtling backward into space at approximately 1,200 miles per second. Phobar was astonished. Two new stars discovered within 24 hours in the same part of the heavens, both of the fourth magnitude? But his surprise was as nothing when on the succeeding night, even while he watched, a third new star appeared in line with these— but much closer. At midnight he first noticed a pinpoint of faint light. By one o'clock the star was of eighth magnitude. At two it was a brilliant sun of the second magnitude blazing away from earth like the others at a rate of twelve hundred miles per second. And on the next evening, and the next, and the next, other new stars appeared until there were seven in all, every one on a line in the same constellation Hercules, every one with the same radiance and the same proper motion, though of varying size. Phobar had broadcast his discovery to incredulous astronomers, but, as star after star appeared nightly, all the telescopes on Earth were turned toward one of the most spectacular cataclysms that history recorded. Far out in the depths of space, with unheard of regularity and unheard of precision, new worlds were flaming up overnight in a line that began at Hercules and extended toward the solar system. Phobar's announcement was immediately flashed to Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the other members of the Five World Federation. Saturn reported no evidence of the phenomena because of the interfering rings and lack of Mercia's nullifier. But Jupiter, with a similar device, witnessed the phenomena and announced furthermore that many stars in the neighborhood of the Novae had begun to deviate in singular and abrupt fashion from their normal positions. There was not as yet much popular interest in the phenomena. Without Mercia's nullifier, the stars were not visible to ordinary eyes, since the light rays would take years to reach the Earth. But every astronomer who had access to Mercia's nullifier hastened to focus his telescope on the region where extraordinary events were taking place out in the unfathomable gulf of night. Some terrific force was at work, creating worlds and disturbing the positions of stars within a radius already known to extend billions and trillions of miles from the path of the seven new stars. But of the nature of that force, astronomers could only guess. Phobar took up his duties early on the eighth night. The last star had appeared about five hundred light-years distant. If an eighth new star was found, it should be not more than a few light-years away. But nothing happened. All night Phobar kept his telescope pointed at the probable spot, but search as he might, the heavens showed nothing new. In the morning he sought eagerly for news of any discovery made by fellow watchers, but they too had found nothing unusual. Could it be that the mystery would now fade away, a new riddle of the skies? The next evening he took up his position once more. 
training his telescope on the seven bright stars, and then on the region where an eighth, if there were one, should appear. For hours he searched the abyss in vain. He could find none. Apparently the phenomena were ended. At midnight he took a last glance before entering on some tedious calculations. It was there. In the center of the telescope a faint, hazy object steadily grew in brightness. All his problems were forgotten as Fobar watched the eighth star increase hourly. Closer than any other, closer even than Alpha Centauri, the new sun appeared, scarcely three light-years away, across the void surrounding the solar system. And all the while he watched, he witnessed a thing no man had ever before seen, the birth of a world. By one o'clock the new star was of fifth magnitude, by two it was of the first. As the faint flush of dawn began to come toward the close of that frosty, moonless November night, the new star was a great white-hot object more brilliant than any other star in the heavens. Phobar knew that when its light finally reached Earth so that ordinary eyes could see, it would be the most beautiful object in the night sky. What was the reason for these unparalleled births of worlds and the terrifying mathematical precision that characterized them? Whatever the cosmic force behind, it was progressing toward the solar system. Perhaps it would even disturb the balance of the planets. The possible chance of such an event had already called the attention of some astronomers. But the whole phenomenon was too inexplicable to permit more than speculation. The next evening was cloudy. Jupiter reported nothing new except that Neptune had deviated from its course and tended to pursue an erratic and puzzling new orbit. Phobar pondered long over this last news item and turned his attention to the outermost planet on the succeeding night. To his surprise, he had great difficulty in locating it. The ephemeris was of absolutely no use. When he did locate Neptune after a brief search, he discovered it more than eighty million miles from its scheduled place. This was at 1.40. At 2.10, he was thunderstruck by a special announcement sent from the Central Bureau to every observatory and astronomer of note throughout the world, proclaiming the discovery of an ultra-Plutonian planet. Phobar was incredulous. For centuries it had been proved that no planet beyond Pluto could possibly exist. With feverish haste, Phobar ran to the huge telescope and rapidly focused it where the new planet should be. Five hundred million miles beyond Neptune was a flaming path like the beam of a giant searchlight that extended exactly to the eighth solar planet. Phobar gasped. He could hardly credit the testimony of his eyes. He looked more closely. The great stream of flame still crossed his line of vision, but this time he saw something else. At the precise farther end of the flame path, a round disk, dark. Beyond a doubt, a new planet of vast size now formed an addition to the solar group, but that planet was almost impervious to the illuminating rays of the sun and was barely discernible. Neptune itself shone brighter than it ever had, and was falling away from the sun at a rate of twelve hundred miles per second. All night Phobar watched the double mystery. By three o'clock he was convinced as far as lightning calculations showed, that the invader was hurtling toward the sun at a speed of more than ten million miles an hour. At 3.15, he thought that vanishing Neptune seemed brighter even than the band of fire running to the invader. At four, his belief was certainty. With amazement and awe, Phobar sat through the long, cold night, watching a spectacular and terrible catastrophe in the sky. As dawn began to break and the stars grew paler, Phobar turned away from his telescope, his brain a whirl, his heart filled with a great fear. He had witnessed the devastation of a world, the ruin of a member of his own planetary system by an invader from outer space. As dawn cut short his observations, he knew at last the cause of Neptune's brightness, knew that it was now a white-hot flaming sun that sped with increased rapidity away from the solar system. Somehow the terrible swath of fire that flowed from the dark star to Neptune had wrenched it out of its orbit and made of it a molten inferno. At dawn came another bulletin from the Central Bureau. Neptune had a surface temperature of 3,000 degrees centigrade, was defying all laws of celestial mechanics, and within three days would have left the solar system forever. The results of such a disaster were unpredictable. The entire solar system was likely to break up. Already Uranus and Jupiter had deviated from their orbits. 
Unless something speedily occurred to check the onrush of the Dark Star, it was prophesied that the laws governing the planetary system would run to a new balance, and that in the ensuing chaos the whole group would spread apart and fall toward the gulfs beyond the great surrounding void. What was the nature of the great path of fire? What force did it represent? And was the Dark Star controlled by intelligence, or was it a blind wanderer from space that had come by accident? The flame path alone implied that the Dark Star was guided by an intelligence that possessed the secret of inconceivable power. Menace hung in the sky now, where all eyes could see in a great arc of fire. The world was on the brink of eternity, and vast forces at whose nature men could only guess were sweeping planets and suns out of its path. The following night was again cold and clear. High in the heavens, where Neptune should have been, hung a disk of enormously greater size. Neptune itself was almost invisible, hundreds of millions of miles beyond its scheduled position. As nearly as Phobar could estimate, not one hundredth of the sun's rays were reflected from the surface of the dark star, a proportion far below those for the other planets. Phobar had a better view of the flame path, and it was with growing awe that he watched that strange swath in the sky during the dead of night. It shot out from the dark star like a colossal beam or huge pillar of fire seeking a food of worlds. With a shiver of cold fear, he saw that there were now three of the bands, one toward Neptune, one toward Saturn, and one toward the sun. The first was fading, a milky, misty white. The second shone almost as bright as the first one previously had, and the third, toward the sun, was a dazzling stream of orange radiance, burning with a steady, terrible, unbelievable intensity across two and a half billions of miles of space. That gigantic flare was the most brilliant sight in the whole night sky, an awful and abysmally prophetic flame that made city streets black with staring people, a radiance whose grandeur and terrific implications of cosmic power brought beauty and the fear of doom into the heavens. Those paths could not be explained by all the physicists and all the astronomers in the Five World Federation. They possessed the properties of light, but they were rigid bands like a tube or a solid pillar from which only the faintest of rays escaped, and they completely shut off the heavens behind them. They had, moreover, singular properties which could not be described, as if a new force were embodied in them. Hour after hour, humanity watched the spectacular progress of the Dark Star, watched those mysteries and threatening paths of light that flowed from the invader. When dawn came, it brought only a great fear and the oppression of impending disaster. In the early morning, Phobar slept. When he awoke, he felt refreshed and decided to take a short walk in the familiar and peaceful light of day. He never took that walk. He opened the door in a kind of dim and reddish twilight. Not a cloud hung in the sky, but the sun shone feebly with a dull red glow, and the skies were dull and somber, as if the sun were dying as scientists had predicted it eventually would. Phobar stared at the dull heavens in a daze, at the foreboding atmosphere and the livid sun that burned faintly as through a smoke curtain. Then the truth flashed on him. It was the terrible path of fire from the Dark Star— by what means he could not guess, by what appalling control of immense and inconceivable forces he could not even imagine, the dark star was sucking light, and perhaps more than light, from the sun. Phobar turned and shut the door. The world had seen its last dawn. If the purpose of the dark star was destruction, none of the planets could offer much opposition, for no weapon of theirs was effective beyond a few thousand miles range at most, and the dark star could span millions. If the invader passed on, its havoc would be only a trifle smaller, for it had already destroyed two members of the solar system and was now striking at its most vital part. Without the sun, life would die. But even with the sun, the planets must rearrange themselves because of the destruction of balance. Even he could hardly grasp the vast and abysmal catastrophe that, without warning, had swept from space. How could the dark star have traversed three thousand light-years of space in a week's time? It was unthinkable. So stupendous a control of power. So gigantic a manipulation of cosmic forces. 
so annihilating a possession of the greatest secrets of the universe was an unheard of concentration of energy and knowledge of stellar mechanics but the evidence of his own eyes and the path of the dark star with flaming suns to mark its progress told him in language which could not be refuted that the dark star possessed all that immeasurable titanic knowledge it was the lord of the universe there was nothing which the dark star could not crush or conquer or change the thought of that immense supreme power numbed his mind it opened vistas of a civilization and a progress and an unparalleled mastery of all knowledge which was almost beyond conception already the news had raced across the world on phobar's television screen flashed scenes of nightmare the radio spewed a gibberish of terror in one day panic had swept the earth on the remaining members of the five world federation the same story was repeated rioting mobs drowned out the chant of religious fanatics who hailed judgment day great fires turned the air murky and flame shot machine guns spat regularly into city streets looting murder and fear crazed crimes were universal civilization had completely vanished overnight the tides roared higher than they ever had before for every thousand people drowned on the american seaboards a hundred thousand perished in china and india dead volcanoes boomed into the worst eruptions known half of japan sank during the most violent earthquake in history land rocked the seas boiled cyclones howled out of the skies a billion eyes focused on mecca the mad beating of tom-toms rolled across all africa women and children were trampled to death by the crowds that jammed into churches has man lived in vain asked the philosopher the world is doomed there is no escape said the scientist the day of reckoning has come the wrath of god is upon us shouted the street preachers in a daze phobar switched off the bedlam and walking like a man asleep strode out he did not care where if only to get away the ground and the sky were like a dying fire the sun seemed a half-dead cinder only the great swath of radiance between the sun and the dark star had any brilliance sinister menacing now larger even than the sun the invader from beyond hung in the heavens as phobar watched it the air around him prickled strangely a sixth sense gave warning he turned to race back into his house his legs failed a fantastic orange light bathed him countless needles of pain shot through his whole body the world darkened earth had somehow been blotted out there was a brief blackness the nausea of space and of a great fall that compressed eternity into a moment then a swimming confusion and outlines which gradually came to rest phobar was too utterly amazed to cry out or run he stood inside the most titanic edifice he could have imagined a single gigantic structure vaster than all new york city far overhead swept a black roof fading into the horizon beneath his feet was the same metal substance in the midst of this giant work soared the base of a tower that pierced the roof thousands of feet above everywhere loomed machines enormous dynamos cathode tubes a hundred feet long masses and mountains of such fantastic apparatus as he had never encountered the air was bluish electric from the black substance came a phosphorescent radiance the triumphant drone of motors and a terrific crackle of electricity were everywhere off to his right purple-blue flames the size of sequoia trees flickered around a group of what looked like condensers as huge as gibraltar at the base of the central tower half a mile distant phobar could see something that resembled a great switchboard studded with silver controls near it was a series of mechanisms at whose purpose he could not even guess all this his astounded eyes took in at one confused glance the thing that gave him unreasoning terror was the hundred-foot-high metal monster before him it defied description it was unlike any color known on earth a blinding color sinister with power and evil its shape was equally ambiguous it rippled like quicksilver now compact now spread out in a thousand limbs but what appalled phobar was its definite possession of rational life more its very thoughts were transmitted to him as clearly as though written in his own english follow me phobar's mind did not function but his legs moved regularly 
In the grasp of this mental metal monster, he was a mere automaton. Fobar noticed idly that he had to step down from a flat disk a dozen yards across. By some power, some tremendous discovery that he could not understand, he had been transported across millions of miles of space, undoubtedly to the Dark Star itself. The colossal thing, indescribable, a blinding, nameless color, rippled down the hall and stood before a disk of silvery black. In the center of the disk was a metal seat with a control board nearby. Be seated. Fobar sat down. The Titan flicked the controls, and nothing happened. Fobar sensed that something was radically wrong. He felt the surprise of his gigantic companion. He did not know it then, but the fate of the solar system hung on that incident. Come. Abruptly, the giant stooped, and Fobar shrank back, but a flowing mass of cold, insensate metal swept around him, lifted him fifty feet in the air. Dizzy, sick, horrified, he was hardly conscious of the whirlwind motion into which the giant suddenly shot. He had a dim impression of machines racing by, of countless other giants, of a sudden opening in the walls of the immense building, and then a rush across the surface of metal land. Even in his vertigo he had enough curiosity to marvel that there was no vegetation, no water, only the dull black metal everywhere, yet there was air. And then a city loomed before them. To Fobar it seemed a city of gods or giants. Fully five miles it soared toward space, its fantastic angles and arcs and cubes and pyramids mazing in the dimensions of a totally alien geometry. Tier by tier the stupendous city, hundreds of miles wide, mounted toward a central tower like the one in the building he had left. Fobar never knew how they got there, but his numbed mind was at last forced into clarity by a greater will. He stared about him. His captor had gone. He stood in a huge chamber circling to a dome far overhead. Before him, on a dais a full thousand feet in diameter, stood, sat, rested, whatever it might be called, another monster, far larger than any he had yet seen, like a mountain of pliant thinking, living metal. And Fobar knew he stood in the presence of the ruler. The metal cyclopses surveyed him as Fobar might have surveyed an ant. Cold, deadly, dispassionate scrutiny came from something that might have been eyes, or a seeing intelligence locked in a metal body. There was no sound, but inwardly to Fobar's consciousness from the peak of the titan far above him came a command. What are you called? Fobar opened his lips, but even before he spoke he knew that the thing had understood his thought. Fobar. I am Garborig, ruler of Zlarbti, the lord of the universes. Lord of the Universes? I and my world come from one of the universes beyond the reach of your telescopes. Fobar somehow felt that the thing was talking to him as he would to a newborn babe. What do you want of me? Tell your Earth that I want the entire supply of your radium ores mined and placed above ground according to the instructions I give by seven of your days hence. A dozen questions sprang to Fobar's lips. He felt again that he was being treated like a child. Why do you want our radium ores? Because they are the rarest of the elements on your scale, are absent on ours, and supply us with some of the tremendous energy we need. Why don't you obtain the ores from other worlds? We do. We are taking them from all worlds where they exist, but we need yours also. Raiders of the universe? Looting young worlds of the precious radium ores, piracy on a cosmic scale. And if Earth refuses your demand? For answer, Gaborij rippled to a wall of the room and pressed a button. The wall dissolved weirdly, mysteriously. A series of vast silver plates was revealed, and a battery of control levers. This will happen to all of your Earth unless the ores are given to us. The Titan closed a switch. On the first screen flashed the picture of a huge tower such as Fobar had seen in the metal city. Gaborej adjusted a second control lever that was something like a rangefinder. He pressed a third lever, and from the tower leaped a surge of terrific energy. Like a bolt of lightning a quarter of a mile broad, the giant closed another switch, and on the second plate flashed a picture of New York City. Then, waiting. Seconds, minutes drifted by. The atmosphere became tense, nerve-cracking. Fobar's eyes ached with the intensity of his stare. 
what would happen. Abruptly it came. A monstrous bolt of energy streaked from the skies. Purple-blue death in a pillar a fourth of a mile broad crashed into the heart of New York City, swept up and down Manhattan, across and back, and suddenly vanished. In fifteen seconds, only a molten hell of fused structures and incinerated millions of human beings remained of the world's first city. Phobar was crushed, appalled, then utter loathing for this soulless thing poured through him, if only. It is useless. You can do nothing, answered the ruler, as though it had grasped his thought. But why? If you could pick me off of the earth, do you not draw the radium ores in the same way? Phobar demanded. The orange ray picks up only loose, portable objects. We can and will transport the radium ores here by means of the ray after they have been mined and placed on platforms or disks. Why did you select me from all the millions of people on Earth? Solely because you were the first apparent scientist whom our Cosmotel chanced upon. It will be up to you to notify your Earth governments of our demand. But afterwards, Phobar burst out loud, what then? We will depart. It will mean death to us. The solar system will be wrecked with Neptune gone and Saturn following it. Gaborej made no answer. To that impassive, cold, inhuman thing, it did not matter if a nation or a whole world perished. Phobar had already seen with what deliberate calm it destroyed a city, merely to show him what power the lords of Zlarbti controlled. Besides, what guarantee was there that the invaders would not loot the earth of everything they wanted and then annihilate all life upon it before they departed? Yet Phobar knew he was helpless, knew that the men of earth would be forced to do whatever was asked of them, and trust that the raiders would fulfill their promise. Two hours remain for your stay here, came the ruler's dictum to interrupt his line of thought. For the first half of that period you will tell me of your world and answer whatever questions I may ask. During the rest of the interval I will explain some of the things you wish to learn about us. Again Phobar felt Gaborish's disdain, knew that the metal giant regarded him as a kind of childish plaything for an hour or two's amusement, but he had no choice, and so he told Gaborish of the life on earth, how it arose and along what lines it had developed, he narrated in brief the extent of man's knowledge, his scientific achievements, his mastery of weapons and forces and machines, his social organization. When he had finished, he felt as a Stone Age man might feel in the presence of a brilliant scientist of the 34th century. If any sign of interest had shown on the peak of the metallic lord, Phobar failed to see it. But he sensed an intolerant sneer of ridicule in Gaborish as though the ruler considered these statements to be only the most elementary of facts. Then, for three quarters of an hour, in the manner of one lecturing an ignorant pupil, the giant crowded its thought pictures into Phobar's mind, so that finally he understood a little of the raiders and of the sudden terror that had flamed from the abysses into the solar system. The universe of matter that you know is only one of countless universes which comprise the cosmos, began Gaborej. In your universe you have a scale of ninety-two elements. You have your color spectrum, your rays and waves of many kinds. You were subject to definite laws controlling matter and energy as you know them. But we are of a different universe, on a different scale from yours, a trillion light-years away in space, eons distant in time. The natural laws which govern us differ from those controlling you. In our universe, you would be hopelessly lost, completely helpless, unless you possessed the knowledge that your people will not attain even in millions of years. But we, who are so much older and greater than you— have for so long studied the nature of the other universes that we can enter and leave them at will, taking what we wish, doing as we wish, creating or destroying worlds whenever the need arises, coming and hurtling away when we choose. There is no vegetable life in our universe. There is only the scale of elements ranging from 842 to 966 on the extension of your own scale. At this high range, metals of complex kinds exist. There is none of what you call water, no vegetable world, no animal kingdom. Instead, there are energies, forces, rays, and waves, which are food to us and which nourish our life stream, just as pigs, potatoes, and bread are food to you. 
trillions of years ago in your time calculation, but only a few dozen centuries ago in ours, life arose on the giant world Kijptan, in our universe. It was life, our life, the life of my people and myself, intelligence animating bodies of pliant metal, existing almost endlessly on an almost inexhaustible source of energy. But all matter wears down. On Kijptan, there was a variety of useful metals, others that were valueless. There was comparatively little of the first, much of the second. Kijptan itself was a world as large as your entire solar system, with a diameter roughly of four billion miles. Our ancestors knew that Kijptan was dying, that the store of our most precious element, Slytherin, was dwindling. But already our ancestors had mastered the forces of our universe, had made inventions that are beyond your understanding, had explored the limits of our universe in space cars that were propelled by the free energies in space and by the attracting, repelling influences of stars. The metal inhabitants of Kibshtan employed every invention they knew to accomplish an engineering miracle that makes your bridges and mines seem but the puny efforts of a gnat. They blasted all the remaining ores of Slethera from the surface and the interior of Kripshtan and refined them. Then they created a gigantic vacuum, a dead field in space a hundred million miles away from their world. The dead field was controlled from Kripshtan by atomic projectors, energy absorbers, gravitation nullifiers, and cosmotels, range regulators, and a host of other inventions. As fast as it was mined and extracted, the Slethera metal was vaporized, shot into the dead field by interstellar rays, and solidified there along an invisible framework which we projected. In a decade of our time, we had pillaged Kripshtan of every particle of Slethera. And then in our skies hung an artificial world, a manufactured sphere, a giant new planet, the world you yourself are now on, Zlabarti. We did not create a solid globe. We left chambers, tunnels, passageways, storerooms throughout it, or piercing it from surface to surface. Thus, even as Labarti was being created, we provided for everything that we needed or could need, experimental laboratories, subsurface vaults, chambers for the innumerable huge ray dynamos, energy storage batteries, and other apparatus which we required. And when all was ready, we transferred by space car and by atomic individualization all our necessities from Krishtan to the artificial world, Zlobarti. And when everything was prepared, we destroyed the dead field by duplicate control from Zlobarti, turned our repulsion power on full against the now useless and dying giant world of Krishtan, and swung upon our path. But our whole universe is incredibly old. It was mature before ever your young suns flamed out of the gaseous nebulae. It was decaying when your molten planets were flung from the central sun. It was dying before the boiling seas had given birth to land upon your sphere. And while we had enough of our own particular electrical food to last us for a million of your years, and enough power to guide Zlabarti to other universes, we had exhausted all the remaining energy of our entire universe. And when we finally left it to dwindle behind us in the black abysses of space, we left it a dead cinder, devoid of life, vitiated of activity, and utterly lacking in cosmic forces, a universe finally run down. The universes, as you may know, are set off from each other by totally black and empty abysms, expanses so vast that light rays have not yet crossed many of them. How did we accomplish the feat of traversing such a gulf? by the simplest of means, acceleration. Why? Because to remain in our universe meant inevitable death. We gambled on the greatest adventure in all the cosmos. To begin with, we circled our universe to the remotest point opposite where we wanted to leave it. We then turned our attraction powers on part way so that the millions of stars before us drew us ahead. Then we gradually stepped up the power to its full strength, thus ever increasing our speed. At the same time, as stars passed to our rear in our flight, we turned our repulsion rays against them, stepping that power up also. Our initial speed was 24 miles per second. Midday in our universe, we had reached the speed of your light, 186,000 miles per second. 
By the time we left our universe, we were hurtling at a speed which we estimated to be 1.6 billion miles per second. Yet even at that tremendous speed, it took us years to cross from our universe to yours. If we had encountered even a planetoid at that enormous rate, we would probably have been annihilated in white-hot death. But we had planned well, and there are no superiors to our stellar mechanics, our astronomers, our scientists. When we finally hurtled from the black void into your universe, we found what we had only dared hope for, a young universe with many planets and cooling worlds rich in radium ores, the only element in your scale that can help to replenish our vanishing energy. Half your universe we have already deprived of its ores. Your Earth has more that we want. Then we shall continue on our way to loot the rest of the worlds before passing on to another universe. We are a planet without a universe. We will wander and pillage until we find a universe like the one we come from, or until Zlabarti itself disintegrates and we perish. We could easily wipe out all the dwellers on Earth and mine the ores ourselves, but that would be a needless waste of our powers. For since you cannot defy us, and since the desire for life burns as high in you as in us, and as it does in all sensate things in all universes, your people will save themselves from death and save us from wasting energy by mining the ores for us. What happens afterwards, we do not care. The seven new suns that you saw were dead worlds that we used as buffers to slow down Zlobarty, the full strength of our repulsion force directed against any single world necessarily turns it into a liquid or gaseous state depending on various factors. Your planet Neptune was pulled out of the solar system by the attraction of Zlobarty's mass. The flame paths, as you call them, are directed streams of energy for different purposes. The one to the sun supplies us, for instance, with heat, light, and electricity, which in turn are stored for eventual use. The orange ray that you felt is one of our achievements. It is similar to the double-action pumps used in some of your sulfur mines, whereby a pipe is enclosed in a larger pipe, and hot water forced down through the larger tubing returns sulfur-laden through the central pipe. The orange ray instantaneously dissolves any portable object up to a certain size, propels it back to Zlobarty through its center, which is the reverse ray, and here reforms the object just as you were recreated on the disk that you stood on when you regained consciousness. But I have not enough time to explain everything on Zlobarty to you, nor would you comprehend it all if I did. Your stay is almost up. In that one control panel lies all the power that we have mastered, boasted Gaborej with supreme egotism. It connects with the individual controls throughout Zlobarty. What is the purpose of some of the levers? asked Fobar, with a desperate hope in his thoughts. A filament of metal whipped to the panel from the Lord of Zlobarty. This first section duplicates the control panel that you saw in the laboratory where you opened your eyes. Do not think that you can make use of this information. In ten minutes you will be back on your earth to deliver our command. Between now and that moment you will be so closely watched that you can do nothing and will have no opportunity to try. This first lever controls the attraction rays. The second, the repulsion force. The third dial regulates the orange ray by which you will be returned to Earth. The fourth switch directs the electrical bolt that destroyed New York City. Next, it is a device that we have never had occasion to use. It releases the Krangor wave throughout Zlobardi. Its effect is to make each atom of Zlobardi, the Slethera metal, and everything on it become compact. To do away with the empty spaces that exist in every atom. Theoretically, it would reduce Zlobardi to a fraction of its present size diminish its mass while its weight and gravity remained as before. The next lever controls matter to be transported between here and the first laboratory, somewhat like the orange ray. It disintegrates the object and reassembles it here. So that's what Phobar's captor had been trying to do with him back there in the laboratory. Why was I not brought here by that means? burst out Phobar. Because you belong to a different universe, answered Gaborej. Without experimentation, we cannot tell what natural laws of ours you would not be subject to, but this is one of them. A gesture of irritation seemed to come from him. Some laws hold good in all the universes we have thus far investigated. 
The orange ray, for instance, picked you up as it would have plucked one of us from the surface of Kipshtan. But on Slobardi, which is composed entirely of Slethera, your atomic nature and physical constitution are so different from ours that they were unaffected by the energy that ordinarily transports objects here. Thus the metal nightmare went rapidly over the control panel. At length, Fobar's captor, or another thing like him, re-entered when Garborej flicked a strange-looking protuberance on the panel. You will now be returned to your world, came the thought of Garborej. We shall watch you through our cosmotel to see that you deliver our instructions. Unless the nations of Earth obey us, they will be obliterated at the end of seven days. A wild impulse to smash that impassive, metallic monster passed from Fobar as quickly as it came. He was helpless. Sick and despairing, he felt the cold, baffling colored metal close around him again. Once more he was borne aloft for the journey to the laboratory, from there to be propelled back to Earth. Seven days of grace, but Fobar knew that less than ten minutes remained to him. Only here could he possibly accomplish anything. Once off the surface of Zlobardi, there was not the remotest chance that all the nations of Earth could reach the invaders, or even attempt to defy them. Yet what could he alone do in a week, to say nothing of ten minutes? He sensed the amused, supercilious contempt of his captor. That was really the greatest obstacle, this ability of theirs to read thought pictures, and already he had given them enough word pictures of English so that they could understand. In the back of Fobar's mind, the ghost of a desperate thought suddenly came. What was it he had learned years ago in college? Homer... The Odyssey. Plutarch. From rusty, disused corners of memory crept forth the half-forgotten words. He bent all his efforts to the task, not daring to think ahead or plan ahead or visualize anything but the Greek words. He felt the bewilderment of his captor. To throw it off the track, Fobar suddenly let an ancient English nursery rhyme slip into his thoughts. The disgust that emanated from his captor was laughable. Fobar could have shouted aloud, but the Greek words... Already the pair had left the mountain-high Titan city far behind. They rippled across the smooth, black surface of Zlobardi, and bore like rifle bullets down on the swiftly looming laboratory. In a few minutes it would be too late forever. Now the lost Greek words burst into Fobar's mind, and, hoping against hope, he thought in Greek word pictures which his captor could not understand. He weighed chances, long shots. Into his brain flashed an idea, but they were upon the laboratory. A stupendous door dissolved weirdly into shimmering haze. They sped through. Fobar's hand clutched a bulge in his pocket. Would it work? How could it? They were beyond the door now and racing across the great expanse of the floor, past the central tower, past the control panel which he had first seen. And as if by magic, there leaped into Fobar's mind a clear-cut, vivid picture of violent oceans of energy crackling and streaking from the heavens to crash through the laboratory roof and barely miss striking his captor behind. Even as Fobar created the image of that terrific death, his captor whirled around in a lightning movement, a long arm of metal flicking outward at the same instant to drop Fobar to the ground. Like a flash, Fobar was on his feet, his hand whipped from his pocket, and with all his strength he flung a gleaming object straight toward the fifth lever on the control panel a dozen yards away. As a clumsy arrow would, his oversized bunch of keys twisted to their mark, clanked, and spread against the fifth control, which was the size regulator. As rapidly as Fobar's captor had spun around, it reversed again, having guessed the trick. A tentacle of pliant metal snaked toward Fobar like a streak of flame. But in those few seconds a terrific holocaust had taken place. As Fobar's keys spattered against the fifth lever, there came an immediate, growing, strange, high whine, and a sickening collapse of the very surface beneath them. Everywhere outlines of objects wavered, changed, melted, shrank with a steady and nauseatingly swift motion. The roof of the laboratory high overhead plunged downward, the far distant wall swept inward, contracted, and the metal monsters themselves dwindled as though they were vast rubber figures from which air was hissing. Fobar sprang back as the tentacle whipped after him. Only that jump and the sudden dwarfing dimensions of the giant saved him and even in that instant of wild action Fobar shouted aloud, for this whole world was collapsing, together with everything on it, except he himself, who came of a different universe and remained unaffected. It was the long shot he had gambled on, the one chance he had to strike a blow. All over the shrinking laboratory the monsters were rushing toward him. His dwindling captor flung another tentacle toward the control panel to replace the size-regulating lever. 
but Fobar had anticipated that possibility and had already leaped to the switchboard, sweeping a heavy bar from its place and crashing it down on the lever so that it could not be replaced without being repaired. Almost in the same move he had bounded away again, the former hundred-foot giant now scarcely more than his own height. But throughout the laboratory the other metal things had halted in their tasks and were racing onward. Fobar always remembered that battle in the laboratory as a scene from some horrible nightmare. The catastrophe came so rapidly that he could hardly follow the whirlwind events. The half-dozen great leaps he made from the lashing tentacles of his pursuer sufficed to give him a few seconds' respite, and then the weird, howling sound of the tortured world swelled to a piercing wail. His lungs were laboring from the violence of his exertions. Again and again he barely escaped from the curling whips of metal tentacles, and now the monster was hardly a foot high. The high condensers and tubes and colossal machinery were like those of a pygmy laboratory, and overhead the roof plunged ever downward. But Fobar was cornered at last. He stood in the center of a circle of the foot-high things. His captors suddenly shot forth a dozen rope-like arms toward him as the others closed in. He had not even a weapon, for he had dropped the bar in his first mad bound away from the control panel. He saw himself trapped in his own trick— for in minutes at the most the laboratory would be crushing him with fearful force. Blindly, Fobar reverted to a primitive defense in this moment of infinite danger and kicked with all his strength at the squat monster before him. The thing tried to whirl aside, but Fobar's shoe squashed thickly through, and in a disorder of quivering pieces the metal creature fell and subsided. Knowing at last that the invaders were vulnerable and how they could be killed, Fobar went leaping and stamping on those nearest him. Underfoot they disintegrated into little pulpy lumps of inert metal. The laboratory roof was only a foot over his head. He whirled around, squashed a dozen tiny creeping things, leaped to a disc that was now not more than a few inches broad. Stooping low, balancing himself precariously, he somehow managed to close the tiny switch. A haze of orange light enveloped him. There came a great vertigo and dizziness and pain. He felt himself falling through bottomless spaces. So exhausted that he could scarcely move, Fobar blinked his eyes open to brilliant daylight in the chill of a November Indian summer noon. The sun shone radiant in the heavens. Off in the distance he heard a pandemonium of bells and whistles. Wearily he noticed that there were no flame paths in the sky. Staggering weakly, he made his way to the observatory, mounted the steps with tired limbs, and wobbled to the eyepiece of his telescope, which he had left focused on the dark star two hours before. Almost trembling, he peered through it. The dark star was gone. Somewhere, far out in the abysses of the universe, a runaway world plunged headlong at ever-mounting speed to uncharted regions under its double acceleration of attraction and repulsion. A sigh of contentment came from his lips as he sank into a heavy and profound sleep. Later he would learn of the readjustments in the solar system, and of the colder climate that came to Earth, and of the vast changes permanently made by the invading planet, and of a blazing new star discovered in Orion that may signify the birth of a sun or the death of a metallic dark world. But these were events to be, and he demanded his immediate reward of a day's dreamless slumber. End of Raiders of the Universes by Donald Wandre Recording by Ryan Mashing Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fontenay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Monette. Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fontenay. Herbert bowed with a muted clank indicating he probably needed oiling somewhere, and presented Alice with a perfect martini on a silver tray. He stood holding the tray, a white, permanent, porcelain smile on his smooth metal face, as Alice sipped the drink and grimaced. "'It's a good martini, Herbert,' said Alice. "'Thank you.' 
But damn it, I wish you didn't have that everlasting smile. I am very sorry, Miss Alice, but I am unable to alter myself in any way, replied Herbert in his polite, hollow voice. He retired to a corner and stood impassively, still holding the tray. Herbert had found a silver deposit and made the tray. Herbert had found sand and made the cocktail glass. Herbert had combined God knew what atmospheric and earth chemicals to make what tasted like gin and vermouth, and Herbert had frozen the ice to chill it. Sometimes, said Thera wistfully, it occurs to me it would be better to live in a mud hut with a real man than in a mansion with Herbert. The four women lulled comfortably in the living room of their spacious house, as luxurious as anything any of them would have known on distant earth. The rugs were thick, the furniture was overstuffed, the paintings on the walls were aesthetic and inspiring, the shelves were filled with book tapes and music tapes. Herbert had done it all, except the book tapes and music tapes, which had been salvaged from the wrecked spaceship. Do you suppose we'll ever escape from this best of all possible manless worlds? asked Betsy, fluffing her thick black hair with her fingers and inspecting herself in a Herbert made mirror. I don't see how, answered Blonde Alice glumly. That atmospheric trap would wreck any other ship just as it wrecked ours, and the same magnetic layer prevents any radio message from getting out. No, I'm afraid we're a colony. A colony perpetuates itself, reminded sharp-faced Marguerite acidly. We aren't a colony without men. They were not the prettiest four women in the universe, nor the youngest. The prettiest women and the youngest did not go to space, but they were young enough and healthy enough, or they could not have gone to space. It had been a year and a half now, an Earth year and a half, on a nice little planet revolving around a nice little yellow sun. Herbert, the robot, was obedient and versatile, and had provided them with a house, food, clothing, anything they wished, created out of the raw elements of earth and air and water. But the bones of all the men who had been a space with these four ladies lay moldering in the wreckage of their spaceship, and Herbert could not create a man. Herbert did not have to have direct orders, and he had tried once to create a man when he had overheard them wishing for one. They had buried the corpse, perfect in every detail except that it had never been alive. "'It's been a hot day,' said Alice, fanning her brow. "'I wish it would rain.' Silently, Herbert moved from his corner and went out the door. Marguerite gestured after him with a bitter little laugh. It'll rain this afternoon, she said. I don't know how Herbert does it, maybe with silver iodide, but it'll rain. Wouldn't it have been simpler to get him to air-condition the house, Alice? That's a good idea, said Alice thoughtfully. We should have had him do it before. Herbert had not quite completed the task of air-conditioning the house when the other spaceship crashed. They all rushed out to the smoking site, the four women and Herbert. It was a tiny scout ship, and its single occupant was alive. He was unconscious, but he was alive, and he was a man. They carted him back to the house tenderly and put him to bed. They hovered over him like four hens over a single chick, waiting and watching for him to come out of his coma, while Herbert scurried about creating and administering the necessary medicines. "'He'll live,' said Thera happily." Thera had been a space nurse. He'll be on his feet and walking around in a few weeks. A man, murmured Betsy, with something like awe in her voice. I could almost believe Herbert brought him here in answer to our prayers. Now, girls, said Alice, we have to realize that a man brings problems as well as possibilities. There was a matter-of-fact hardness to her tone which almost masked the quiver behind it. There was a defiant note of competition there, which had not been heard on this little planet before. "'What do you mean?' asked Thera. "'I know what she means,' said Marguerite, and the new hardness came natural to her. "'She means which one of us gets him.' 
Betsy, the youngest, gasped, and her mouth rounded to a startled O. Thera blinked, as though she were coming out of a daze. That's right, said Alice. Do we draw straws, or do we let him choose? Couldn't we wait, suggested Betsy timidly. Couldn't we wait until he gets well? Herbert came in with a new thermometer and poked it into the unconscious man's mouth. He stood by the bed, waiting patiently. No, I don't think we can, said Alice. I think we ought to have it all worked out and agreed on, so there won't be any dispute about it. I say draw straws, said Marguerite. Marguerite's face was thin, and she had a skinny figure. Betsy, the youngest, opened her mouth, but Thera forestalled her. We are not on earth, she said firmly in her soft, mellow voice. We don't have to follow terrestrial customs, and we shouldn't. There is only one solution that will keep everybody happy, all of us and the man. And that is, asked Marguerite dryly, polygamy, of course. He must belong to us all. Betsy shuddered, but surprisingly, she nodded. That's well and good, agreed Marguerite, but we have to agree that no one of us will be favored above the others. He has to understand that from the start. That's fair, said Alice, pursing her lips. Yes, that's fair, but I agree with Marguerite. He must be divided equally among the four of us. Chattering over the details, the hard competitiveness vanished from their tones. The four left the sick room to prepare supper. After supper, they went back in. Herbert stood by the bed, the eternal smile of service on his metal face. As always, Herbert had not required a direct command to accede to their wishes. The man was divided into four quarters, one for each of them. It was a very neat, surgical job. End of Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fontenay Shepherd of the Planets by Alan Maddox This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shepherd of the Planets by Alan Maddox Read by Andrew Huglet the starship came out of space drive for the last time and made its final landing on a scrubby little planet that circled a small and lonely sun. It came to ground gently, with the cushion of a retarder field on the side of the world where it was night. In the room that would have been known as the bridge on ships of other days, instrument lights glowed softly on Captain Renner's cropped white hair and upon the planes of his lean, strong face. Competent fingers touched the controls here and there, seeking a response that he knew would not come. He had known this for long enough so that there was no longer any emotional impact in it for him. He shut off the control panel and stood up. Well, gentlemen, he said, that's it. The fuel pack's gone. Beeson, the botanist, a rotund little man with a red, unsmiling face, squirmed in his chair. The engineers on Earth told us it would last a lifetime, he pointed out. If we were just back on Earth, Thorne, the ship's doctor, said dryly, we could tell them that it doesn't. They could start calculating again. But what does it mean? David asked. He was the youngest member of the crew, signed on as linguist and librarian to the ship. Just that we're stuck here, wherever that is, for good, Pharaoh said bitterly. You won't have to run engines any more, Dr. Thorne commented, knowing that remark would irritate Pharaoh. Pharaoh glared at him. His narrow cheekbones and shallow eyes were shadowed by the control room lights. He was good with the engines, which were his special charge, but beyond that, he was limited in both sympathy and imagination. Captain Renner looked from face to face. We were lucky to set down safely, he said to them all. We might have been caught too far out for a landing. It is night now, and I am going to get some rest. Tomorrow we will see what kind of world this is. He left the control room and went down the corridor towards his quarters. The others watched him go. None of them made a move to leave their seats. What about the fuel pack? David asked. Just what he said, Pharaoh answered him. It's exhausted. Done for. We can run auxiliary equipment for a long time to come, but no more star drive. So we just stay here until we're rescued, David said. A fine chance for that, Pharaoh's voice grew bitter again. 
Our captain has landed us out here on the rim of the galaxy, where there won't be another ship for a hundred years. I don't understand the man, Beeson said suddenly, looking around him belligerently. What are we doing out here anyway? Extended exploration, said Thorn. It's a form of being put out to pasture. Renner's too old for the service, but he's still a strong and competent man. So they give him a ship and a vague assignment and let him do just about what he wants. There you have it. He took a cigar from his pocket and looked at it fondly. While they last, gentlemen, he said, holding it up. He snipped the end and lit it carefully. His own hair had grown gray in the service, and, in a way, the reason for his assignment to the ship was the same as Renner's. I think, he said slowly, that Captain Renner is looking for something. But for what? Beeson demanded. He's taken us to every out-of-the-way backward planet on the rim, and what happens? We land, we find the natives, we're kind to them, we teach them something, and leave them a few supplies, and then Renner loses interest and we go on. Perhaps it is for something in himself, David offered. Perhaps he will find it here, Thorn murmured. I'm going to bed. He got up from his seat. David stood up and went over to one of the observation ports. He ran back the radiation screen. The sky outside was very black and filled with alien stars. He could see absolutely nothing of the landscape about them because of the dark. It was a poor little planet. It hadn't even a moon. In the morning, they opened up the ship and let down the landing ramps. It was a very old world that they set foot upon. Whatever mountains or hills it had ever had had long ago been leveled by erosion so that now there was only a vague, undulating plain studded with smooth and rounded boulders. The soil underfoot was packed and barren, and there was no vegetation as far as they could see. But the climate seemed mild and pleasant, the air warm and dry, with a soft breeze blowing. It was probable that the breeze would always be with them. There were no mountains to interfere with its passage or alter its gentle play. Off to one side, a little stream ran crystal clear over rocks and gravel. Dr. Thorne got a sample bottle from the ship and went over to it. He touched his fingers to the water and then touched them to his lips. Then he filled the sample bottle from the stream and came back with it. I'll run an analysis of it and let you know as soon as I can. He took the bottle with him into the ship. Beeson stood kicking at the ground with the toe of his boot. His head was lowered. What do you think of it? Renner asked. Beeson shrugged. He knelt down and felt the earth with his hands. Then he got out a heavy-bladed knife and hacked at it until he had pried out a few hard pieces. He stood up again with these in his hands. He tried to crumble them, but they would not crumble. They would only break into bits like sun-dried brick. It's hard to tell, he said. There seems to be absolutely no organic material here. I would say that nothing has grown here for a long, long time. Why, I don't know. The lab will tell us something. Runner nodded. For the rest of the day, they went their separate ways, Renner to his cabin to make the entries that were needed when a flight was ended, even though that ending was not intentional, Beeson to prowling along the edge of the stream and pecking at the soil with a geologist's pick, and Faro to his narrow little world of engines where he worked at getting ready the traction machines and other equipment that would be needed. David set out on a tour of exploration towards the furthermost nests of boulders. It was there that he found the first signs of vegetation— in and around some of the larger groups of rocks, he found mosses and lichens growing. He collected specimens of them to take back with him. It was out there, far from the ship, that he saw the first animate life. When he returned, it was growing toward evening. He found that the others had brought tables from the ship and sleeping equipment and set it up outside. Their own quarters would have been more comfortable, but the ship was always there for their protection, if they needed it, and they were tired of its confinement. It was a luxury to sleep outdoors, even under alien stars. Someone had brought food from the synthesizer and arranged it on a table. They were eating when he arrived. He handed the specimens of moss and lichen to Captain Renner, who looked at them with interest and then passed them to Beeson for his study. Sir, David said. What is it, David? Captain Renner asked. I think there are natives here, David said. I believe that I saw one. Renner's eyes lit up with interest. He laid down his knife and fork. Are you sure? he asked. It was just a glimpse, David said, of a hairy face peering around a rock. It looked like one of those pictures of a caveman one used to see in the old texts. Renner stood up. He moved a little way away and stood staring out into the growing dark across the boulder-studded plain. On a barren planet like this, he said, they must lack so many things. I'd swear he almost looks happy, Dr. Thorne whispered to the man next to him. It happened to be Pharaoh. Why shouldn't he be? Pharaoh growled, his mouth full of food. He's got him a planet to play with. That's what he's been aiming for. Wait and see. The next few days passed swiftly. Dr. Thorne found the water from the little stream not only to be potable, but extremely pure. 
Pharaoh got his machinery unloaded and ready to run. Among other things, there was a land vehicle on light caterpillar treads capable of running where there were no roads and carrying a load of several tons. And there was an out-and-out -out tractor with multiple attachments. Beeson was busy in his laboratory working on samples from the soil. David brought in one new point that was of interest. He had been out hunting among the boulders again, and it was almost dark when he returned. He told Renner about it at the supper table, with the others listening in. I think the natives eat the lichen, he said. I haven't seen much else they could eat. Beeson muttered. "'There's more of the lichen than you might think,' David said, "'if you know where to look for it. "'But even at that, there isn't very much. "'The thing is, it looks like it's been cropped. "'It's never touched if the plants are small or half-grown or very nearly ready. "'But just as soon as the patch is fully mature, it's stripped bare, "'and there never seems to be any of it dropped or left behind or wasted. "'If that's all they have to live on,' Thorn said, "'they have it pretty thin.' "'The natives began to be seen nearer to the camp.' At first, there were just glimpses of them, a hairy face or head seen at the edge of a rock, or the sight of a stocky figure dashing from boulder to boulder. As they grew braver, they came out more into the open. They kept their distance and would disappear into the rocks if anyone made a move toward them, but if no attention was paid them, they moved about freely. In particular, they would come, each evening, to stand in a ragged line near one of the nests of boulders. From there, they would watch the crewmen eat. There were never more than twelve or fifteen of them a bandy-legged lot with thick, heavy torsos and hairy heads. It was on one of these occasions that Dr. Thorne happened to look up. "'Oh, oh!' he said. "'Here it comes!' Renner turned his head and rose to his feet. The other men rose with him. Three of the natives were coming toward the camp. They came along at a swinging trot, a sense of desperation and dedicated purpose in their manner. One ran slightly ahead. The other two followed behind him, shoulder to shoulder. Pharaoh reached for a ray gun and a pile of equipment near him and raised it. "'No weapons,' Captain Runner ordered sharply. Thorough lowered his arm, but kept the gun in his hand. The natives drew near enough for their faces to be seen. The leader was casting frightened glances from side to side and ahead of him as he came. The other two stared straight ahead, their faces rigid, their eyes blank with fear. They came straight to the table. They reached out suddenly and caught up all the food that they could carry in their hands, and turned and fled with it in terror into the night. Somebody sighed in relief. "'Poor devils,' Runner said. "'They're hungry.' There was a conference the following morning around one of the tables. "'We've been here long enough to settle in,' Renner said. "'It's time we started in to do something for this planet.' He looked towards Beeson. "'How far have you gotten?' he asked. Beeson was, as usual, brisk and direct. "'I can give you the essentials,' he said. "'I can't tell you the whole story. I don't know it. "'To be brief, the soil is highly nitrogen-deficient and completely lacking in humus. "'In a way, the two points tie in together.' He looked about him sharply, and then went on. The nitrates are easily leached from the soil. Without the bacteria that grow around certain roots to fix nitrogen and form new nitrates, the soil was soon depleted. As to the complete lack of organic material, I can hazard only a guess. Time, of course, but back of that, probably the usual history of an overpopulation and depleted soil. At the end, perhaps they ate everything, leaves, stems and roots, and returned nothing to the earth. The nitrates are replaceable? Renner asked. Beeson nodded. The nitrates will have formed deposits, he said, probably near ancient lakes or shallow seas. It shouldn't be too hard to find some. Renner turned to Pharaoh. How about your department, he asked. I take it we're thinking of farming, Pharaoh said. I've got equipment that will break up the soil for you, and I can throw a dam across the stream for water. There are seeds in the ship, Renner said, his eyes lighting with enthusiasm. We'll start this planet all over again. There's still one thing, Beeson reminded him dryly. Humus. Leaves, roots, organic material... Something to loosen up the soil, aerate it. Nothing will grow in a brick. Renner stood up. He took a few slow paces and then stood looking out at the groups of boulders studding the ancient plain. I see, he said. And there's only one place to get it. We'll have to use the lichens and the mosses. There'll be trouble with the natives if you do, Thorn said. Renner looked at him. He frowned thoughtfully. You'll be taking their only food, the doctor pointed out. We can feed them from the synthesizer, Renner answered. We know that they'll eat it. Why bother? Pharaoh asked sourly. Renner turned on him. Will the synthesizer handle it? he asked. I guess so, Pharaoh grumbled, for a while at least. But I don't see what good the natives are to us. If we take their food, Renner said, we're going to feed them, at least until such a time as the crops come in and they're able to feed themselves. Are you building this planet for us or for them? Pharaoh demanded. Renner turned away. They put out canisters of food for the natives that night. In the morning it was gone. Each evening, someone left food for them near their favorite nest of rocks. The natives took it in the dark, unseen. Gradually, Captain Runner himself took over the feeding. 
he seemed to derive a personal satisfaction from it. Gradually, too, the natives began coming out into the open to receive it. Before long, they were waiting for him every evening as he brought them food. The gathering of the lichen began. They picked it by hand, working singly or in pairs, searching out the rocks and hidden places where it grew. From time to time, they would catch glimpses of the natives watching them from a distance. They were careful not to get close. On one of these occasions, Captain Renner and David were working together. Do they have a language? Captain Renner asked. Yes, sir, David answered. I have heard them talking among themselves. Do you suppose you can learn it? Renner asked. Do you think you could get near enough to them to listen to it? I could try, David offered. Then do so, Renner said. That's an assignment. Thereafter, David went out alone. He found that getting close to the natives was not too difficult. He tried to keep out of their sight while still getting near enough to them to hear their voices. They were undoubtedly aware of his presence, but with the feeding they had lost their fear of the men and did not seem to care. Bit by bit he learned their language, starting from a few key roots and sounds. It was a job for which he had been trained. Time passed rapidly, and the work went on. Captain Renner let his beard grow. It came out white and thick, and he did not bother to trim it. The others, too, became more careless in their dress, each man following his own particular whim. There was no longer need for a taut ship. Thero threw a dam across the little stream, and, while the water grew behind it, went on to breaking up the soil with his machines. Beeson searched for nitrate and found it. He brought a load of it back, and this, together with the moss and lichen, was chopped into the soil. In the end, it was the lichen that was the limiting factor. There was only so much of it, so the size of the plot that they could prepare was small. But it's a start, Renner said. That's all we can hope for this first year. This crop will furnish more material to be chopped back into the soil. Year by year it will grow until the inhabitants here will have a new world to live in. What do you expect to get out of it? Pharaoh asked bitingly. Renner's eyes glowed with an inner light. Renner's beard grew with the passing months until it became a luxuriant thing. He let his hair go untrimmed too, so that with his tall, spare figure he took on a patriarchal look. And, with the passing months, there came that time which was to be spring for this planet. The first green blades of the new planting showed above the ground. The natives noticed it with awe and kept a respectful distance. That evening, when it was time for the natives' feeding, the men gathered about. Little by little, the feeding had become a ritual, and they would often go out to watch it. It was always the same. Renner would step forward away from the others a little way, the load of food in his hands. The natives would come to stand before him in their ragged line, their leader a trifle to the front. There they would bow and begin a chant that had become part of the ritual with the passing time. With the first green planting showing, there was a look of deep satisfaction in Renner's eyes as he stepped forward this night. His hair had grown quite long by now, and his white beard blew softly in the constant wind. There was a simple dignity about him as he stood there, his head erect, and looked upon the natives as his children. The natives began their chant. It became louder. Tolava, they said and bowed. As usual, Pharaoh was nettled. What does the man want, anyway? he asked out loud. To be God? Renner could not help but hear him. He did not turn his head. David, he said. Sir? David asked, stepping forward. You understand their language now, don't you? Renner asked. Yes, sir, David said. Then translate, Renner ordered. Out loud, please, so that the others may hear. Tolava, the natives chanted, bowing. Tolava. Our father, David said, following the chant. Suddenly he swallowed and hesitated for a moment, then straightened himself and went sturdily on. Tolava, our father, who art from the heavens, give us this day our daily bread. End of Shepherd of the Planets by Alan Maddox The Slizzers by Jerome Bixby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Silk The Slizzers by Jerome Bixby They're all around us. I'll call them the Slizzers because they slizz people. Lord only knows how long they've been on Earth and how many of them there are. They're all around us, living with us, we are hardly ever aware of their existence, because they can make themselves look like us, and do most of the time. And if they can look like us, there's really no need for them to think like us, is there? People think and behave in so many cockeyed ways anyhow. Whenever a slizzer fumbles a little in his impersonation of a human being, and comes up with a puzzling response, 
I suppose we just shrug and think, he could use a good psychiatrist. So, you might be one, or your best friend, or your wife or husband, or that nice lady next door. They aren't killers, or rampaging monsters, quite the contrary. They need us, something like the way we'd need maple trees if it came to the point where maple syrup was our only food. That's why we're in no comic book danger of being destroyed, any more than maple trees would be in the circumstances I just mentioned, or are as things go. In a sense, we're rather well treated and helped along a bit, the way we care for maple trees. But sometimes a man here and there will be careless, or ignorant, or greedy, and a maple tree will be hurt. Think about that the next time someone is real nice to you. He may be a slither, and a careless one. How long do we live? Right, about sixty, seventy years. You probably don't think much about that, because that's just the way things are. That's life. And what the hell? The doctors are increasing our lifespan every day with new drugs and things, aren't they? Sure. But perhaps we'd live to be about a thousand, if the slizzers left us alone. Ever stop to think about how little we know about why we live? What it is that takes our structure of bones and cold cuts and gives it the function we call life? Some mysterious life substance, or force the doctors haven't pinned down yet, you say. That's as good a definition as any. Well, we're maple trees to the slizzers, and that life stuff is the sap we supply them. They do it mostly when we're feeling good, feeling really terrific. It's easier to tap us that way, and there's more to be had. Maybe that's what makes so-called manic depressives. They attract slizzers when they're feeling tip-top, and slizzers feed, and floom, depressive. Like I say, think about all this next time someone treats you just ginger peachy and makes you feel all warm inside. So see how long that feeling lasts, and who is hanging around you at the time. Experiment. See if it doesn't happen again and again with the same people. And if you don't, usually end up wondering where in hell your nice warm feeling went off to? I found out about the slizzers when I went up to Joe Arnold's apartment last Friday night. Joe opened the door and let me in. He flashed me his big junior execs grin and said, Sit, Jerry. I'll mix you a gin and. The others will be along in a while, and we can get the action started. I sat down in my usual chair. Joe had already fixed up the table. Green felt top, ashtrays, coasters, cards, chips. I said, if Mel, that's his name, isn't it, the new guy? If he starts calling wild games again when it comes to his deal, I'll walk out. I don't like him. I looked at the drink Joe was mixing. More gin. Joe crimped half a lime into the glass. He won't call any crazy stuff tonight. I told him that if he did, we wouldn't invite him back. He nearly ruined the whole session, didn't he? I nodded and took the drink. Joe mixes them right, just the way I like them. They make me feel good inside. How about a little blackjack while we're waiting? Sure, they're late anyway. I got first ace and dealt. We traded a few chips back and forth, nothing exciting, and on the ninth deal Joe got blackjack. He shuffled, buried a tray, and gave me an ace down, duck up. Hit me, I said contentedly. Joe gave me another ace. Mama, hit me again! A four. Son, I told him, you're in for a royal beating again. A deuce, Joe winced. I turned up my whole ace and said, give me a six, you poor son. I can't lose. A nine. Nineteen and six, I crowed. I counted up my bets. Five dollars. You owe me fifteen bucks. Then I looked up at him. I'll repeat myself. You know that hot flush of pure delight, of high triumph, even of mild avarice that possesses you from tingling scalp to tingling toe when you've pulled off a doozy? If you play cards, you've been there. If you don't play cards, just think back to the last time someone complimented the pants off you, or the last time you clinched a big deal, or the last time a sweet kid you've been hot after said yes. That's the feeling I mean, the feeling I had. And Joe Arnold was eating it. I knew it somehow, the moment I saw his eyes and hands. His eyes weren't Joe Arnold's blue eyes any longer. They were wet balls of shining black that took up half his face, and they looked hungry. 
His arms were straight out in front of him. His hands were splayed tensely about a foot from my face. The fingers were thinner and much longer than I could recall Joe's being. And they just looked like antenna or electrodes or something, stretched wide open that way and quivering. And I just knew that they were picking up and draining off into Joe's body all the elation, the excitement, the warmth that I felt. I looked at him and wondered why I couldn't scream or move a muscle. Guess I made a boo-boo, he said. He blinked his big black globes of eyes. No harm done, though. His head had thinned down, just like his fingers, and now came to a peak on top. He had practically no shoulders. He smiled at me, and I saw long black hair growing on the insides of his lips. What are you? I screamed at him to myself. Joe licked his hairy lips and folded those long, inhuman hands in front of him. It hurts like hell, he said in a not-human voice, to be slizzing you and then have you chill off on me that way, Jerry. But it's my own fault, I guess. The doorbell rang. Two soft tones. Joe got up and let in the other members of our Friday night poker group. I tried to move and couldn't. Fred raised his eyebrows when he saw Joe's face and hands. Jerry isn't here yet? Relaxing a little? Then he saw me sitting there and whistled, Oh, you slipped up, eh? Joe nodded. You were late, and I was hungry, so I thought I'd go ahead and take my share. I gave him a big kick, and he really poured it out, radiated like all hell. I took it in so fast that I flooped and lost my plasmic control. We might as well eat now, then, Ray said, before we get down to playing cards. He sat down across the table, his eyes, now suddenly enormous and black, eagerly on me. I hate like hell waiting until you deal him a big pot. No, Joe said sharply. Too much at one time, and he'd wonder what hit him. We'll just do it like always, one of us at a time, and only a little at a time. Get him when he rakes in the loot. They never miss it when they feel like that. He's right, Fred said. Take it easy, Ray. He went over to the sideboard and began mixing drinks. Joe looked down at me with his black end of eggplant eyes. Now to fix things, he said. I blinked and shook my head. You owe me fifteen bucks, I said. Lord, Joe wailed, did this gonif just take me? Ray groaned sympathetically from the chair across the table, where he'd been watching the slaughter. And how? Joe pushed fifteen blue chips at me. I began stacking them. Well, that's life, I grinned. Then I shook my head again. It's the damnedest thing. What? Fred asked. He'd been over at the sideboard mixing drinks for the gang while I'd taken Joe over the bumps. Now he brought the tray over and shoved a tall one in Joe's hands. Don't cry, Joe. What's the damnedest thing, Jerry? You know, that funny feeling when you've been someplace before. The same place, the same people, saying the same things. But you can't remember where the hell or when, for the life of you. Had it just a moment ago, when I told Joe he owed me fifteen bucks. What did they call it again? Deja vu, said Alan, who is sort of the scholarly type. Means seen before in French, I think, or something like that. That's right, I said. Deja vu. It's the damnedest, funniest feeling. I guess people have it all the time, don't they? Yes, Alan said. Then he paused. People do. I wonder what causes it. Joe's blue eyes were twinkling. Don't know. The psychologists have an explanation for it. But it's probably wrong. Wrong? Why? Knowing Joe, I expected a gag. I got it. Well, Joe said, let me make up a theory. Hmm. Ooh. Ah, well, it's like this. There are monsters all around us, see? But we don't know they're monsters, except that every once in a while, one of them slips up in his disguise and shows himself for what he really is. But this doesn't bother our monsters. They simply reach into our minds and twiddle around and zoop, you're right back to where you were before the slip was. Very funny, Fred said boredly. Maybe losing fifteen bucks made you lose a little sense, Joe. You wouldn't want to lose more than fifteen bucks, would you? You need some caution in the games we play, no? So cut the nonsense and let's run em. Ray licked his lips. Yeah, let's play, huh, fellows? Ray's always eager to get started. We played until 3 a.m., I won $46. I usually do win. I guess over a period of six months or so, I'm about 500 bucks ahead of the game, which is why I like to play over at Joe's. 
even though I am always so damn tired when I leave. Guess I'm not as young as I was. Sometimes I wonder why the odds go my way, right down the line. I almost never lose, but hell, it must be an honest game, and if they're willing to go on losing to Lucky Bixby, I'm perfectly willing to go on winning. After all, can you think of any reason that makes any sense for someone to rig a game week after week to let you win? October 20th. Frederick Bowles, Author's Agent, 2200 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York. Dear Fred, well, here's a story. I've cleared it with Joe. He says it's okay to use his name. You know his sense of humor. I've used your name, too, but you can change it if you want to, being the shy, retiring sort you are. Frankly, I'm a little dubious about the yarn. It's the result of last Friday's poker session. I actually did have the deja vu sensation, as you'll recall. On the way home, I stopped in to pick up a chaser, feeling tired as all hell, like I always do. These long grinds are too much for me, I guess, just like the guy in the story. And the idea came to me to slap the old we are fodder angle into the thing as it happened and write it up. But it's still an old plot, and one angle is left unexplained. How is the narrator able to know all about the slizzers and write about them after Joe gives him the deja vu treatment? Well, maybe the readers won't mind. I've gotten away with bigger holes than that. Try it on Bob Lowndes. I still owe him on that advance. It's up his alley. Hope a hope. Jerry. October 22nd, 1952. Jerome Bixby, 862 Union Street, Brooklyn, New York. Dear Jerry, I don't go for the slizzers. It just ain't convincing. As you say, it's an old idea. And besides, again, as you say, how does the narrator know what happened? The manuscript looks good in my wastebasket. Forget about it. Sympathies. Fred. October 23rd, 1952. Frederick Bowles, author's agent, 2200 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York. Dear Wet Blanket, and aren't you a little old for that? Respectfully, nuts to you. After proper browbeating, I think I'll try the yarn on Lowndes. It's no masterpiece, but I think it's got a chance. He likes an off-trail bit now and then. I made a carbon natch, so your ditching of the original comes to naught. Funny thing, every time I read it over, I get the doggone deja vu feeling. Real dynamic thing, almost lifts my hair. Hope it does the same for the readers, them as can read. Maybe Joe didn't quite do the job of making me forget what happened that night, ha <laughs> ha. Say, maybe that could explain the narrator's remembering what happened. Or maybe, hey, a real idea. Remember Joe's kidding us about monsters? Remember, you got a little sore because he was holding up the game, you money-hungry son? I think I'll rewrite the ending to include that, which ought to take care of the narrator's remembering. Joe can be a sort of dopey slizzer, a blatmouth, and his screwy theory which is true in the story, or will be when I write it in, say, isn't this involved, can trigger our hero's memory just a bit, shake the block a mite, undiddle the synapses, etc. And then I'll have you, Platinum Butt, step in to head Joe off, under pretense of a poker itch. You know, it's wonderful the way there are hot story ideas in plain old everyday things. So long. Gonna revise. Jerry. October 23rd, 1952. Mr. Robert W. Lowndes, Columbia Publications, Inc., 241 Church Street, New York, New York. Master, here with a story, The Slizzers, which Fred and I don't quite see eye to eye on. He thinks it stinks on ice. I'm sure he will disagree to the tune of nice money. J. Enclosed, The Slizzers. 1952, October 24th, AM, 906. NB168, PD, New York, New York, 63. 110B, Jerome Bixby, 862 Union Street, Apartment 6H, Brooklyn. Jerry, urge strongly that you don't try to sell slizzers. Stop. It's just no damn good. Stop. You've got your reputation to think of. Stop. Why louse up your good name with a lemon at this late date? Stop. Kill it. Stop. I've talked it over with Joe, and he isn't feeling humorous anymore. Stop. Prefers not to have name used. Stop. Repeat. Kill the thing for your own good. Fred. 1952, October 24th, AM, 1114, KL300PD, New York, New York, 12604B, Jerome Bixby, 862 Union Street, Apartment 6H, Brooklyn, Sun, like slizzers, stop, 
Preposterous but cute, stop. Disagree with Fred to the tune of nice money, but nice money stays in my pocket, stop. Now you owe me only $50 of advance, August 16th, stop. Do I hear a scream, poor boy? Bob. October 24th, 1952. Frederick Bowles, author's agent, 2200 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York. Dear Fred, your telegram came too late, and besides, the hell with it. Sent the yarn to Bob yesterday. Groceries and rent wait for no man, you know. And he bought it, like the sensitive and discerning editor he is. What are you and Joe getting your tails in an uproar about? It's only a gag, so relax. Joe will change his mind when he sees his name in print. Would like to have included another angle, by the way. If the narrator's amnesia job had been botched, wouldn't the Slizzers decide pretty damn quick that he was a menace to them and get rid of him? I think I'll send Bob a line or two to stick on the end. You know, the old incompleted sentence deal. Just as if, while the narrator was finishing the story, the Slizzers came in and... End of the Slizzers by Jerome Bixby Read by Scott Silk of the Tales to Terrify Horror Story Podcast A Star Fell by L. J. Beeston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humple. A Star Fell by L. J. Beeston. Part 1. Man Proposes. Letter, dated September 22, 2004. From Professor James Clinton Gray to Wilhelm von Belieu of Berlin. My dear von Belieu, here's a clatter about my unfortunate ears. I am assailed on all sides. Will the time never come when a man with a new idea will obtain an attentive hearing and abuse afterwards, if he deserves it? You have seen the papers, of course. The mildest term applied to your poor friend is that of visionary. I am assured that if I had lived in the past century, in the so-called advanced days of the seventh Edward, I should have been reckoned amongst the mad ones of that period. Possibly. Well, hard names hurt nobody. I believe that my idea will grow, will become a hypothesis, then a thesis. I am prepared to test my own opinions. I am ready to attempt to carry out this stupendous experiment. As was anticipated, even in the slow times of the Victorian era, the rise and progress of the power of electricity has been steady and assured. Today we find only pleasure craft upon the sea. Our great liners traverse the air, racing the swallows. The steam locomotive is a thing forgotten, that panting, unwieldy piece of mechanism. And still this power holds out the most gigantic possibilities one of which is now within my grasp. I will explain. My claim is the discovery of a new application of the electric fluid, whereby I may attain so enormous a speed as to practically annihilate space. A prophet has no honor in his own country, and the state has declined to help me evolve my model into the great dimensions of the airship which I propose to build. The German government, whose feelers are all over the world, offered to buy my services, and my secret. It was a temptation, and only a certain love of country held me back from it. As of old, England and Germany are today prepared to spring at one another's throats, and my airship would involve the destruction of any present-day aerial navy. Fortunately, friends have come forward to assist me. The work is progressing. The time is at hand, that time so dreamed of in all ages, when the planets shall become our stepping-stones. I use the word advisedly. When man, who has conquered so many things, shall conquer space also. I feel my blood burn as I write this. I can scarcely contain myself. Do you wonder? I am thinking of making a very serious move. You know Oppenheim, the German inventor? He is an extremely clever fellow, and has some good ideas in these matters. I have a mind to suggest to him that we combine our intelligences. He can help me. I can help him. In so stupendous a venture as my forthcoming flight through space, it is hardly wise to rely upon a single brain. Can I trust him? And now I am going to revert to that word stepping stones, which I used just now, for it sent me to the strangest idea which has brought a storm of criticism upon my head. 
Our span of life upon this third planet from the sun is some seventy years. The conditions that surround us here will not permit of a longer tenure. I hold it possible that life, as we know it, once removed to another planet, might be extended and so changed an environment might be renewed indefinitely. And so this question of immortality, which has so long distracted the minds of thinkers, becomes a solved problem. Inaction is death, always has been. But if we move from sphere to sphere, we may attain our full heritage, the ultimate aim of our existence. Are you laughing, my friend, as you read this? Well, all the world is laughing. I shall act. Yours, James Clinton Gray From the Same to the Same My dear Von Ballou, a most extraordinary incident has occurred. I am the subject of a charming adventure. A pretty woman has offered to accompany me on a voyage across twenty-six million miles of space. One moment. I received your letter, in which you warn me concerning Oppenheim. Your terms of unscrupulous and unprincipled render me uneasy. I had asked for his help. He seemed enormously pleased, but I shall now back out of it as best I can. Now, for my adventure. I was at Brighton on the Wednesday of last week. A century ago they used to run, to this seaport, their wretched little excursion trains. But the town is now almost a suburb of London. Near to it is my house, built on a quiet spot in the Sussex Downs. It was evening, and I strolled on to the pier, which was almost deserted. The wind that had been blowing all day had spent its strength. The sea also appeared to be resting. The sun was sinking, dragging after it the young moon that showed itself only to retire. The waves rolled shoreward in long, languorous swells, falling with a melancholy sound upon the beach, and uttering deep sobs as they rose and fell through the iron stages of the pierhead. As I walked on the pier, watching the death of that autumn day, I perceived the mammoth airship, the fireball, as it showed for an instant through a break in the cumulus clouds. She was bound for Sydney, and she came and went like a sigh. Suddenly I heard a voice behind me. Am I not addressing Professor Gray? I turned and saw a lady looking at me. She was tall, with dark hair and dark eyes. I likened her to the spirit of the mournful autumn evening. She was certainly very beautiful, my dear Vaunt Ballou. I bowed. We exchanged a few remarks. I believe in you, she said frankly. Yes, while others scoff, I believe in you, heart and soul. I made a deprecatory gesture, but I was immensely pleased. I will introduce myself, she went on, with a sad smile. I am Miss Alexandra Porteous. I am deeply interested in aerial navigation. There was a moment of silence, then she continued. Your forthcoming great venture possesses a fascination for me. That you will reach the planet Venus is my earnest wish. How fast do you propose to travel? As the extent of my journey will be some twenty-six millions of miles, you will understand that the rate of progression must be enormous. I shall rise with comparative slowness until above the atmosphere. Then my flight will become meteoric. Why slow at first? Because, my dear lady, I do not wish to transform myself and my machine into a meteor, a shooting star. That would be an apotheosis, not desired. I must confess that I do not altogether understand. It is simple. The meteorite is a small body weighing a few pounds or a few tons, at any rate quite minute when compared to the earth. It revolves round the sun, as we do. On occasion it gets too near to the earth which draws it from its orbit by gravitation. It is a fatal moment. Nearer and nearer to our great world it comes, rushing harmlessly through the airless fields. But when it plunges into the atmosphere, which extends so far above us, then friction is instantly developed by the tremendous flight of the missile. It becomes hot, red-hot, white-hot, and finally is fused into a glowing vapor. You have observed the process a hundred times, for the meteorite is just a shooting star. 
Very well. You will perceive that if I compel my machine through the upper air at its full velocity, which is immense, it will become fused, drifting off into glowing vapor by the friction. She thanked me charmingly for the explanation, and said, Why do you choose this star out of so many? Because its size is much the same as that of the earth, so I need not fear a gravitation to which I am unaccustomed. And, as it is much nearer to the sun than we are, its climate is probably distinctly warmer, from which I infer that life there is more highly developed. She turned her superb eyes full upon me. Oh, she said, her voice tremulous, I have read, read a score of times, your articles in which you argue for a practical immortality, in which you state with force and daring that when man commands the spheres, he will command death itself. Her excitement troubled while it thrilled me, and I deemed it wise to gently remonstrate. Pardon, my dear lady, I replied. My articles are not so much statements of fact as hints at possibilities. So much depends upon the atmosphere of other worlds. Though compressed oxygen may serve while we travel thither, yet I finished the sentence with a shrug of my shoulders. At that instant we saw the racing airship Orion pass far over Brighton. It was then quite dark. Her arc lights extended into the upper gloom, like enormous white gleaming swords. She flashed underneath the stars, and was out of sight ere one might count three. Miss Porteous turned to me with the strangest look in her eyes. She said, in a low voice, How terrible night is! It always makes me afraid. They try to illumine it. The light creeps a few yards into space and is lost. Can anything be more pitiful? I was somewhat surprised by this remark, which seemed to show an erotic temperament. I replied, tamely enough, Get the night is not without charm. I shall not readily forget her answer, which ran through me as a cold shudder. Placing a hot hand upon mine, she said, Since the world was born, night comes to remind us of the lasting dark. Yes, night has its beauty but death has no beauty, none. I read her meaning instantly, and strangely enough I read her intention. This emotional creature feared above all things the king of terrors, feared time, which must rob her of her beauty, sap her youth, wear down her ideals and enthusiasms, feared death, which she called, quite wrongly of course, the lasting dark. And she was ready to risk the present on one great throw, believing utterly in my hypothesis she was prepared to leave this earth which is filled with graves truly my dear von Bulu, it is well to be careful of one's words well to conceal our opinions until we are sure of them i was greatly troubled by this time you have probably guessed the rest i fell in love with miss porteous that autumn evening within three days i told her so does she love me it is my hourly prayer. Anyhow, she is with me in this venture. All London knows it. All England execrates me. There is even talk of persuading the authorities to interfere with the expedition. You know me too well to believe that I shall change my mind. We shall be married in less than a month, and shall start directly afterwards, if possible. Yours, James Clinton Gray From Wilhelm von Bulu to Professor Clinton Gray. My dear friend, I have just received your letter, which has filled me with astonishment and apprehension. My affection must justify my plain speaking. I am jealous for your honor, anxious for your success, and when I hear of a woman in your purpose, I can but lift my hands in horror. What, you in love? Fiddlesticks! I will not hear of it. You must disencumber yourself of this stupidity. For the venture that lies before you, you will need concentrated energy, nerve, stamina, immense courage. Marriage is not for you. Understand that. It is a luxury which you must forego for the present. Do I speak my mind too freely? Pardon me. You have made me so hot. Concerning Justice Oppenheim, I am watching this man. I shall be surprised if I do not find that he is a spy in the pay of the German government. He is extremely jealous of you. In Berlin, the general opinion of you is very high. 
It is believed that if there is a man living, capable of destroying the superb German aerial squadrons, that man is yourself. They want your secret, which will render present-day airships slow-moving as snails. Oppenheim wants your secret to perfect his clever ideas, and will not stick at a trifle to obtain it. Be careful, be suspicious, and fling this sentimentality to the winds. Your affectionate friend, Wilhelm von Bellew. From Alexandra Porteus to Justice Oppenheim of Berlin. There is a statement in your latest communication which astonishes, though it does not frighten me. You say, if you play false, the worst possible consequences will befall you. I suppose you mean that I shall die suddenly. It is a pity that you should use these threats, for I must throw myself on the protection of the man I love. Yes, I love him. I disregard your bitter sneer. After all, I have wronged you. But by doing so, I righted myself. You come to me with your tempting offers. You suggested that if I would play the spy under you, who are also a spy, that I would discover the secret of that application of the electric forces, whereby Professor Clinton Gray hopes to attain his great speed. That if I would betray to you this secret, you in turn to sell it to the German government, you would give me any price which I might care to name. And I wanted money. And I closed with the offer. And I became acquainted with the professor and I acted a part, and I lied to him, and I learned all that you wished to know. And then, ah, if you knew how impossible it is for me to work him so deep an injury, so great a wrong. He trusts me. He tells me everything. His brain is wonderful, but his heart is a little child's. When he knows all, for I shall confess all, he will forgive me. I am too well acquainted with you and your purpose to think that you will yield. I know you now for an enemy. You need not have told me that. You offer me one more chance. I decline it. You hint that you will find means to compel me to abide by our compact. That is impossible. You speak of the penalty that I shall incur. I repeat that your threats will not intimidate me. You will understand why I prefer to leave this letter unsigned. Ethergram from Wilhelm von Bellew to Professor Clinton Gray. I am right and you are wrong. Beware the woman. She is a traitress. Am writing. Von Bellew. Ethergram from Professor Clinton Gray to Wilhelm von Bellew. You are an insulting ass. I married Alexander this morning. Tomorrow we start. Clinton Gray. Part 2. God Disposes From Professor Clinton Gray to Wilhelm von Bellew My dear von Bellew, no doubt your eyes were amongst the first to see the news. My undertaking has ended in these frightful episodes. Could anything more extraordinary be imagined? Anything more terrible? I am half stunned. I keep thinking that I am in a nightmare's grip, that presently I shall awake. All round me are ethergrams and letters, for the world which was so hostile to my plans shows now a face of charity and sympathy. I am going to tell you exactly what happened. When I had made Alexandra my wife, I promptly dismissed the subject from my mind, since my proposed flight through space required much preparation. I did not see Alexandra for some five or six hours after leaving the church, then, having a spare quarter of an hour, I went out in search of her. She was not in the house. No one had any clear idea as to what had become of her. I went out, expecting to find her in the near neighborhood. Evening was over the downs. My house is built in quite a solitary part. It is always so still there that the tinkle of a sheep's bell, the lowing of oxen, the sound of a motor horn, or the whir of an aeroplane can be heard with distinctness. There is a clump of wood behind the house. The sun fires it in the morning, and in the evening it becomes black and forbidding. Suddenly I perceive two figures pass across an opening in the hedge, and I recognized my wife, who was walking with a man whose face I failed to see at that distance. 
First my curiosity was aroused, then a jealous feeling. To crush the second, I resolved to satisfy the first. Moving quietly across a stretch of downland, I gained the near side of the hedge. I had no right whatever to play the part of a spy, but I was a little piqued at my wife's absence at that time, and I yielded to a weakness that was unworthy of me. I moved with caution round the hedge, which was being stripped of its leaves by the autumn decay. By that time it was almost dark. The rooks in the wood uttered occasional caws that sounded like sardonic laughs. Suddenly I heard my wife's voice. She was speaking in anger. If you have come so far to make me change my purpose, you have come in vain. I will have nothing more to do with you. Neither must you attempt to see me again. When I heard those words, the slumbering jealousy broke into a flame. I suffered a dreadful pang. Then the man spoke. It is all very well for you to adopt this high tone towards me. You know that you are pledged. Astonishment held me rigid. I had recognized the voice. The speaker was Justice Oppenheim. What was he doing there? What right had my wife given him that he dared to address her in this way? Her answer came quickly. I reject our compact that has made me despise myself. And you have informed Clinton Gray of the matter? said Oppenheim. His voice was shaking with passion. That does not concern you, replied my wife haughtily. At these words a sudden trembling seized me, a deadly sickness. Would she deny the charge? No, she, silent, silent. Come, come, went on this pretty villain. It is not too late now. Give me the help I want, and I in turn will give you, here in banknotes, the sum of one thousand pounds. He need never know. I swear to you that I will keep silent. You have my answer. Will you not go? cried my wife, stamping her foot. Two thousand, then. Not for two millions. He drew a long breath. Very well, said he. Be sure that I shall not let the matter rest here. It was then that I interfered. Calling out the scoundrel's name, I forced a way through the hedge, cutting myself somewhat in the process. Oppenheim turned on me like a wild beast. Eavesdropper, he snarled. You rascal, I retorted. Get off my grounds, or I will summon a keeper to have you flung into that ditch. For answer, he snatched at something in his pocket. I saw a dull gleam. Then my wife uttered a piercing cry and threw herself before me. There was a spurt of flame, a whip-like crack. The ball which was meant for me entered my wife's body. I felt her shudder, heard her moan. Then Oppenheim was swallowed by the dark night, and I was left, crying loudly for help, not daring to leave the dear form in my arms. Her face was ashy whitened. She kept gasping my name. God, it was awful. Twenty minutes later, my wife was under the surgeon's care. She was in that condition when life and death hang equal in the balance. Then, my dear friend, I went mad. You know that I am by nature of a mild disposition, holding it supreme foolishness to waste in any emotional excess that nerve force which is the stay of all character. But I will confess that on this occasion I gave full liberty to my passions. My one desire was to find Justice Oppenheim that I might kill him. I rushed from the house with this intent. A wonderful scene met my eyes. The police had been notified of the matter, and a dozen officers were already on the roads on motorcycles. News of the affair had flown here, there, and everywhere. It had reached Brighton, in which town for hours past a stream of visitors had been gathering with the purpose of witnessing the commencement of my flight that was to take place from the grounds without my house. And all these people, an enormous crowd, mounted on bicycles, motorcycles, automobiles of every possible description, and on horseback, had come in haste to the scene of the crime that they might assist in discovering the villain who had done me so great a wrong, and who had disappointed them of the spectacle which they had come from all parts of the country to observe. I wish that you could have seen that wonderful sight. Far over the winding roads, amongst the downland, shone thousands of lamps, illumining the otherwise black night. The tinkle of bells, the tooting of motor-horns, sounded incessantly. 
the deep hum of the voices of that immense gathering drowned the cry of the sea that was beating a full tide against the chalk cliffs. The darkened fields swarmed with searchers bearing lanterns. What would happen if this angry host caught Oppenheim? They would tear him to pieces. Unwilling to mingle with this army of sympathetic friends, I resolved to wait and abide events. But insensibly the excitement of the search drew me from the house. The flames of a burning barn were reflected against the stars. The building had been fired by some madman under the impression that the fugitive was concealed there. The handful of police were now looking for the fellow who had destroyed the barn. An hour passed, and Oppenheim had not been discovered. Suddenly a man's voice addressed me. Is that you, Professor? I at once recognized Inspector Reddish of the police. He was on horseback. A body of men was under his control, but he had lost them in the darkness and confusion. He sat with his horse backed up against a briar hedge, and he wiped his face, which was streaming with perspiration. "'Ever see anything like it?' said he. I was about to make some remark, when a harsh, deep, throbbing sound pulsated through the still air. The inspector turned his face to the sky, expecting to perceive an aero-car driven by a petrol motor, but nothing met his gaze save a multitude of stars in the quiet heavens. "'That's funny,' he observed, when I interrupted him with a shout. "'Oh, fools, fools!' I cried out. "'What is the matter? That sound! I know it among a hundred. He appeared to snatch at my thought. "'What? You believe? That someone is starting the electric motors of my airship!' And that someone is possibly, is most certainly Oppenheim himself, the man we seek. For pity's sake, quick, quick! Will you get up behind me, he asked, and I at once accepted the offer. It was only a quarter mile back to my house, and the horse covered the distance in a few minutes. An avenue of trees led to the building. We tore along it. At the house I dismounted. This way, I cried, running round to the outbuilding where I had constructed my airship. The ladder had been run out from the shed that evening into an open meadow. A canvas tarp had been roughly erected to protect it from dew. This was thrown down. A terrible noise issued from the bowels of the airship. I had but a single hope, that Oppenheim's knowledge of the intricacies of the huge machine would not prove sufficient to enable him to start it. When at the distance of fifty yards, we saw the arc light of one of the airship's lamps flame into the opaque gloom. At the same instant, the pounding of the impatient motors was redoubled. "'Too late! He's off!' I cried, shaking my fists in impotent rage. A loud laugh of mockery rang out. Oppenheim had beaten us. The inspector so far forgot himself as to curse with vigor. Then something occurred which was unexpected, unparalleled, frightful. The airship leaped into space, higher, higher, moving at a great velocity, silhouetted against the stars like an enormous bird. It seemed at that moment that the fugitive was safe from justice, that no power could avail against him. But he was far from understanding properly the complex mechanism of my airship, and, possibly in an endeavor to attain greater speed, or to check the progression which he had already attained, he contrived, in his haste and nervousness, to give full vent to the motive force that could impel the machine with the pace and power of a meteor. The result was that the airship became a projectile, that the thin air, which is so impalpable to our touch, resisted the tremendous velocity of the flying machine, that the friction developed by that resistance heated the metal, red-hot, white-hot, and finally dissolved it in a streak of glowing vapor. As we stood gazing into the eastern skies, from a point between Andromeda and the Pleiades, a star fell. It was my airship, with its occupant, fused in ten seconds of time into nothingness. The inspector fell face downwards, burying his face in the horse's mane, groaning with sheer horror. I dropped on my knees, yet I was too appalled to think, to speak, to pray. I will anticipate your questions, my dear Von Belu. You are asking, will these misadventures daunt him? Will he resign this project that might have made us masters of space and time? These few additional lines to my long letter are penned after the lapse of three days. 
my dear wife is now out of danger, and her complete recovery is promised. She faced death that she might save me. How much care, how deep a devotion do I owe her. Secondly, the end of Justice Oppenheim. While it has not shaken my nerve, has yet made me pause. The upper void swallowed him so easily. The forces of space annihilated him as callously as we destroy, by a movement of the hand, the tip of phosphorus on a match. And I asked myself that old question. Shall we not make the present bright, rather than dream of gilding the future? I may be wrong. Alexander, when he sighed for new worlds to conquer, may have shown the greater spirit. Anyhow, my project is shelved for a long time to come. Do not be angry and call me hard names. I send you a quotation from a nineteenth-century poet, which will help to explain my present mood. The whole round world is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. My dear Von Ballou. Yours, etc. James Clinton Gray End of A Star Fell There is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Monette. There is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette. The amber brown of the liquor disguised the poison it held, and I watched with a smile on my lips as he drank it. There was no pity in my heart for him. He was a jackal in the jungle of life, and I, I was one of the carnivores. It is the lot of the jackals of life to be devoured by the carnivore. Suddenly the contented look on his face froze into a startled stillness. I knew he was feeling the first savage twinge of the agony that was to come. He turned his head and looked at me, and I saw suddenly that he knew what I had done. You murderer! He cursed me, and then his body arched in the middle and his voice choked off deep in his throat. For a short minute he sat, tense, his body stiffened by the agony that rode it, unable to move a muscle. I watched the torment in his eyes build up to a crescendo of pain until the suffering became so great that it filmed his eyes, and I knew that, though he still stared directly at me, he no longer saw me. Then, as suddenly as the spasm had come, the starch went out of his body, and his back slid slowly down the chair edge. He landed heavily with his head resting limply against the seat of the chair. His right leg doubled up in a kind of jerk before he was still. I knew the time had come. Where are you? I asked. This moment had cost me sixty thousand dollars. Three weeks ago, the best doctors in the state had given me a month to live, and with seven million dollars in the bank, I couldn't buy a minute more. I accepted the doctor's decision philosophically, like the gambler that I am, but I had a plan, one which necessity had never forced me to use until now. Several years before, I had read an article about the medicine men of a certain tribe of aborigines, living in the jungles at the source of the Amazon River. They had discovered a process in which the juice of a certain bush, known only to them, could be used to poison a man. Anyone subjected to this poison died, but for a few minutes after the life left his body, the medicine men could still converse with him. The subject though ostensibly and actually dead, answered the medicine men's every question. This was their primitive, though reportedly effective, method of catching glimpses of what lay in the world of death. I had conceived my idea at the time I read the article, but I had never had the need to use it until the doctors gave me a month to live. 
Then I spent my $60,000, and three weeks later, I held in my hands a small bottle of the witch doctor's fluid. The next step was to secure my victim, my collaborator, I preferred to call him. The man I chose was a nobody, a homeless, friendless non-entity, picked up off the street. He had once been an educated man, but now he was only a bum, and when he died, he'd never be missed. A perfect man for my experiment. I'm a rich man because I have a system. The system is simple. I never make a move until I know exactly where that move will lead me. My field of operations is the stock market. I spend money unstintingly to secure the information I need before I take each step. I hire the best investigators, bribe employees and persons in position to give me the information I want, and only when I am as certain as humanly possible that I cannot be wrong do I move. And the system never fails. Seven million dollars in the bank is proof of that. Now, knowing that I could not live, I intended to make the system work for me one last time before I died. I'm a firm believer in the adage that any situation can be whipped, given prior knowledge of its coming, and, of course, its attendant circumstances. For a moment, he did not answer, and I began to fear that my experiment had failed. Where are you? I repeated, louder and sharper this time. The small muscles about his eyes puckered with an unnormal tension, while the rest of his face held its death frost. Slowly, slowly, unnaturally, as though energized by some hyper-rational power, his lips and tongue moved. The words he spoke were clear. I am in a, a tunnel, he said. It is lighted dimly, but there is nothing for me to see. Blue veins showed through the flesh of his cheeks like watermarks on translucent paper. He paused, and I urged, Go on. I am alone, he said. The realities I knew no longer exist, and I am damp and cold. All about me is a sense of gloom and dejection. It is an apprehension, an emanation, so deep and real as to be almost a tangible thing. The walls to either side of me seem to be formed, not of substance, but rather of the soundless cries of melancholy of spirits I cannot see. I am waiting, waiting in the gloom for something which will come to me. That need to wait is an innate part of my being, and I have no thought of questioning it. His voice died again. What are you waiting for? I asked. I do not know, he said, his voice dreary with the despair of centuries of hopelessness. I only know that I must wait. That compulsion is greater than my strength to combat. The tone of his voice changed slightly. The tunnel about me is widening, and now the walls have receded into invisibility. The tunnel has become a plain, but the plain is as desolate, as forlorn and dreary as was the tunnel. And still I stand and wait. How long must this go on? He fell silent again, and I was about to prompt him with another question. I could not afford to let the time run out in long silences, but abruptly the muscles about his eyes tightened, and suddenly a new aspect replaced their hopeless dejection. Now they expressed a black bottomless terror. For a moment I marveled that so small a portion of a facial anatomy could express such horror. There is something coming toward me, he said. A beast of brutish foulness. Beast is too inadequate a term to describe it. But I know no words to tell its form. 
It is an intangible and evasive thing, but very real, and it is coming closer. It has no organs of sight as I know them, but I feel that it can see me, or rather that it is aware of me with a sense sharper than vision itself. It is very near now. Oh, God, the malevolence, the hate, the potentiality of awful, fearsome destructiveness that is its very essence, and still I cannot move. The expression of terrified anticipation centered in his eyes lessened slightly and was replaced instantly by its former deep, deep despair. I am no longer afraid, he said. Why, I interjected, why? I was impatient to learn all that I could before the end came. Because, he paused, because it holds no threat for me. Somehow, some day, I understand, I know, that it too is seeking that for which I wait. What is it doing now? I asked. It has stopped beside me, and we stand together, gazing across the stark, empty plain. Now a second awful entity, with the same leashed virulence about it, moves up and stands at my other side. We all three wait, myself with a dark fear of this dismal universe, my unnatural companions with patient, malicious menace. Bits of, he faltered, of, I can name it only aura, go out from the beast like an acid stream and touch me, and the hate and the venom chill my body like a wave of intense cold. Now there are others of the awful breed behind me. We stand waiting, waiting for that which will come. What it is, I do not know. I could see the pallor of death creeping steadily into the last corners of his lips, and I knew that the end was not far away. Suddenly, a black frustration built up within me. What are you waiting for? I screamed, the tenseness and the importance of this moment forcing me to lose the iron self-control upon which I have always prided myself. I knew that the answer held the secret of what I must know. If I could learn that, my experiment would not be in vain, and I could make whatever preparations were necessary for my own death. I had to know that answer. Think, think, I pleaded. What are you waiting for? I do not know. The dreary despair in his eyes, sightless as they met mine, chilled me with a coldness that I felt in the marrow of my being. I do not know, he repeated. I, ye, yes, I do know. Abruptly, the plasmatic film cleared from his eyes, and I knew that for the first time since the poison struck, he was seeing me clearly. I sensed that this was the last moment before he left. For good, it had to be now. Tell me, I command you, I cried. What are you waiting for? His voice was quiet as he murmured softly, implacably, before he was gone. We are waiting, he said, for you. End of There is a Reaper by Charles B. DeVette Time Fuse by Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Silk Time Fuse by Randall Garrett Commander Benedict kept his eyes on the rear plate as he activated the intercom. All right, cut the power. We ought to be safe enough here. As he released the intercom, Dr. Liker, of the astronomical staff, stepped up to his side. Perfectly safe, he nodded. Although, even at this distance, a star-going nova ought to be quite a display. 
Benedict didn't shift his gaze from the plate. Do you have your instrument set up? Not quite, but we have plenty of time. The light won't reach us for several hours yet. Remember, we were out racing it at ten lights. The commander finally turned, slowly letting his breath out in a soft sigh. Dr. Liker, I would say that this is just about the foulest coincidence that could happen to the first interstellar vessel ever to leave the solar system. Liker shrugged. In one way of thinking, yes, it is certainly true that we will never know now whether Alpha Centauri A ever had any planets. But in another way, it is extremely fortunate that we should be so near a stellar explosion because of the wealth of scientific information we can obtain. As you say, it is a coincidence, and probably one that happens only once in a billion years. The chances of any particular star going nova are small. That we should be so close when it happens is of a vanishingly small order of probability. Commander Benedict took off his cap and looked at the damp stain on the sweatband. Nevertheless, Doctor, it is damned unnerving to come out of ultra-drive a couple of hundred million miles from the first star ever visited by man and have to turn tail and run because the damn thing practically blows up in your face. Likert could see that Benedict was upset. He rarely used the same profanity twice in one sentence. They had been downright lucky at that. If Liker hadn't seen the star begin to swell and brighten, if he hadn't known what it meant, or if Commander Benedict hadn't been quick enough in shifting the ship back to ultra-drive, Liker had a vision of an incandescent cloud of gaseous metal that had once been a spaceship. The intercom buzzed. The commander answered, Yes? Sir, would you tell Dr. Liker that we have everything set up now? Liker nodded and turned to leave. I guess we have nothing to do now but wait. When the light from the Nova did come, Commander Benedict was back at the plate again. The forward one this time, since the ship had been turned around in order to align the astronomy lab in the nose with the star. Alpha Centauri A began to brighten and spread. It made Benedict think of a light bulb connected through a rheostat, with someone turning that rheostat, turning it until the circuit was well overloaded. The light began to hurt Benedict's eyes, even at that distance, and he had to cut down the receptivity in order to watch. After a while, he turned away from the plate, not because the show was over, but simply because it had slowed to a point beyond which no change seemed to take place to the human eye. Five weeks later, much to Liker's chagrin, Commander Benedict announced that they had to leave the vicinity. The ship had only been provisioned to go to Alpha Centauri, scout the system without landing on any of the planets, and return. At ten lights, top speed for the Ultra Drive, it would take better than three months to get back. I know you'd like to watch it go through the complete cycle, Benedict said, but we can't go back home as a bunch of starved skeletons. Liker resigned himself to the necessity of leaving much of his work unfinished, and, although he knew it was a case of sour grapes, consoled himself with the thought that he could at least get most of the remaining information from the 500-inch telescope on Luna four years from then. As the ship slipped into the not-quite space through which the ultra-drive propelled it, Liker began to consolidate the material he had already gathered. Commander Benedict wrote in the log, Fifty-four days out from Seoul. Alpha Centauri has long since faded back into its pre-blow-up state, since we have far outdistanced the light from its explosion. It now looks as it did two years ago. It... Pardon me, Commander, Liker interrupted, but I have something interesting to show you. Benedict took his finger off the keys and turned around in his chair. What is it, Doctor? Liker frowned at the papers in his hands. I have been doing some work on the probability of that explosion happening just as it did, and I have come up with some rather frightening figures. As I said before, the probability was small. A little calculation has given us some information which makes it even smaller. For instance, with a possible error of plus or minus two seconds, Alpha Centauri A began to explode the instant we came out of Ultra Drive. Now, the probability of that occurring comes out so small that it should happen only once in 10 to the 467th seconds. It was Commander Benedict's turn to frown. So? Commander, the entire universe is only about 10 to the 17th seconds old. But to give you an idea, let's say that the chances of its happening are once in millions of trillions of years. Benedict blinked. The number, he realized, was totally beyond his comprehension. Or anyone else's. Well, so what? Now it has happened that one time. 
That simply means it will almost certainly never happen again. True. But, Commander, when you buck odds like that and win, the thing to do is look for some factor that is cheating in your favor. If you took a pair of dice and started throwing sevens, one right after another, for the next couple of thousand years, you'd begin to suspect they were loaded. Benedict said nothing. He just waited expectantly. There is only one thing that could have done it. Our ship. Liker said it quietly, without emphasis. What we know about the hyperspace, or superspace, or whatever it is we move through in Ultra Drive is almost nothing. Coming out of it so near to a star might set up some sort of shock wave in normal space, which would completely disrupt that star's internal balance, resulting in the liberation of unimaginably vast amounts of energy, causing that star to go nova. We can only assume that we ourselves were the fuse that set off that nova. Benedict stood up slowly. When he spoke, his voice was a choking whisper. Do you, you mean the sun, soul, might? Liker nodded. I don't say that it definitely would, but the probability is that we were the cause of the destruction of Alpha Centauri A, and therefore might cause the destruction of Sol in the same way. Benedict's voice was steady again. That means we can't go back again, doesn't it? Even if we're not positive, we can't take the chance. Not necessarily. We can get fairly close before we cut out the drive, and come in the rest of the way at sublight speed. It'll take longer and we'll have to go on half or one-third rations, but we can do it. How far away? I don't know what the minimum distance is, but I do know how we can gauge a distance. Remember, neither Alpha Centauri B or C were detonated. We'll have to cut our drive at least as far away from Sol as they are from A. I see. The commander was silent for a moment. Then, very well, Dr. Liker. If that's the safest way... That's the only way. Benedict issued the orders, while Liker figured the exact point at which they must cut out the drive, and how long the trip would take. The rations would have to be cut down accordingly. Commander Benedict's mind whirled around the monstrousness of the whole thing, like some dizzy bee around a flower. What if there had been planets around Centauri A? What if they had been inhabited? Had he, all unwittingly, killed entire races of living, intelligent beings? But how could he have known? The drive had never been tested before. It couldn't be tested inside the solar system. It was too fast. He and his crew had been volunteers, knowing that they might die when the drive went on. Suddenly, Benedict gasped and slammed his fist down on the desk before him. Liker looked up. What's the matter, Commander? Suppose, came the answer, just suppose that we have the same effect on a star when we go into Ultra Drive as we do when we come out of it. Liker was silent for a moment, stunned by the possibility. There was nothing to say anyway. They could only wait. A little more than half a light year from Seoul, when the ship reached the point where its occupants could see the light that had left their home sun more than seven months before, they watched it become suddenly, horribly brighter. A hundred thousand times brighter. End of Time Fuse by Randall Garrett Recording by Scott Silk of the Tales to Terrify Horror Story Podcast Tony and the Beatles by Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew. Reddish-yellow sunlight filtered through the thick quartz windows into the sleep compartment. Tony Rossi yawned, stirred a little, then opened his black eyes and sat up quickly. With one motion, he tossed the covers back and slid to the warm metal floor. He clicked off his alarm clock and hurried to the closet. It looked like a nice day. The landscape outside was motionless, undisturbed by winds or dust shift. The boy's heart pounded excitedly. He pulled his trousers on, zipped up the reinforced mesh, struggled into his heavy canvas shirt, and then sat down on the edge of the cot to tug on his boots. He closed the seams around their tops and then did the same with his gloves. Next, he adjusted the pressure on his pump unit and strapped it between his shoulder blades. He grabbed his helmet from the dresser, and he was ready for the day. In the dining compartment, 
His mother and father had finished breakfast. Their voices drifted to him as he clattered down the ramp. A disturbed murmur. He paused to listen. What were they talking about? Had he done something wrong again? And then he caught it. Behind their voices was another voice, static and crackling pops. The all-system audio signal from Rigel 4. They had it turned up full blast. The dull thunder of the monitor's voice boomed loud. The war. Always the war. He sighed and stepped out into the dining compartment. Morning, his father muttered. Good morning, dear, his mother said absently. She sat with her head turned to one side, wrinkles of concentration webbing her forehead. Her thin lips were drawn together in a tight line of concern. His father had pushed his dirty dishes back and was smoking, elbows on the table, dark, hairy arms, bare and muscular. He was scowling, intent on the jumbled roar from the speaker above the sink. "'How is it going?' Tony asked. He slid into his chair and reached automatically for the Airstat grapefruit. "'Any news from Orion?' Neither of them answered. They didn't hear him. He began to eat his grapefruit— Outside, beyond the little metal plastic housing unit, sounds of activity grew. Shouts and muffled crashes as rural merchants and their trucks rumbled along the highway towards Carnet. The reddish daylight swelled. Beetlejuice was rising quietly and majestically. "'Nice day,' Tony said. "'No flux wind. I think I'll go down to the end quarter a while. We're building a neat spaceport. A model, of course. But we've been able to get enough material to lay out strips for—' With a savage snarl, his father reached out and struck. The audio roar immediately died. I knew it. He got up and moved angrily away from the table. I told them it would happen. They shouldn't have moved so soon. Should have built up a Class A supply base first. Isn't our main fleet moving in from Bellatrix? Tony's mother fluttered anxiously. According to last night's summary, the worst that could happen is Orion 9 and 10 will be dumped. Joseph Rossi laughed harshly. The hell with last night's summary. They know as well as I do what's happening. What's happening? Tony echoed as he pushed aside his grapefruit and began to ladle out dry cereal. Are we losing the battle? Yes, his father's lips twisted. Earthmen losing to... to beetles. I told them, but they couldn't wait. My God, there's ten good years left in this system. Why'd they have to push on? Everybody knew Orion would be tough. The whole damn beetle fleet strung out around here, waiting for us, and we have to barge right in. But nobody ever thought beetles would fight, Leah Rossi protested mildly. Everybody thought they'd just fire a few blasts and then... They have to fight. Orion's the last jump off. If they don't fight here, where the hell can they fight? Rossi swore savagely. Of course they're fighting. We have all their planets except the inner Orion string. Not that they're worth much, but... It's the principle of the thing. If we'd built up strong supply bases, we could have broken up the beetle fleet and really clobbered it. Don't say beetle, Tony murmured as he finished his cereal. They're pas udedi. Same as here. The word beetle comes from beetlejuice, an Arabian word we invented ourselves. What are you, a goddamn beetle lover? Joe, Leah snapped. For heaven's sake. Rosie moved towards the door. If I were ten years younger, I'd be out there. I'd really show those shiny-shelled insects what the hell they're up against. Them and their junky, beat-up old hulks. Converted freighters! His eyes blazed. When I think of them shooting down Terran cruisers with our boys in them. Orion's their system, Tony murmured. Their system? When the hell did you get to be an authority on space law? Why, I oughta... He broke off, choked with rage. My own kid, he muttered. One more crack out of you today, and I'll hang one on you you'll feel the rest of the week. Tony pushed his chair back. I won't be around here today. I'm going to Carnet with my EEP. Yeah, to play with beetles. Tony said nothing. He was already sliding his helmet in place and snapping the clamps tight. As he pushed through the back door into the lock membrane, he unscrewed his oxygen tap and set the tank filter into action. An automatic response conditioned by a lifetime spent on a colony planet in an alien system. A faint flux wind caught at him and swept yellow-red dust around his boots. Sunlight glittered from the metal roof of his family's housing unit, one of endless rows of squat boxes set in the sandy slope 
protected by the line of ore refining installations against the horizon. He made an impatient signal, and from the storage shed his EEP came gliding out, catching the sunlight on its chrome trim. We're going down into Carnet, Tony said, unconsciously slipping into the Pas dialect. Hurry up! The EEP took up its position behind him, and he started briskly down the slope, over the shifting sand, towards the road. There were quite a few traders out today. It was a good day for the market. Only a fourth of the year was fit for travel. Beetlejuice was an erratic and undependable son, not at all like Sol, according to the edutapes, fed to Tony four hours a day, six days a week. He had never seen Sol himself. He reached the noisy road. Pas Udedi were everywhere, whole groups of them, their primitive combustion-driven trucks, battered and filthy, motors grinding protestingly. He waved at the trucks as they pushed past him. After a moment one slowed down. It was piled with tiss, bundled heaps of gray vegetables dried and prepared for the table, a staple of the Pasudedi diet. Behind the wheel lounged a dark-faced elderly Pas, one arm over the open window, a rolled leaf between his lips. He was like all the other Pasudedi, lank and hard-shelled, encased in a brittle sheath in which he lived and died. "'You want a ride?' the Pas murmured. Required protocol when an earthman on foot was encountered. "'Is there room for my EEP?' The Pas made a careless motion with his claw. "'It can run behind.' Sardonic amusement touched his ugly old face. "'If it gets to Carnet, we'll sell it for scrap. We can use a few condensers and relay tubing. We're short on electric maintenance stuff.' "'I know,' Tony said solemnly, as he climbed into the cabin of the truck. "'It's all been sent to the big repair base at Orion, for your war fleet.' Amusement vanished from the leathery face. "'Yes, the war fleet.' He turned away and started up the truck again. In the back, Tony's EEP had scrambled up onto the load of Tiss and was gripping precariously with its magnetic lines. Tony noticed the Pasudetti's sudden change of expression, and he was puzzled. He started to speak to him, but now he noticed unusual quietness among the other Pas, in the other trucks, behind and in front of his own. The war, of course. It had swept through this system a century ago. These people had been left behind. Now all eyes were on Orion, on the battle between the Terran Warfleet and the Pas Udedi collection of armed freighters. "'Is it true?' Tony asked carefully. "'That you're winning?' The elderly Pas grunted. "'We hear rumors.' Tony considered. My father says Terran went ahead too fast. He says we should have consolidated. We didn't assemble adequate supply bases. He used to be an officer when he was younger. He was in the fleet for two years. The pass was silent for a moment. It's true, he said at last, that when you're so far from home, supply is a great problem. We, on the other hand, don't have that. We have no distances to cover. Do you know anybody fighting? I have distant relatives. The answer was vague. The Pas obviously didn't want to talk about it. Have you ever seen your war fleet? Not as it exists now. When this system was defeated, most of our units were wiped out. Remnants limped to Orion and joined the Orion fleet. Your relatives were with the remnants? That's right. Then you were alive when this planet was taken? Why do you ask? The old pass quivered violently. What business is it of yours? Tony leaned out and watched the walls of the buildings of Carnet grow ahead of them. Carnet was an old city. It had stood thousands of years. The pass Udedi civilization was stable. It had reached a certain point of technocratic development and then leveled off. The Pas had intersystem ships that carried people and freight between planets in the days before the Terran Confederation. They had combustion-driven cars, audiophones, a powered network of a magnetic type. Their plumbing was satisfactory and their medicine was highly advanced. They had art forms, emotional and exciting. They had a vague religion. "'Who do you think will win the battle?' Tony asked. "'I don't know.' With a sudden jerk, the old Pas brought the truck to a crashing halt. This is as far as I go. Please get out and take your EEP with you. Tony faltered in surprise. But aren't you going no farther? Tony pushed the door open. He was vaguely uneasy. There was a hard, fixed expression on the leathery face. 
and the old man's voice had a sharp edge he had never heard before. "'Thanks,' he murmured. He hopped down into the red dust and signaled his EEP. It released its magnetic lines, and instantly the truck started up with a roar, passing on inside the city. Tony watched it go, still dazed. The hot dust lapped at his ankles. He automatically moved his feet and slapped at his trousers. A truck honked, and his EEP quickly moved him from the road, up to the level pedestrian ramp. Pasudetti in swarms moved by, endless lines of people hurrying into Carnet on their daily business. A massive public bus had stopped by the gate and was letting off passengers, male and female pas, and children. They laughed and shouted, the sounds of their voices blended with the low hum of the city. "'Going in?' a sharp Pasudetti voice sounded close behind him. "'Keep moving! You're blocking the ramp!' It was a young female, with a heavy armload clutched in her claws. Tony felt embarrassed. Female Pas had a certain telepathic ability, part of their sexual makeup. It was effective on Earthmen at close range. "'Here,' she said. "'Give me a hand.' Tony nodded his head, and the EEP accepted the female's heavy armload. "'I'm visiting the city,' Tony said, as they moved with the crowd towards the gates. "'I got a ride most of the way, but the driver let me off here. "'You're from the settlement.' "'Yes,' she eyed him critically. "'You've always lived here, haven't you? "'I was born here. "'My family came here from Earth four years before I was born. "'My father was an officer in the fleet. "'He earned an emigration priority. "'So you have never seen your own planet. "'How old are you? Ten years. Terran. "'You shouldn't have asked the driver so many questions.' They passed through the decontamination shield into the city. An information square loomed ahead. Pass men and women were packed around it. Moving chutes and transport cars rumbled everywhere. Buildings and ramps and open-air machinery. The city was sealed in a protective, dust-proof envelope. Tony unfastened his helmet and clipped it to his belt. The air was stale-smelling, artificial, but usable. "'Let me tell you something,' the young female said carefully as she strode along the foot-ramp besides Tony. I wonder if this is a good day for you to come in to Carnet. I know you've been coming here regularly to play with your friends, but perhaps today you ought to stay at home in your settlement. Why? Because today everybody is upset. I know, Tony said. My mother and father were upset. They were listening to the news from our base in the Rigel system. I don't mean your family. Other people are listening, too. These people here, my race. They're upset, all right, Tony admitted. But I come here all the time. There's nobody to play with at the settlement. And anyhow, we're working on a project. A model spaceport. That's right, Tony was envious. I sure wish I was a telepath. It must be fun. The female Pasudetti was silent. She was deep in thought. "'What would happen,' she asked, "'if your family left here and returned to Earth?' "'That couldn't happen. "'There's no room for us on Earth. "'Sea bombs destroyed most of Asia and North America "'back in the twentieth century. "'Suppose you had to go back.' "'Tony did not understand. "'But we can't. "'Habitable portions of Earth are overcrowded. "'Our main problem is finding places for Terrans to live in other systems,' he added." And anyhow, I don't particularly want to go to Terra. I'm used to it here. All my friends are here. I'll take my packages, the female said. I go this other way, down this third-level ramp. Tony nodded to his EEP, and it lowered the bundles into the female's claws. She lingered a moment, trying to find the right words. Good luck, she said. With what? She smiled faintly, ironically. "'With your model spaceport. "'I hope you and your friends get to finish it.' "'Oh, of course we'll finish it,' Tony said, surprised. "'It's almost done. "'What does she mean?' "'The Pasudetti woman hurried off before he could ask her. "'Tony was troubled and uncertain. "'More doubts filled him. "'After a moment he headed slowly into the lane "'that took him towards the residential section of the city, "'past the stores and factories, "'to the place where his friends lived.' The group of Pas Udedi children eyed him silently as he approached. They had been playing in the shade of an immense hengalo, 
whose ancient branches drooped and swayed with the air currents pumped through the city. Now they sat unmoving. "'I didn't expect you today,' B. Prith said in an expressionless voice. Tony halted awkwardly, and his E.E.P. did the same. "'How are things?' he murmured. "'Fine. I got a ride part way. Fine.' Tony squatted down in the shade. None of the Post children stirred. They were small, not as large as Terran children. Their shells had not hardened, had not turned dark and opaque like horn. It gave them a soft, unformed appearance, but at the same time it lightened their load. They moved more easily than their elders. They could hop and skip around still. But they were not skipping right now. "'What's the matter?' Tony demanded. "'What's the matter with everybody?' No one answered. "'Where's the model?' he asked. Have you fellows been working on it? After a moment, Lyrie nodded slightly. Tony felt dull anger rise up inside him. Say something! What's the matter? What are you all mad about? Mad? Beeprith echoed. We're not mad. Tony scratched aimlessly in the dust. He knew what it was. The war again. The battle going on near Orion. His anger burst up wildly. Forget the war! Everything was fine yesterday before the battle. Sure, Lyrie said. It was fine. Tony caught the edge to his voice. It happened a hundred years ago. It's not my fault. Sure, B. Prith said. This is my home, isn't it? Haven't I got as much right here as anybody else? I was born here. Sure, Lyrie said tonelessly. Tony appealed to them helplessly. Do you have to act this way? You didn't act this way yesterday. I was here yesterday. All of us were here yesterday. What, what's happened since yesterday? The battle, B. Prith said. What difference does that make? Why does that change everything? There's always war. There have been battles all the time, as long as I can remember. What's the difference about this? B. Prith broke apart a clump of dirt with his strong claws. After a moment, he tossed it away and got slowly to his feet. Well, he said, thoughtfully, according to our radio relay, it looks as if our fleet is going to win this time. Yes, Tony agreed, not understanding. My father says we didn't build up adequate supply bases. We'll probably have to fall back to... And then the impact hit him. You mean for the first time in a hundred years? Yes, Lyrie said, also getting up. The others got up, too. They moved away from Tony, towards the nearby house. We're winning. The Terran flank was turned half an hour ago. Your right wing has folded completely. Tony was stunned. And it matters? It matters to all of you? Matters? B. Prith halted, suddenly blazing out in fury. Sure it matters. For the first time in a century, the first time in our lives we're beating you, we have you on the run. You, he choked out the words, almost spat it out. You white grubs. They disappeared into the house. Tony sat gazing stupidly down at the ground, his hands still moving aimlessly. He had heard the words before, seen it scrolled on walls and in the dust near the settlement. White grubs. The past term of derision for Terrans. Because of their softness, their whiteness, Lack of hard shells, pulpy, doughy skin, but but they never dared say it out loud before, to an earthman's face. Beside him, his EEP stirred restlessly. Its intricate radio mechanism sensed the hostile atmosphere. Automatic relays were sliding into place. Circuits were opening and closing. It's all right, Tony murmured, getting up slowly. Maybe we'd better go back. He moved unsteadily towards the ramp. Completely shaken, the EEP walked calmly ahead, its metal face blank and confident, feeling nothing, saying nothing. Tony's thoughts were a wild turmoil. He shook his head, but the crazy spinning kept up. He couldn't make his mind slow down, lock in place. "'Wait a minute,' a voice said, B. Prith's voice, from the open doorway, cold and withdrawn, almost unfamiliar. "'What do you want?' B. Prith came towards him, claws behind his back in the formal Pasudeti posture used between total strangers. You shouldn't have come here today. 
I know, Tony said. B. Prith got out a bit of Tiss stock and began to roll it into a tube. He pretended to concentrate on it. Look, he said, you said you have a right here, but you don't. I... Tony murmured. Do you understand why not? You said it's not your fault. I guess not. But it's not my fault either. Maybe it's nobody's fault. I've known you a long time. Five years, Terran. B. Prith twisted the stock up and tossed it away. Yesterday, we played together. We worked on the spaceport, but we can't play today. My family said to tell you not to come here any more. He hesitated and did not look Tony in the face. I was going to tell you anyhow before they said anything. Oh, Tony said. Everything that's happened today, the battle, our fleet stand, we didn't know. We didn't dare hope. You see, a century of running, first this system, then the Rigel system, all the planets, then the other Orion stars. We fought here and there scattered fights. Those that got away joined up. We supplied the base at Orion. You people didn't know. But there was no hope. At least nobody thought there was. He was silent a moment. Funny, he said. What happens when your back's to the wall and there isn't any further place to go? Then you have to fight. If our supply bases, Tony began thickly, but B. Prith cut him off savagely. Your supply bases, don't you understand? We're beating you. Now you'll have to get out, all you white grubs, out of our system. Tony's EEP moved forward ominously. B. Prith saw it. He bent down, snatched up a rock, and hurled it straight at the EEP. The rock clanged off the metal hull and bounced harmlessly away. B. Prith snatched up another rock. Lyrie and the others came out of the house. An adult pass loomed up behind them. Everything was happening too fast. More rocks crashed against the EEP. One struck Tony on the arm. Get out, B. Prith screamed. Don't come back. This is our planet. His claws snatched at Tony. We'll tear you to pieces if you... Tony smashed him in the chest. The soft shell gave like rubber, and the pass stumbled back. He wobbled and fell over, gasping and screeching. Beetle! Tony breathed hoarsely. Suddenly he was terrified. A crowd of Pasudeti was forming rapidly. They surged on all sides, hostile faces, dark and angry, a rising thunder of rage. More stones showered. Some struck the EEP. Others fell around Tony, near his boots. One whizzed past his face. Quickly, he slid his helmet in place. He was scared. He knew his EEP's E-signal had already gone out, but it would be minutes before a ship could come. Besides, there were other Earthmen in the city to be taken care of. There were Earthmen all over the planet, in all the cities, on all the 23 Beetlejuice planets, on the 14 Rigel planets, on the other Orion planets. We have to get out of here, he muttered to the EEP. Do something. A stone hit him on the helmet. The plastic cracked. Air leaked out, and then the auto seal filmed over. More stones were falling. The pos swarmed close. A yelling, seething mass of black-sheathed creatures. He could smell them, the acrid body odor of insects, hear their claws snap, feel their weight. The EEP threw its heat beam on. The beam shifted in a wide band towards the crowd of Pasudeti. Crude hand weapons appeared. A clatter of bullets burst around Tony. They were firing at the EEP. He was dimly aware of the metal body beside him. A shuddering crash. The EEP was toppled over. The crowd poured over it. The metal hull was lost from sight. Like a demented animal, the crowd tore at the struggling EEP. A few of them smashed in its head. Others tore off struts and shiny arm sections. The EEP ceased struggling. The crowd moved away, panting and clutching jagged remains. They saw Tony. As the first line of them reached for him... The protective envelope high above them shattered. A Terran scout ship thundered down, heat beam screaming. The crowd scattered in confusion, some firing, some throwing stones, others leaping for safety. Tony picked himself up and made his way unsteadily towards the spot where the scout was landing. I'm sorry, Joe Rossi said gently as he touched his son on the shoulder. 
I shouldn't have let you go down there today. I should have known. Tony sat hunched over in the big plastic easy chair. He rocked back and forth, face pale with shock. The scout ship that had rescued him had immediately headed back towards Carnet. There were other Earthmen to bring out besides this first load. The boy said nothing. His mind was blank. He still heard the roar of the crowd, felt its hate, a century of pent-up fury and resentment. The memory drove out everything else. It was all around him, even now, and the sight of the floundering EEP, the metallic ripping sound as its arms and legs were torn off and carried away. His mother dabbed at his cuts and scratches with antiseptic. Joe Rossi shakily lit a cigarette and said, "'If your EEP hadn't been along, they'd have killed you.' "'Beetles,' he shrugged. "'I never should have let you go down there. "'All this time. "'They might have done it any time, any day, knifed you, "'cut you open with their filthy goddamn claws.' Below the settlement, the reddish-yellow sunlight glinted on gun barrels. Already, dull booms echoed against the crumbling hills. The defensive ring was going into action. Black shapes darted and scurried up the side of the slope. Black patches moved out from Carnet, towards the Terran settlement, across the dividing line the Confederation surveyors had set up a century ago. Carnet was a bubbling pot of activity. The whole city rumbled with feverish excitement. Tony raised his head. They... They turned our flank? Yeah. Joe Rossi stubbed out his cigarette. They sure did. That was at one o'clock. At two, they drove a wedge right through the center of our line. Split the fleet in half. Broke it up. Sent it running. Picked us off one by one as we fell back. Christ, they're like maniacs. Now that they've got the scent, the taste of our blood. But it's getting better, Leah fluttered. Our main fleet units are beginning to appear. We'll get them. Joe muttered. It'll take a while, but by God, we'll wipe them out. Every last one of them. If it takes a thousand years. We'll follow every last ship down. We'll get them all. His voice rose in a frenzy. Beetles. Goddamn insects. When I think of them trying to hurt my kid with their filthy black claws. If you were younger, you'd be in the line, Leah said. It's not your fault. You're too old. The heart strain's too great. You did your job. They can't let an older person take chances. It's not your fault. Joe clenched his fists. I feel so futile. If only there was something I could do. The fleet will take care of them, Leah said soothingly. You said so yourself. They'll hunt every one of them down, destroy them all. There's nothing to worry about. Joe sagged miserably. It's no use. Let's cut it out. Let's stop kidding ourselves. What do you mean? Face it. We're not going to win. Not this time. We went too far. Our time's come. There was silence. Tony sat up a little. When did you know? I've known a long time. I found out today. I didn't understand at first. This is stolen ground. I was born here, but it's stolen ground. Yeah, it's stolen it doesn't belong to us. We're here because we're stronger, but now we're not stronger. We're being beaten. They know Terrans can be licked, like anybody else. Joe Rossi's face was gray and flabby. We took their planets away from them. Now they're taking them back. It'll be a while, of course. We'll retreat slowly. It'll be another five centuries going back. There's a lot of systems between here and Seoul. Tony shook his head, still uncomprehending. Even Lyrie and Beeprith, all of them, waiting for their time to come, for us to lose and go away again, where we came from. Joe Rossi paced back and forth. Yeah, we'll be retreating from now on, giving ground instead of taking it. It'll be like this today, losing fights, draws, stalemates, and worse. He raised his feverish eyes towards the ceiling of the little metal housing unit, face wild with passion and misery. But by God, we'll give them a run for their money, all the way back, every inch. End of Tony and the Beatles by Philip K. Dick Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew Experiment from Two-Timer. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by George Thomas. Two Timer by Frederick Brown. Experiment. Experiment. The first time machine, gentlemen, Professor Johnson proudly informed his two colleagues. True, it is a small-scale experimental model. It will operate only on objects weighing less than three pounds, five ounces, and for distances into the past and future of twelve minutes or less. But it works. The small-scale model looked like a small scale, a postage scale except for two dials in the part under the platform. Professor Johnson held up a small metal cube. Our experimental object, he said, is a brass cube weighing one pound, 2.3 ounces. First, I shall send it five minutes into the future. He leaned forward and set one of the dials on the time machine. Look at your watches, he said. They looked at their watches. Professor Johnson placed the cube gently on the machine's platform. It vanished. Five minutes later, to the second, it reappeared. Professor Johnson picked it up. Now, five minutes into the past. He set the other dial. Holding the cube in his hand, he looked at his watch. It is six minutes before three o'clock. I shall now activate the mechanism by placing the cube on the platform at exactly three o'clock. Therefore, the cube should, at five minutes before three, vanish from my hand and appear on the platform five minutes before I place it there. How can you place it there, then? asked one of his colleagues. It will, as my hand approaches vanish from the platform and appear in my hand to be placed there. Three o'clock. Notice, please. The cube vanished from his hand. It appeared on the platform of the time machine. See, five minutes before I shall place it there, it is there. His other colleague frowned at the cube. But, he said, what if now that it has already appeared five minutes before you place it there, you should change your mind about doing so and not place it there at three o'clock? Wouldn't there be a paradox of some sort? An interesting idea, Professor Johnson said. I had not thought of it, and it will be interesting to try. Very well. I shall not there was no paradox at all. The cube remained. But the entire rest of the universe, professors and all, vanished. End of experiment. Sentry from Two-Timer He was wet and muddy and hungry and cold, and he was fifty thousand light-years from home. A strange blue sun gave light, and the gravity, twice what he was used to, made every movement difficult. But in tens of thousands of years, this part of war hadn't changed. The flyboys were fine with their sleek spaceships and their fancy weapons. When the chips are down, though, it was still the foot soldier, the infantry, that had to take the ground and hold it, foot by bloody foot. Like this damn planet of a star he'd never heard of until they'd landed him there, and now it was sacred ground, because the aliens were there, too. The aliens, the only other intelligent race in the galaxy, cruel, hideous, and repulsive monsters. Contact had been made with them near the center of the galaxy, after the slow, difficult colonization of a dozen thousand planets, and it had been war at sight. They'd shot without even trying to negotiate or to make peace. Now, planet by bitter planet, it was being fought out. He was wet and muddy and hungry and cold, 
and the day was raw with a high wind that hurt his eyes. But the aliens were trying to infiltrate every sentry post, and every sentry post was vital. He stayed alert, gun ready, fifty thousand light years from home, fighting on a strange world and wondering if he'd ever live to see home again. And then he saw one of them crawling toward him. He drew a bead and fired. The alien made that strange, horrible sound they all make, then lay still. He shuddered at the sound and sight of the alien lying there. One ought to be able to get used to them after a while, but he'd never been able to. Such repulsive creatures they were, with only two arms and two legs, ghastly white skins and no scales. End of Century End of Two-Timer Recorded by George Thomas Traveler's Rest, South Carolina The Ultimate Experiment by Thornton DeKai This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Mashing. The Ultimate Experiment by Thornton DeKai. No living soul breathed upon the earth. Only robots carrying on the last great order. They were all gone now, the masters, all dead and their atoms scattered to the never-ceasing winds that swept the great chrysolite city towers in ever-increasing fury. That had been the last wish of each as he had passed away, dying from sheer old age. True, they had fought on as long as they could to save their kind from utter extinction, but the comet that had trailed its poisoning wake across space to leave behind it, upon Earth, a noxious, lethal gas vapor had done its work too well. No living soul breathed upon the Earth. No one lived here now, but Kiron and his kind. And, so thought Kiron to himself, he might as well be a great unthinking robot, able to do only one thing instead of the mental giant he was. So obsessed had he become with the task he had set himself to do. Yet, in spite of a great loneliness and a strong fear of a final frustration, he worked on with the others of his people, hardly stopping for anything except the very necessities needed to keep his big body working in perfect coordination. Tirelessly he worked, for the masters had bred, if that is the word to use, fatigue and the need for restoration out of his race long decades ago. Sometimes, though... He would stop his work when the great red dying sun began to fade into the west, and his round eyes would grow wistful as he looked out over the great city that stretched in towering minarets and lofty spires of purest crystal blue for miles on every side. A fairy city of rarest hue and beauty, a city for the gods, and the gods were dead. Kiron felt, at such times, the great loneliness that the last masters must have known. They had been kind, the masters, and Kiran knew that his people, as they went about their eternal tasks of keeping the great city in perfect shape for the masters who no longer needed it, must miss them as he did. Never to hear their voices ringing, never to see them again gathered in groups to witness some game or to play amid the silvery fountains and flowery gardens of the wondrous city made him infinitely saddened. It would always be like this, unless... But thinking, dreaming, reminiscing, would not bring it all back, for there was only one answer to still the longing, work. The others worked and did not dream, but instead kept busy tending to the thousand and one tasks the masters had set them to do, had left them doing when the last master perished. He, too, must remember the trust they had placed in his hands and fulfill it as best he could. From the time the great red eye of the sun opened itself in the east, until it disappeared in the blue haze beyond the chrysolite city, Kiron labored with his fellows. Then, at the appointed hour, the musical signals would peal forth their sweet, sad chimes, whispering good night to ears that would hear them no more, and all operations would halt for the night, just as it had done when the masters were here to supervise it. Then, when morning came, he would start once more trying, testing, experimenting with his chemicals and plastics, forever following labyrinth of knowledge, seeking for the great triumph that would make the work of the others of some real use. His hands molded the materials carefully, lovingly, to a pattern that was set in his mind as a thing to cherish. 
Day by day his experiments in their liquid baths took form under his careful modeling. He mixed his chemicals with the same loving touch, the same careful concentration, and painstaking thoroughness, studying often his notes and analysis charts. Everything must be just so, lest his experiment not turn out perfectly. He never became exasperated at a failure or a defect that proved to be the only reward for his faithful endeavors, but worked patiently on toward a goal that he knew would ultimately be his. Then, one day, as the great red sun glowed like an immense red eye overhead, Kiron stepped back to admire his handiwork. In that instant the entire wondrous city seemed to breathe a silent prayer as he stood transfixed by the sight before him. Then it went on as usual, hurrying noiselessly about its business. The surface cars, empty though they were, fled swiftly about, supported only by the rings of magnetic force that held them to their designated paths. The gravo ships raised from the tower dromes to speed silently into the eye of the red sun that was dying. No one now, Kiron thought to himself as he studied his handiwork. Then he walked unhurriedly to the cabinet in the laboratory corner and took from it a pair of earphones resembling those of a long-forgotten radio set. Just as unhurriedly, though his mind was filled with turmoil and his being with excitement, he walked back and connected the earphones to the box upon his bench. The phones dangled into the liquid bath before him as he adjusted them to suit his requirements. Slowly, he checked over every step of his experiments before he went farther. Then, as he proved them for the last time, his hand went slowly to the small knife switch upon the box at his elbow. Next, he threw into connection the larger switch upon his laboratory wall, bringing into his laboratory the broadcast power of the Chrysolite City. The laboratory generators hummed softly, drowning out the quiet hum of the city outside. As they built up, sending tiny, living, electrical impulses over the wires like minute currents that come from the brain, Kiron sat breathless, his eyes intent. Closer to his work he bent, watching lovingly, fearful lest all might not be quite right. Then his eyes took on a brighter light as he began to see the reaction. He knew the messages that he had sent out were being received and coordinated into a unit that would stir and grow into intellect. Suddenly, the machine flashed its little warning red light and automatically snapped off. Kiron twisted quickly in his seat and threw home the final switch. This, he knew, was the ultimate test. On the results of the flood of energy impulses that he had set in motion rested the fulfillment of his success or failure. He watched with slight misgivings. This had never been accomplished before. How could it possibly be a success now? Even the masters had never quite succeeded at this final test. How could he only a servant. Yet it must work, for he had no desire in life but to make it work. Then, suddenly, he was on his feet, eyes wide. From the two long, coffin-like liquid baths there arose two perfect specimens of the Homo sapiens. Man and woman they were, and they blinked their eyes in the light of the noonday sun, raised themselves dripping from the baths of their creation, and stepped to the floor before Kiron. I am Adam too, he said. Created by you, Kiran, from a formula they left in their image. I was created to be a master, and she whom you also have created is to be my wife. We shall mate, and the race of man shall be reborn through us and others whom I shall help you create. The man halted at the last declaration he intoned and walked smilingly toward the woman who stepped into his open arms, returning his smile. Kiran smiled too within his pumping heart. The words the man had intoned had been placed in his still pregnable mind by the teleteach phones and record that the last master had prepared before death had halted his experiments. The actions of the man toward the woman, Kiran knew, was caused by the natural constituents that went to form his chemical body and govern his humanness. He, Kiran, had created a living man and woman. The masters lived again because of him. They would sing and play, and again people the magnificent chrysolite city because he loved them and had kept on until success had been his. But then, why not such a turnabout? Hadn't they, the masters, created him a superb thinking robot? End of The Ultimate Experiment by Thornton DeKai Recording by Ryan Mashing